Section 1 of G.K. Chesterton's newspaper columns, The New Witness, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arden. G.K. Chesterton's newspaper columns, The New Witness, 1922. By G.K. Chesterton. How the Liberator Liberates. By G.K. Chesterton. Being myself a modern journalist, I have seen enough of modern journalism to know, or even to guess, that masses of the most monstrous lies are told against the Bolshevists. I have seen such stuff written about the Boers, in what I thought an unjust war, and about the Germans, in what I thought a just one. I assume it, and I allow for it. And obviously the best corrective of what is said by capitalists about Bolshevists is to be found by simply studying what is said by Bolshevists about Bolshevists. Bolshevist propaganda also will doubtless abound in lies, but at least their lies are not likely to be slanders against themselves. If I take all my criticisms of this new Semitic socialism from what the socialists themselves say, I shall be as fair as I can to them, and a great deal fairer than they are to other people. I take in my hand as a concrete object the highly colored American magazine devoted to defending the policy of Lenin and Trotsky, the liberator. Even considered as a highly colored work of art, it has many minor points of interest. It is supposed to be a protest from the proletariat. But I should be a little interested to know what most proletarians would make of its formless, futurist illustrations, with their flattened faces and crippled figures. The poetry also has a popular appeal of a peculiar kind. The following lines, for instance, appear under the name of Passion Death. This morning low, sad eye black, upon rock, with glossy neck, Sea was blue as silk. Suddenly, three times croak broke out of me. Sky was white as milk. With this croak running thrill, ran through body, like chill, that body black as silk. Suddenly, chest split crimson out of me. Heart fell white as milk. Now, it would be easy to offer criticisms of this poem from the standpoint of the pedantic and exclusive scholar. It might be asked whether it was the rock that had a glossy neck, or the man, if it was a man. It might be pondered whether he was a Mr. Black, or a black man, or possibly a blackbird or a black beetle. The academic critic might affect perplexity over something that was blue as silk, which seems like saying it was as green as chalk or as pink as paint. In the poem as a whole, indeed, silk seems to be of an accommodating color, and to proceed rather from the camelion than the silkworm. We may generally conclude that the thing, whatever it was, was as blue as black silk, and as black as blue silk. Dull grammarians might ask what it was exactly that ran through the body like a chill, unless the body ran through itself. And even when all these riddles of style and syntax were resolved, it would seem somehow as if the upshot, the main happening, or what the conventional call the story, somehow managed still to elude the mind. But all this is literary, logical, or grammatical criticism, and cannot affect the popular and political question about which there can surely be no doubt. Dons and doctors of letters may carp and criticize, but if this poem were read aloud to ten dusty navvies in a third-class carriage, we can all imagine the success of its simple appeal. We can conceive how hearty a chorus it would make for the humble tavern, and how rousing a marching song for the proletarian revolution. I can imagine a jolly chorus of laborers at the spotted dog singing, Three times croak broke out of me to the tune of three times round when our gallant, gallant ship. I can imagine a host of workmen and peasants in arms chanting aloud that their chests split crimson out of them with the same simple hardiness, as the old peasant revolutionists saying that the foul blood of tyrants should flow in their furrows. I have taken this remarkable poem at random as representing one side of the popular appeal, but if Bolshevist poetry is perhaps a little subtle, it is only fair to say the Bolshevist prose is admirably sincere and plain. And while Bolshevist poetry is perhaps a little withdrawn from democracy, Bolshevist prose is quite definitely and dogmatically against democracy. It is against democracy in the final and fundamental sense in which we are for democracy. Indeed, we could not ask a fairer or clearer statement of the real difference in issue for decision, as we have always presented it, than the following lines which are printed in the Liberator, in large letters like a proclamation. The Russian peasants want their small pieces of land, oppose communal, large-scale production. They wanted free trading, which enabled them to sell their products. 
petty business is still their ideal. The Soviet government discovered it was impossible to imbue them with the aims of socialism by intensive education. It has changed its tactics. It has made trading legal and tells the peasants they may sell all they produce above their own needs in a specified amount for the government. This means food will come out of hiding, that the peasants will produce abundantly, but they will become even more petit bourgeois. On the other hand, the Soviet government proposes to inaugurate the most modern, large-scale production, state socialism, under government control and management. It proposes to permit capitalists, under short-time government concessions, to establish large-scale modern production in certain branches of industry. These monopolies will drive the peasants out of small productive methods and into communal production, giving them more social vision and preparing them, as well as industry, for socialism. The capital letters for the highly democratic word drive are not mine, but theirs. Then follows this final and interesting pronouncement on democracy itself. You cannot educate or persuade the mass of people into new ways, but you can cut the economic ground from under their feet and throw them into the ranks of the proletariat. The capitalist newspapers call this capitalism. We call it a brilliant understanding of economic determinism. I call it the oppression of the poor and a Jew moneylender's mad hatred of the people and all popular things. But let us put aside our personal definitions for the moment and consider the cold facts. It may be a brilliant understanding of economic determinism. There is no doubt, whatever, that it is capitalism. As a matter of fact, capitalism was itself completely founded on economic determinism. It was one of its many points of resemblance to the new socialism. All the old capitalists also used to announce their intention to drive out all peasants by the iron laws of economic determinism. Capitalism always said that the small man must go because Rockefeller would drive him out. And the Bolshevists submit that they are using Rockefeller to do it. They themselves call him a capitalist. They themselves call him a monopolist. And they themselves admit that he is called in not to help the people, but to ruin them. They are not only avowedly establishing capitalism, but avowedly establishing it to do all the harm that capitalism has ever done. Capitalism is to be artificially established in order to reduce people to the proletarian condition from which socialism was established to rescue them. It is to cut the economic ground from under the poor man's feet, the whole barbarity of swindling and sweating and freezing out that moved them in their youth, to revolt against the great economic crime in whose shadow we live. And I ask them if they ever heard from the coarsest and most corrupt capitalist, from any bore in a rich club or bully in a trade dispute, Anything more brazenly oppressive, more brutally ungenerous, more full of the foulest self-confidence of the commercial road hog than the words in which that socialist manifesto talks of driving out peasants by the power of monopolists or cutting economic ground from under the feet of the poor. If anything were required to show up the shameless economic tyranny thus trumpeted abroad, it would be the amusing abruptness and awkwardness with which one phrase is hastily inserted to indicate uplift and to please the highbrows. Giving them more social vision, snivels the monopolist, very much as the Johannesburg millionaire talks about teaching the niggers the dignity of labor. It is an understatement to say that there is no difference between the social visionary and the Johannesburg millionaire, for he positively boasts that he is going to use all the methods of the millionaire, and very probably the individual millionaire himself. The Bolshevists' enemies used to say, that they employed Chinese executioners. It is more to the point that they are at one with the Rand lords in employing the principle of Chinese labor. They use capitalist methods of that color to undercut the peasants, exactly as the others, exactly as that pleasing practical joke is performed by the sweating employer or the rack-renting landlord in a slum. It is unnecessary for anyone holding our own views to add anything to the paragraph quoted. The proclamation of the propaganda of the liberator might almost be reprinted, as it stands and circulated as a proclamation of propaganda for the new witness. Everything is admitted there with an almost touching simplicity. The failure of Bolshevism to impress the distributist, the revenge that is to be taken on him by the help of the capitalist, the admission that small property satisfies its possessors, the admission that the denial of distributivism is the denial of democracy. But there are many perfectly good and sincere revolutionists who do not admit the distributive theory of the new witness policy. There are many who come of the strict tradition ennobled by the personality of Heinemann. 
There are some who react into a sort of romantic Bolshevism like Conrad Noel. There are some who still believe even in the pure Fabianism of Bernard Shaw. Wherever they are, and from whatever detached or even deserted outpost flying the red flag, I confidently place the above paragraph before them. I ask them to remember the callous insolence of capitalism, the hateful complacency and sophistry that use economic laws like wheels to break men like sticks, use them to cut down the wages of the natives. They use the same methods. I do not see any reason why they should not use the same men. Many a South African plutocrat who has begun by putting Chinese laborers in compounds and English strikers in prison may end up in the congenial function of breaking the backs of the poor man of Russia till they crawl to him for a wage. For anybody with anything like common sense will by this time have formed his conclusions about this social vision, this brilliant understanding of economic determinism. The story seems to be a very simple one. A gang of ordinary Jewish capitalists first destroyed all rival capitalists by pretending to be communists, and then went on to destroy small proprietors by avowing themselves capitalists once more. What is rather startling, and perhaps rather refreshing, is the fullness and frankness of the avowal. End of section 1 Recording by Arden Section 2 of G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns The New Witness, 1922 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nathan Israel Smolin G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns The New Witness, 1922 by G. K. Chesterton Section 2 The New Legend of Labor by G. K. Chesterton The present political division into three or perhaps four parties leaves men with my opinions as much isolated as the old division into two. We might have some sympathy with the wee frees if they were in the least worthy to claim with dignity the title given them in derision. I can imagine no nobler title than one which describes a small minority fighting for liberty, and it is typical of the time that it should be regarded as a taunt. But it may be doubted whether these liberals deserve the taunt, and we ourselves have a better right to it. I myself am conspicuously we in the political sense, and I can claim to be considerably more free than they are. Their new war cry for the general election is to boast that they have a Gladstone to direct them in the person of Lord Gladstone, and proceed doubtless to denounce the institution of Lords for its slavish submission to the hereditary principle. Now the two principal things I remember about this new Gladstone are first that he abolished the Habeas Corpus Act by introducing indeterminate imprisonment, and second that he ruled in South Africa when English labor men were lawlessly clapped in jail to please the German Jew millionaires. For the rest, coalition is only corruption writ large, and the Labor Party fumbles at the construction of the servile state too feebly to construct anything. There remains the possibility of a labor policy immediately more revolutionary, if ultimately as servile. In other words, there remains what is called Bolshevism, and its chances seem worthy of a brief consideration. I have made some notes in this column from time to time recently, and I may possibly make some more touching the real errors of Bolshevism. I do it partly because I really think that the errors of Bolshevism are doing a great deal of harm. I do it even more because I think that the errors of anti-Bolshevism are doing even more harm. If this sort of socialism prevails, it will be almost entirely through having been resisted in the wrong way. Indeed, this was undoubtedly the case with the milder socialism of a generation before. Fabianism became a fashion, largely through the genius of Mr. Bernard Shaw and the science of Mr. Sidney Webb, but even more through the stupidity of the critics of Mr. Shaw and the ignorance of the critics of Mr. Webb. Bernard Shaw was represented as a rather naughtier and more risque sort of Dan Leno. As the natural result, anybody who discovered that he was really trying to tell the truth jumped to the premature conclusion that it was the truth that he was telling. 
The moderates in the county council suggested that Sidney Webb was a sans culotte, ready to kill with a guillotine and die on the barricade. The consequence was that, when people found that Webb was much more moderate than the moderates, they too hastily inferred that he must be much more right than the moderates. You cannot more completely acquit a man of the crimes that are really his own than by convicting him of the crimes that are contrary to his own. It would be a lucky thing for the Kaiser if a Prussian military court broke his sword and tore off his epaulets, and degraded him as a conchi and a coward who refused to make war on Europe. It would have been a lucky thing for Lord Clanricard if his family had put him in an asylum as unfit to manage his estates, owing to his reckless charity to the poor and quixotic tenderness for his tenants. And it was a lucky thing for the socialists that people denounced them as anarchists and predicted that they would tear us in pieces with their anarchy. The result was that, ten years afterwards, we woke up to find ourselves bound hand and foot by their bureaucracy. For the moment, however, I would leave this latter and larger matter for the right answer to socialism, and pause upon a parenthesis touching the former point, the question of whether the thing itself has at the moment any chance of spreading. It certainly has not anything like the chance it had in the first days of the Fabian movement. But there are some elements in the modern mood which work in its favor. There is a state of mind to which it is largely welcome. I only indulge here in the digression of a vague description of that mental state. First of all, socialism, which twenty years ago had entered philosophy, has now certainly entered history. In the moment a thing enters history, it enters legend. Marx, like Mohammed, has now something more than a cause. He has also an effect. And there are some to whom any effect is effective. They are the sort who propose to ladies who have been in the dock for murder. In some ways the legend of Marx is rather like the legend of Darwin. In each case a certain personality invented a certain theory in support of a certain cause. In each case the three things have been reversed. First, the theory has become more important than the cause, and then the personality has become more important even than the theory. The general idea of evolution is much older than Darwin. The general idea of socialism is much older than Marx. But the curious thing is that men began to think more of Darwinism than of evolution, and actually went on to think more of Darwin than of Darwinism. In the same way, men seem to be prouder of being Marxians than of being socialists, and then to be not so much even Marxians as rather adorers of Marx. The Darwinian and Marxian controversies became personal questions. It was strange, for they were not only impersonal ideas, but ideas directed to the depression of personality. The biologists who taught that things only changed with evolutionary slowness also taught that with Darwin everything had changed with revolutionary abruptness. The economic historians who taught that the individual man could alter nothing also taught that the individual Marx had altered everything. The magic of the spirit of man was too strong for all this degrading dullness, and even their materialism was ennobled into a myth. Darwin not only has a statue, but a shrine. And if you discuss his theory in a rationalistic spirit in the presence of men about sixty years old, you will soon find out that he was not only the hero of a romance, but the founder of a religion. The whole point of his process was that it eliminated personality, and the only result of it is that thousands worship the personality who have not the faintest notion of the process. In exactly the same way, while the Marxian philosophy is confessedly concerned with discrediting the heroic idea and history, it has only spread in the form of hero worship. We all remember Mr. H. G. Wells' very humorous account of the ubiquity of the big and bushy beard of Karl Marx in the pictures, statues, and decorations of Bolshevist Russia. Such a multiplication of images is a part of mysticism and even of mythology. These are the new icons of holy Russia. So one might have seen on every side, painted flat and embossed halos of gold, the beard of St. Nicholas or the beard of St. Andrew. Even the Muslims, if they were also Marxians, though they might still be forbidden to have such visible portraits, could invoke Marx as well as Mohammed 
in words of an ancient imagery, swearing by the beard of the prophet. In arguing with a the Marxian, therefore, the first thing one has to deal with is Marx simply as a name of power like Muhammad. Along with Muhammad goes the Quran. Along with the image of the man goes the image of the book. Not that it be understood the book itself. Nothing has had so much terrible and transcendental power over men as something written which they have not read. There is no book like the sealed book. The Bible plays that part for many. For others the Quran, for others the origin of species, for others the capital of Karl Marx. To this extent we may say that such popularity as Bolshevism ever has obtained, or ever can obtain, in Russia or elsewhere is due to the very elements which Bolshevists generally affect to despise, and that they prevail in practice through the things that they reject in theory. They prevail by the legend, by the ritual, by the religious emblem, and the oral tradition. This sort of romance is necessarily somewhat akin to rumor, and to a rumor that spreads outwards from one man to many. One man kills a gigantic bear, and twenty men tell the story around the campfires. One warrior slays a great king in battle, and a hundred minstrels sing of the deed of arms as they wander through the cities of the world. And just as in a prehistoric tribe or a Greek city or a medieval village, a multitude would repeat that there was once a man who slew twenty men, or fasted for fifty days, or swam some incredible distance, or bore some unspeakable tortures. So there will be current and socialist circles in a modern city, the indestructible tradition that there was once a Marxian who had read the works of Marx. But when we come to this inner ring of the original heroes who have read the book or made a bold and adventurous attempt to read the book, we come upon a somewhat different psychological problem. The essential psychological problem of our people today is that they are starved for lack of something which has been normal to the nations of the earth, a religion. Religion has its artistic and its scientific side, its popular and its specialist side. And just as the mere rumor of the reputations of Darwin or Marx inadequately supplies the place of legend, so for the initiated the mere existence of a theory inadequately supplied the place of a theology. And of them we may truly say that the Marxian system was satisfactory, not because it was a good system or a wise system, but simply because it was a system. There is something extraordinarily fascinating, especially to the bewildered people of a vague and transitional time, about any explanation of anything. But for some attempt at a description of this rather interesting state of mind, I must find space in another article. End of section 2of G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Craig Abbott. G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922, by G. K. Chesterton. The Future of the Flag About the time of the worst barbarian pillage of the shrines and civic wealth of Belgium, I happened to find myself in direct controversy with a German propagandist. I was startled at the staleness of some of his charges. Of course, he said that ours was a mercenary army, they could not understand military necessities. He also actually said that we were a nation of shopkeepers. Of course, I made the obvious reply that I preferred it to a nation of shoplifters. But now, in a more serene atmosphere, I am ready to consider the original charge on its own merits. I am ready to judge calmly whether the phrase about a nation of shopkeepers is really too harsh a censure. And judged calmly, at the present moment, it is clear that it is much too high a compliment. It would be, by comparison, a utopia of liberty, equality, 
and fraternity if England were really a nation of shopkeepers, in the sense of every man keeping his own shop. There was a time when this was much more nearly the case, and it was a time when England, if not at her best, was perhaps at her strongest. When men like Clive and Wolfe, as much of the middle classes as Johnson and Richardson, were gaining an empire by winning fights instead of losing it by waving flags. It was not my utopia, and I do not think England so enviable, even when she was a nation of shopkeepers, as when she was a nation of yeomen. But, precisely because the shopkeepers did own their shops, they had something of the sturdiness and natural dignity of yeomen. The last corruption of commercialism, which is called capitalism, comes when the shopkeepers have lost their shops, as much as the yeomen have lost their farms. It has already come. Under capitalism, few men can be keepers of shops or keepers of anything, in the true sense, for they are not given anything as the children say, to keep. The rich only lend them houses and tools and land to use, just as the rich only lend them money. And in all cases, the effect is bankruptcy and servitude. They are not keepers of anything, except occasionally keepers of lunatics or of lions at the zoo. They seldom truly attain the highest state of being shopkeepers, or the still more dizzy and divine elevation of being innkeepers. They have become more and more men serving for a salary or a wage the few great shopkeepers who own the great shops. If the capitalistic process is completed, we shall become a race of servants, with all the vices and, what is almost worse, the virtues of servants, smooth and orderly, and supple and superficial. We shall no longer be a nation of shopkeepers. We shall become rather a nation of shopwalkers. It may be that the apotheosis of the shopwalker will after all be interrupted by the unsympathetic appearance of the shop steward. That is a matter with which I shall deal when I resume the main thread of my recent attempt at a theoretical study of Bolshevism. Here I have another reason for noting the three stages of that descent. Distributism, or a nation of yeomen. Competition, or a nation of shopkeepers. Capitalism, or a nation of shopwalkers. Although the second is immeasurably better than the third, it is true that the second practically led to the third. It is possible that it officially led to the third. The yeoman spirit gradually died out of the shopkeepers, and they would no longer fight even for their own shops. And this can be sharply tested by taking the very imagery of the old yeoman ideal, its badges or its ballads, and imagine them applied to the more recent merchant, let alone to the modern millionaire. And we could hardly find a better symbol of the whole business than the recent discussion about the national flag about the combination that we call the Union Jack, as compared with that simpler flag that would have flown from the masts of the merchant ships of the Middle Ages. The question has been raised in connection with the reconstructed relations of England and Ireland. The red saltire in the Union Jack is supposed to be St. Patrick's Cross, but some are doubtful about whether it has much to do with St. Patrick. Of the three national patrons, St. Patrick is certainly the most vivid saint, but among the heraldic traditions, his is the least vivid cross. The silver saltire of St. Andrew, on its azure ground, has a splendid history. The Scots called it the Blue Blanket, and it was carried as the flag of the guilds, or popular trade brotherhoods, of Edinburgh, in battle and still more often in riot. One of the Scottish kings mournfully commented on the democratic militancy of the guilds, saying that, if they be in anything controlled, up goes the blue blanket. 
and anyone who will look at the single cross of St. Andrew, or for that matter at the single cross of St. George, as displayed on the simple medieval banner, will see how much better the very idea of a banner was understood in medieval times. In this, as in most other things, it is not merely that the medieval craft was more beautiful than the modern, but that the medieval craft was very much more practical than the modern. The plain cross red on white, or white on blue, fulfills the first idea of an ensign or standard, which is to be easily seen and recognized. Both those national flags show clearly at a great distance, as they did when they shone over against each other at Flodden or Bannockburn. In comparison, the Union Jack is more like a piece of camouflage than a piece of heraldry. For the moment, however, the flag is in a double sense merely a symbol, and it is a symbol of the simpler patriotism that existed before the yeomen even became shopkeepers. The disentanglement of the Triple Cross detaches for us, among other things, the definite idea of St. George. It is a satisfactory thought that there are three saints on the Union Jack, but though it is a satisfactory thought, I do not think it is a very common or customary thought. I doubt if many people ever think of halos and holiness when looking at the Union Jack, and we are tempted to say that too many saints spoil the sanctity. But we are in some sense bound to think of St. George when looking at St. George's cross. And the more we think about St. George, the less satisfied we shall be with three stages of the historical transition I have noted. The shopkeepers of the early 19th century were patriots. The clerks of the early 20th century are still patriots but there is an increasing sense of division and incongruity between the patriots and the patron. It is not quite so inevitable an in image to conceive the shopkeeper shouting, St. George for Mary England, bring out the ledger, or Adsit Anglis Sanctus Georgius, and the next article, madam. And as for the modern capitalist of the big stores, there seems no particular reason why he should devote himself to St. George, or feel anything but a slight embarrassment in the presence of the cross of St. George. As he avowedly admires the stores because they are large, labyrinthine, and able to absorb the things around them, it would seem more natural that he should admire the dragon. The secret of the matter, I fancy, might be found in a rather simple verbal inversion. Those English crusaders who chose the protection of this champion during King Richard's romantic raid on the Palestinian coast were doubtless very ready to cry, St. George for England. But they also meant something else, which might be expressed by crying, England for St. George. They did not merely mean that heaven was supporting whatever the English were doing. They also meant that the English were then supporting what heaven was doing. It was a case of gesta de per anglos, as well as per francos. In other words, they recognized some idea of shaping the course of England to a standard outside England, if it were only in paradise. But in fact, it was not only in paradise, it was also in Christendom. The Englishman was to approximate in his own way to the common standard of the Christian soldier. When we recalled the legend that King Arthur had been the universal arbiter of chivalry, we made that chivalry universal. Whatever is vulgar or evil in patriotism was obviated by the idea of an external and objective standard. It was not merely that St. George was sure to support Englishmen, but that Englishmen were bound to support St. George. The loss of that conception of England for St. George has been the origin of all our corruptions, which have culminated in capitalism. Our wandering began with things much more spirited and picturesque, with little ships sailing to new worlds and seeking glory as well as gold. 
but there was no standard to bring it back to sanity. There was no image or clear ideal that we could feel the danger of growing more and more unlike. The Englishman only followed his nose and had forgotten every other finger post. He had only a confused sense of the glory of getting more and more of something and hardly knew how to test whether it was really something good. His empire became a patchwork of colors as his flag became a patchwork of crosses. But he no longer even knew that the cross was a cross. He no longer even realized that the patron saint had ever been a saint, thinking him quite sufficiently honored by having been asked to be a patron. End of The Future of the Flag Recording by Craig Abbott Section 4 of G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922, by G. K. Chesterton. Section 4. The Men Who Brighten London, by G. K. Chesterton. It ought to be primarily a pleasure to find that men very different from ourselves agree with us, or with some good cause with which we sympathize but I think it is sometimes lawful to be amused at being in their company, so long as we realize that they may be equally amused at being in ours. I have great sympathy, for instance, with what is called the proposal to brighten London, if it means resistance to the plutocratic puritanism that is always trying to darken London. I am sure that if ever there is again such a thing as Merry England, there will also be such a thing as merry London. As a poet not much more than a hundred years ago could still talk about merry Islington, and just as I have relapsed into a daydream of all that lost laughter and natural human pantomime, have set up a maypole in Cheapside and a greasy pole in Fleet Street, hung up a horse collar to be grinned through somewhere in the neighborhood of Essex Street, and generally spread my soul in all that broad English farce, which was at once so coarse and so Christian. I read a little further, and I am brought to a reflective pause. The paper tells me that the two chief champions of the revival of Merry London are Lord Curzon and Mr. Gordon Selfridge. Now this certainly causes a gentle wonder, tinged by a faint and far-off sense of incongruity, the remarks attributed to Lord Curzon are quite sensible remarks. No remarks are attributed to Mr. Selfridge, and it is possible that his silence was still more sensible, but I had not actually seen these figures in my vision of the festive street. When I set up the horse collar, it was not in the immediate hope that Lord Curzon would grin through it. When I set up the maypole, it was not with the special purpose of seeing Mr. Gordon Selfridge dancing round it. I had not even the shadow of any malicious intention of making him climb the greasy pole, or attempt to climb the greasy pole. He had not been especially present to my imagination at all. My dream had been highly domestic and traditional, full of the old songs and stories of a time when London was actually brightened by Londoners. It was an entirely English atmosphere, which I had filled with entirely English humours. It was the life and liberty of my own country that had returned upon me like an English spring. And in the drifting speculations of my daydreams, it did not seem to me that Mr. Gordon Selfridge had anything particular to do with it. Lord Curzon is certainly a native and genuine product of England if not exactly of merry England. 
when moving amid the mysterious pomp of the east he may have been at least relatively a representative of the livelier and more laughing west standing beside some tower of skulls let us say left by tamburlaine or some other tyrant he may well appear a happy and almost hilarious figure in some dark divan surrounded entirely by mutes bearing bow-strings he may well be the life and soul of the party he is more cheerful than chinese tortures and would be a more comfortable travelling companion than a thug but in the christian saturnalia of my vision i can imagine a roar of revelry in which even his joyful voice would be drowned it would never have occurred to me to picture him leading the dance to the old english tune of boys and girls come out to play and i think there are even elements in his personality making against such a choice anyone who leads that dance must at least be superior to superiority still less do i understand mr selfridge and his call to brighton england though i can easily believe in his divine vocation to brighton new england since the time of puritanism it has needed it a good deal and since the time of prohibition it has needed it still more nor is prohibition by any means alone among the creeping slaveries and chilly superstitions with which american democracy is threatened he might brighten up the blue laws and change them to a brighter blue as they once existed in connecticut and may possibly return there and heaven knows where else as well the blue laws might be described in every sense as blue devils he might initiate any number of highbrows into the significance of high jinks he might accept it as his high and holy mission to poke and prod something resembling a sense of humor into the awful female reformers of the united states the women who would turn that civilization into a new sort of matriarchy so far as one can have a matriarchy without any particular respect either for maternity or matrimony he might be granted the arduous adventure of putting a little sense into the intellectual american child and to the little ass who said when common sense comes in superstition is annihilated or the little beast who recently gave up his toy gun to assist in the disarmament of the world if he could not brighten the spirits of prohibitionists he might at least brighten their wits surely america needs all her sons in the struggle especially one thus gifted with uproarious gaiety and a mingled passion for revelry and revolt in this case indeed i know nothing of the individual element and can only infer it from the public partisanship i have not generally found that the great capitalists of the modern world were a merry or even a happy race of men there is a saying that money talks but money hardly ever sings and certainly money hardly ever laughs but it may be that these are happy exceptions indeed it might even be credible to them if they were unhappy exceptions there is one conceivable hypothesis about the motive of these two gentlemen and one which would be altogether to their honor it is that they are acting in an agony of remorse it is that they are acting not because they think themselves peculiarly fitted to brighton london but because they have realized that they or at any rate people like them have done so much to darken it if any two types of humanity have brought our cities to their present condition of a dismal industrialism persecuted by faddists it is the two types of the aristocrat in alliance with finance and the shopkeeper who wants to own a street instead of a shop it may be that mr selfridge has realized this and looks back with a regret akin to remorse upon the happier days of the past when he might have been the owner of one little shop and linked with his equals in membership of one honorable guild but whether he realizes it or not there is no doubt that it is the reality the reason why it is difficult for us to brighten london 
the reason why it is easy for prigs and lunatics to darken london is simply that we have lost our reasonable liberty through losing our relative equality and we have lost our liberty and equality through the unrestricted growth of great commercial fortunes at the expense of small ones it is very possible that mr selfridge himself has all the innocence and simplicity of his nation and does not know this for he comes from a country which with all its merits is in this matter decidedly backward and behind the times america is early victorian in its economics and even in its ethics it can still believe that the industrious apprentice became lord mayor without ever discovering the two difficulties in the proposition the difficulty even in old times was that there were a hundred apprentices and there could not be a hundred mayors the difficulty in modern times is that there are no apprentices the system of apprenticeship could only coexist with the domestic and parochial spirit of the small shop there were such things as industrious apprentices but there are no such things as industrial apprentices and the spirit of those boys truly apprenticed to a trade was by universal tradition and record the spirit that really brightened london there were many reasons for this but one was preeminent the ordinary apprentices could not all be mayors but they could all be masters they did not all look forward to a predestination of proletarianism to building or tending other men's houses until they died they have been reduced to this impersonal servitude by the rise of the big shops and the big businesses which have infinitely increased the number of servants and decreased the number of masters and therefore of free men it is possible that mr selfridge ponders thoughtfully upon these things it is also possible that he has never heard of them it is possible that he has not appreciated the last turn of history or what is meant by the resurrection of ireland and the returning power of france we may yet see the big shop become something of a white elephant and then something more like a mammoth but in whatever degree the small shops stand for prosperity there is no doubt that they stood for liberty and therefore for gaiety nothing will ensure the beginning of that gaiety except the end of capitalism nothing will brighten london except knocking down the new york skyscrapers of millionaire monopoly with which we have been insane enough to block out the brightness of the sky in a very living sense of the legal phrase it is a matter of ancient lights end of section four recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida Section 5 of G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alan O. Impara. G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922, by G. K. Chesterton, Section 5. At the Sign of the World's End, The Bigotry of Bolshevism, by G. K. Chesterton. The bigotry of the Bolshevists is of a peculiar and interesting kind. We hear much of old people being bigoted in their antiquated ideas. It has always been my experience that the young are much more bigoted in their new ideas. I use the word bigotry in the only sense in which I have ever found it useful, and in that sense it is very useful. I mean by bigotry not certainty or even fanatical certainty, but that weakness in the imagination which cannot even conceive the alternative of uncertainty or error. Suppose I say something, preferably something I do not say, for example, that Mohammed miraculously flew up into the sky. I do not think a man a bigot because he is sure Mohammed did nothing of the kind. I do not think him in the least bigoted because he says Mohammed must have done it by the aid of devils. I do not think him in the least bigoted because he wants to burn me at the stake for spreading the story. It is certain that the story of Mohammed has a great influence. 
It is tenable that its influence is to spread moral abuses and abominations, such as polygamy and massacre, and the discouragement of wine. Burning is bad, but it is not bigoted, for it only exaggerates the results of error. It does not necessarily misunderstand the origins of error. There are three types of men in such a case whom I should call bigots. One is the man who says, you must be a fool if you think a man ever flew up into the sky. He is a bigot because he takes as self-evident what is not self-evident. To say the least of it, the case is more complex, and the evidence for levitation and other psychical powers, even in a modern sense, much more considerable. Then there is the second and far more deplorable fool who says boldly, you don't believe that a man ever flew up to the sky, and goes on to talk about delightful paradoxes and people who will have their joke until we pass into that state of musing when one wonders if the man had a knock on the head in infancy. But the third, and worse sort of bigot, is the young man who comes up to me and says, What? Haven't you read Grubsby's book? The whole thing has been explained. The Borge school held that levitation was subliminal, but Grubsky has shown, etc., etc. And then he will tell you the explanation, that the word for sky in the original Arabic also means a stepladder or a camel, or that Muhammad was metaphorically accused of skylocking or being above himself. Or perhaps Grubsky has proved that it did happen by merely mechanical means of the most modern sort, that the prophet was pulled up by means of the new science of aviation, by aeroplanes painted to resemble clouds according to the new science of camouflage. Now this is not impossible. But what is the matter with the young man is that he cannot be persuaded that I, while clearly seeing that it is not impossible, do really still think it is exceedingly improbable. He is convinced that I cannot have heard of Grubsky's theory. He is sure I have never realized the existence of aeroplanes. He is sure I have never even seen the word camouflage. As soon as he understood the theory, he adopted it. He is certain that if once I understand it, I shall accept it. He cannot bring himself to believe, what is the very simple fact, that I do understand it and do not accept it. I do really think levitation much more likely than the elaborate story of the cloud-painted aeroplane. I do really believe the miraculous event to be more probable than the scientific event. But he cannot believe that I believe it. In other words, he is a bigot. And being a young bigot, he is far more bigoted than an old one. The very small but sincere minority that is the soul of Bolshevism consists of young bigots of this kind. They are marked by this special mental character, that they have not only themselves accepted their system because it is a system, but they are convinced that anybody else will accept it as soon as he realizes that it is a system. In other words, they cannot believe that anybody who can see that it explains everything can nevertheless hold that it explains everything wrong. Every decent detective story, for instance, consists of about five explanations, each of which explains everything and explains everything wrong. And in the case of sociological explanations, there is this further falsification, that it is always possible to take one social element only and follow its ramifications all over the world without recognizing anything else in the world. It is like a railway map of Europe which leaves out all the roads and all the rivers. Indeed. The different generalizations about the modern world are very like those alternative maps of the same area found in an atlas. One colored according to geological soils, another shaded to show the height of hills and mountains, another dotted with populations, and so on. Each of these is a universal truth, and each is a narrow one. What the Bolshevists print for us is a proletarian map of Europe. It would be easy to overthrow their whole theory by simply printing a peasant map of Europe. It would be easy to print a map of Europe in terms of any particular type of work, peasant or proletarian. In the countryside where I live, the chief occupation is chair-making. And in the chief town, there are plenty of labor disputes about it. We could easily draw up a chair-maker's chart of the whole world. We could easily do it so as to suggest that the whole world is more or less occupied in making chairs, and that it is merely a matter of less rather than more. There would be a congested area of chairs over a place like Paris, where there must be a vast multitude of them outside all those countless cafes. Chairs would begin to thin and fade away in the direction of Constantinople until we came to the true east, where people prefer to sit curled up on cushions on the floor. 
But it must be noted, for this is the vital point, that in this sort of statistical chart there would never be any mention of cafes or cushions. There would never be any mention of any of the other human habits which modify or multiply the habit of making chairs. It would simply be implied that there was a lot of it in one place and a little of it in another place, and there would always be a little of it in every place. There are cafes in Constantinople as well as in Paris. There are presumably some chairs dotted about the howling deserts of Siberia. The king of the cannibal islands possibly possesses one three-legged stool, which he uses as his throne, as he possesses one top hat, which he uses as a crown. But all this human variety and complexity is left out in the type of reasoning which reasons only in terms of one thing. Thus, the socialists will talk about the Poles as if they were all to be treated entirely as industrial trades unionists, which is as if we were to insist on the Dutch being paid properly as alpine guides or on the Swiss being suitably remunerated for having built dikes against the sea. They will talk of the proletariat in Serbia, which is as if I were to plead for the hardy peasantry of Serbiton. But there is another psychological effect of this bigotry of a system, which is also rather curious. The bigot always begins by supposing us ignorant of its beginnings. He thinks we do not understand the very first steps of his argument, whereas it is generally the last step that seems to us mysterious, and that only because it is inconsequent. Therefore, he laboriously repeats, with elaborate lucidity, the obvious parts of his argument and repeats them so often that he never gets to the only point that could puzzle anybody. The socialist will tell us, in the tone of one teaching an infant school, that labor produces wealth, that capitalism controls too much of the wealth, that there is an economic conflict between labor and capitalism, and almost as a light and ornamental peroration, therefore he proposes to establish state or communistic control. It is as if a man were to say, I have planted some bulbs in my garden which will not grow without sun. My neighbor has built a wall which keeps off the sun. I am resolved to endure such a wrong no longer, and therefore I will give the bulbs tomorrow morning either to the Prince of Wales or to the policeman at the corner of the street. When we appear a little mystified, he begins all over again with the same laborious lucidity and heartbroken forbearance, explaining to us that the chemical action of the sun upon bulbs has been studied by botanists and found to result in their germinating or sprouting, and that the consistency of a brick wall is such that the sun's rays can with difficulty penetrate it. What he cannot apparently bring himself to believe is that we do not think the bulbs will sprout any better in the pocket of the policeman, and that is the long and the short of the whole argument about nationalization and state ownership. Now it is perfectly true that there is a good deal more to be said even about the proposition that labor in the ordinary sense produces all wealth in the ordinary sense. But the more we consider the very simple cases in which his principle is more or less true, the more clearly we shall see that the socialist deduction from it is quite startlingly untrue. Assuming, if only for the sake of argument, that a laborer digs in the ground and produces a turnip, which leaves out a good deal, and assuming for the sake of argument that our object is merely that he should control what he produces, it seems to me obvious that the safest way of ensuring it is to let him own the turnip and eat it. It is to allow him to put it away, not merely as a peasant puts away wealth in a stocking or a hole in the ground, but to put it safely into the money box of his mouth and the strong box of his stomach. Nobody could control the turnip more completely than that. But it seems to me quite reverse of self-evident that socializing the turnip will give the man producing it more power of controlling it. Communism must either mean a scramble in which the strongest thief takes the turnip or, much more probably, an organization by which a few people allot what turnips they choose to what people they choose. I shall try to show in another article that this is not only what Bolshevism means, but what the Bolshevists themselves say that it means. But the point here is that if you tell the bigot that you do not see what his own solution has to do with his own problem, he will look at you sadly and begin to explain his problem all over again. End of section 5. Recording by Alan O. Impara. Section number 6 of G. K. Chesterton's newspaper columns. The New Witness, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. G.K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922, by G.K. Chesterton. At the Sign of the World's End, Bolshevist versus Jacobin, by G.K. Chesterton. There is now no little talk about suppressing communist literature. If the intention be to discourage people from being communists, it would seem more advisable to circulate it. At least my own potential sympathy with socialism, which was once very great, and my potential sympathy with socialists, which is still very great, are proof against almost anything except the study of their literature. All else I can endure, but that is too much for me. Show me a Bolshevist murder, and I can think charitably and sympathetically of the people I myself have been tempted to murder. Also I can think that good men, as well as bad men, have been tyrannicides. Show me a Bolshevist massacre, and I can recall the moods when I have mildly wondered why there were not any English massacres. I can also recall, again in a more serious spirit, that the revenge of a mob has sometimes been a sort of wild justice. But show me a Bolshevist pamphlet, and my sympathy is strained to its breaking point, and breaks at last. Every popular instinct I possess, every drop of blood I inherit from people who worked or played or sang or fought or were free, rises in revolt against the thing, against its long words and long-winded expositions, its superciliousness, and its sectarianism its jargon of popular science that is neither scientific nor popular. Its admirers think it unanswerable, because it is unreadable. But when I say that socialist literature is the best answer to socialism, I do not merely refer to the dusty pamphlets to which this description applies. It is the paradox of the position that this is even more true of the socialist work that is well written and well worth reading. I am far from intending to imply that the whole of literary Bolshevism is bosh. Some of it is bosh enough in all conscience. When the theorists talk about internationalizing Ireland, or when they talk as if the Polish populace was a proletariat, or when they say that fairy tales give too favorable a picture of princes and princesses, or when they say that religion is the opium of the people, they are certainly talking bosh. But some of them do write in a lucid, intelligent, and philosophical style. And the interesting point of the position is this. The more lucid they are, the more they show that their policy is really a policy of slavery. The more intelligent they are, the more intelligible they make their policy of slavery. The more philosophical they are, the more fully they reveal that it rests on a philosophy of slavery. In The Liberator, the Bolshevist organ in America, appear articles by a very interesting and capable writer named Floyd Dell. And he wrote an article recently on a comparison between the Russian Revolution and the old French and American revolutions, which interested me very much. The most interesting point about it is this, that it definitely pitted the Russian Revolution of Trotsky against the French Revolution of Danton or the American Revolution of Washington. It did not tell the Bolshevists that they were treading in the glorious tracks of the Jacobins, or even that they were completing the unfinished work of the Jacobins. It practically told the Bolshevists that they were fighting against the Jacobins. Mr. Floyd Dell has thought his way deep enough into the realities of the thing to see that the Russian Revolution is really as much the enemy of the French Revolution as revolutionary Russia is now the enemy of Republican France. The first form his argument takes is to reproach the old Republican movements with their failure to give men their own boasted gifts of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. He has no difficulty in showing that in the modern industrial world, life has often meant death by starvation, liberty enslavement by sweaters, happiness the most dismal and mechanical life endured by men. This argument is perfectly sound as far as it goes. I have myself used this criticism of the revolution in reply to its own criticism of the church. If Christian ideals have been soiled in the course of 18 centuries, Liberal ideals have been even more soiled in the course of one century. But when Mr. Dell goes on to say that where the Republic failed, the Soviet will now succeed, it becomes necessary to remind him of recent facts. Soviet ideals have not merely failed or been soiled, but have been openly and avowedly abandoned. 
and that not even in the course of one century, but in the course of one or two years. After all, the Republican ideals of Jefferson and Robespierre never failed quite so abruptly and absolutely as that. Washington did not have to announce, during his first presidency, that America was once more a monarchical country. Lenin did definitely announce that Russia is once more a capitalist country. Robespierre's republic did not have to fill its official posts with English dukes and Prussian princes of the blood because it could not work without the old aristocracy. Trotsky does give the great commercial and agricultural concessions to all sorts of foreign capitalists because he cannot work without the old capitalism. The American state is a hundred years old and has not yet seen an actual restoration of the British king or the German king. The Soviet state is hardly four years old and has already seen a restoration of the oil king or the steel king. This is as true on the good as on the bad side of the recent compromises and concessions of the Soviet government. The Jacobins were not forced to allow the Wendian peasants to keep their feudal nobility in defiance of the whole Jacobin theory. The Bolshevists have been forced to let the Russian peasants keep their private property in defiance of the whole Bolshevist theory. And the Wendians were only a small minority of Frenchmen, while the peasants are a great majority of Russians. Lenin and Trotsky have first been forced to retreat before the little capitalists and have then actually sought refuge in invoking the help of the large capitalists. This is the success of pure communism, which Mr. Floyd Dell contrasts with the failure of the great French and American republics. Even then he only professes to prophecy, and he predicts the immediate success of something that has already failed, and even confessed its failure. But the most interesting point is this. The Bolshevist writer is not content with blaming the old revolutionists for having failed to give men freedom and happiness. He actually goes on to blame them for having tried to give men freedom and happiness. At least he goes on to explain that freedom and happiness are not the Bolshevist ideals or those by which we must judge Bolshevism. And when we read on with a natural curiosity to discover what is the Bolshevist ideal, the first thing that meets our eye is the ominous word discipline and our first comment on it is obvious enough. For that ideal, we have no need to travel all the way to Russia. We could find it at least a day's journey nearer home, in the place called Prussia. For the religion of discipline, we had no need to wait for Russia after the war. It was found in its perfection in Prussia before the war. And the more we study this really sincere and intelligent statement of Bolshevism, the more clearly we shall see that it is essentially another name for Prussianism. It makes concessions to property, but it does not make concessions to slavery. It aims at slavery. It compromises with capitalism, but it does not compromise with coercion. Its ideal is coercion. There are a hundred proofs of this, but the essential proof is the very existence of the essay which I criticize. It is that a thinking man setting out to justify the Bolshevist movement actually has to begin by explaining that he does not aim at making men free, or even at making them happy. Now there is a great deal of truth in the suggestion that this modern sort of revolution is often a revolt against a revolt. The next revolution is much more of an attack on the last revolution than an attack on the old order. This alone is enough to show that it is not a part of a steady historical evolution and enlightenment. Such a man is not going step by step along a path of progress. If anything, he is kicking backwards against the pricks of progress. But in reality, there is not in all this ebb and flow of skepticism any progress at all. If the aim is avowedly different, there can be no question even of improvement. It is idle to ask whether Trotsky has regimented men more than Danton emancipated them. It is futile to ask whether Jefferson was as successful in creating happiness as Mr. Floyd Dell is in avoiding happiness. If he does not like the ideal of happiness, we can only comfort him with the assurance that in his own utopia he will not have very much of it. If he does not like the mere stark idea of discipline or Prussian regimentation, we can only congratulate him on the chances of Trotsky giving him a good deal of it. But his explanation will probably have determined the sympathies of those among us who still think it a human ideal to be happy and a holy ideal to be free. End of section six.
Section number seven of G.K. Chesterton's newspaper columns, The New Witness, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. G.K. Chesterton's newspaper columns, The New Witness, 1922, by G.K. Chesterton. Section seven. At the sign of the world's end, the dictatorship of the proletariat, by G. K. Chesterton. When I first heard the phrase, the dictatorship of the proletariat, I said it was a senseless contradiction in terms. I said it in my haste, but it was literally and logically true. I said it was like talking of the omnipotence of omnibus conductors. It seemed obvious that, if such a being were omnipotent, he would not necessarily go on conducting an omnibus, when he might prefer, for instance, to conduct an orchestra. And it would appear equally obvious that while a man was a proletarian, he could not be a dictator, and that had he become a dictator, he would have ceased to be a proletarian. This was perhaps a merely verbal criticism, but even when I substituted something like the dictatorship of proletarians, the case was by no means clear to me. If we use the expression about a society like our own, the industrial society in which I was born, the idea involved is really unthinkable because the vast majority of men are proletarians. The dictatorship of the proletariat means the dictatorship of the masses, and the dictatorship of the masses means nothing. In an advanced, scientific, enlightened industrial community like our own, the difficulty about the poor is that there are so many of them. We might have a dictatorship ultimately representing the interests of the populace, and with that idea I shall deal presently. But we cannot have simply a dictatorship by the populace for the very word dictatorship distinguishes between the governor and the governed. A dictatorship is a despotism. That is, it is a single, directing will. Now herein lies the real answer to the riddle. You could not have in London a literal dictatorship of wage earners, but you might conceivably have a dictatorship of omnibus conductors. All sorts of men, with all sorts of opinion, most men with most opinions, are wage earners. They could not all become a single will, distinct from the community and conquering it. But omnibus conductors, or a school of specially fanatical and idealistic omnibus conductors, might possibly act like a religious sect, with the de omnibus of Mr. Barry Payne as their Bible. At a preconcerted signal, every omnibus conductor might suddenly scale his omnibus, hurl the driver from his seat, seize the wheel or reins, and rapidly drive the vehicle, with all its passengers, into some trap or enclosure, where they could all be made prisoners and held as hostages. A government founded on such a coup d'etat would be a dictatorship. It would be a dictatorship of the omnibus-conducting proletariat, but it would not be a dictatorship of the proletariat. The dethroned driver, prostrate in the road, would be quite as proletarian as his conqueror. He would still be a proletarian, and possibly even a discontented proletarian. And when I had reached this point of reflection, a very simple fact recurred to my mind. The Bolshevist dictatorship did not arise in an industrial society like my own, of which the greater proportion is proletarian. The dictatorship of the proletariat, if it did occur at all, occurred in a country where the proletariat really was a minority and not a majority. An artisan must be almost as rare in Russia as an omnibus conductor in England. At the best it would be a victory of industrial workers over peasant workers, very like my visionary victory of omnibus conductors over omnibus drivers. Taken in this sense, such a phrase as the dictatorship of the proletariat really has a rational and legitimate meaning. And I offer a handsome apology to Lenin and Trotsky for having said in my haste that it was meaningless. It does mean something and it does mean dictatorship. And it does mean dictatorship because it does not mean democracy. It means that some one odd sort of person, like an omnibus conductor, shall alone be allowed to have political power. But this is the very best that it can mean even as an ideal. And, as we shall see, it means something very much worse as a reality. So far, however, the point is that all these long words and long-winded formularies do become intelligible if we take them to mean simply this, the Russian town seizing a supremacy over the Russian country. But we only understand it if we remember something else. 
The Russian towns are, in an exceptional degree, exceptions. The Russian country is, in a very solid sense, the rule. When the exception rules the rule, that may really and reasonably be called a dictatorship. But when we have clearly understood that this is the real contrast and conflict, another consideration will appear equally plain. In the modern world, it is true that all towns are capitalist. But it is not true that all countrysides are capitalist. Curiously enough, the distinction is made clear in the very terms which the Bolshevists are so fond of using. They do not half so often call a capitalist a capitalist as they call him a bourgeois. And a bourgeois means, in philology and history, simply a man of the town. There were indeed times in history, times of benighted superstition and savage feudalism, when even the town was not necessarily capitalist. The socialist of the industrial age would never admit that a carpenter or a cooper could be a bourgeois, but he could undoubtedly be a burgher. Anyhow, what follows is the next step in the dictatorship of the proletariat, which brings it to something narrower even than the proletariat in a country that is not proletarian. The towns being capitalist, the organization of their movement is capitalist in spirit, even when it is communist in theory. The towns did not move as the guilds would have moved in the Middle Ages, or the communes would have moved in the countryside. The Bolshevist who moved first was emphatically a bourgeois and not a burgher. If his mind was unlike that of a medieval burgess, it was naturally even more unlike that of a medieval peasant, or a modern peasant. He was bookish, basing all his authority on one sacred book. He was scientific, talking a language not understanded of the people. He was very frequently Jewish, and not even remotely related to the people. It is sometimes supposed that we urge this latter fact as a point against Jews, but the whole point of it is the point against Bolshevists. Jews considered as detached intellectuals have a right to hold what economic theory they like. But nothing professing to be a movement of horny-handed sons of toil ought to be entirely directed by the one race whose hand has certainly forgotten that sort of cunning, whether or no it was by forgetting Jerusalem. The men who represent manual laborers ought not to be mainly of a people cut off from manual labor. It may or may not be the fault of such Semites that they are so cut off. But I am not urging it as a fault in the Semidio race, but in the socialist movement. We may really say, in a sense, that Jews have a right to be Bolshevists, but Bolshevists have no business to be Jews. The point is here, however, that the controlling force in such a movement not only is in fact a minority, but is not even a proletarian minority, even where only the minority is proletarian. It may be and is a bourgeois minority, like any other intelligentsia. And this is not a charge brought by non-socialists against socialists. It is a claim or even a boast made by the socialists themselves. All the Bolshevists in the British socialist movements are openly talking about, quote, a resolute minority which apparently has some natural or supernatural authority to dictate to the majority, end quote. All those who in any sense sympathize with Lenin and Trotsky, men like Mr. Bernard Shaw, for instance, are saying openly that the masses must be ruled by a minority and that this is the right minority to rule them. In other words, these people have utterly and finally abandoned or abolished the whole test of democracy and have not even attempted to explain what test they would use instead. For the term they use is not a test at all. The case for a resolute minority is the case for any reactionary aristocracy. There can be no conceivable reason why the worst and worst hated hangers-on of the czar should not affect another coup d'etat and rule by the same right as a resolute minority. It was said that the voice of the people was the voice of God. And at any rate, they are alike in this, that there can only be one of them. There is but one God, and there is but one people and in that sense there is but one majority. But there are any number of minorities, and all of them consider themselves resolute and intelligent minorities. My friends and I, for instance, are just as convinced that capital should be better distributed among free citizens as any Bolshevist can be, that it should be concentrated under Bolshevist officials. We could probably obtain testimonials, even from Mr. Bernard Shaw, that we are not entirely without intelligence. Suppose we were, on the strength of this, to seize the supreme power, break up Harad stores into a hundred little shops, cut up the Norfolk estates into a hundred little farms, imprison all socialists as traitors to the distributive state, 
suspend all socialist papers, and, finally, to prevent any possible Fabian reaction, proceed to hang Mr. and Mrs. Sidney Webb, since it would be rather ungrateful, after the testimonial, to hang Mr. Bernard Shaw. It may be that we could not do this, but obviously it is a hopeless and useless philosophy of ethics and politics that can only advise people to do whatever they can do. It may be that, in the present elaboration of legal restrictions, I cannot hang Mr. Sidney Webb. I cannot even hang him in red tape. But I might find it quite possible to shoot Mr. Sidney Webb. And why in the world should I not shoot him, in the name of my resolute minority? End of section 7. Section 8 of G.K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns. The New Witness, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns. The New Witness, 1922, by G. K. Chesterton. At the Sign of the World's End. The Militarist and the Marxian, by G. K. Chesterton. People seem to be very proud of discovering in practice what they have denied in theory. They call it progress. If somebody says that cats can be used as well as dogs for running down a fox, a man who knows better will need not a little patience, as he watches the packs of cats being carefully bred and kenneled in every county, or led, along with huntsmen and pink, through any marketplace or country lane. He will not necessarily dislike cats or even think them useless, but he will be moved to a slight annoyance when he is told that a combination of cats must be good at catching a fox because the individual cat is very good at catching a mouse. But his impatience may possibly boil over when he is suddenly told, a long time afterwards, that the ruthless realism of the reformers has now exposed the utter uselessness of the cat as a foxhound, and possibly even ventured on the daring proposal to inaugurate a new era by using the foxhound as a foxhound. Now that sort of thing is perpetually happening. If I might be so egotistical, it is perpetually happening to me. I once expressed it in an article bearing the unpleasant title of I Told You So. That was about the feminist question, but I will not adduce that example here, lest some of the ladies should snatch at my flying figure of speech and cry aloud that I have called all women cats. I do not think women are like cats, though I do think the comparison is true as concerns that particular point about not hunting in packs. I do think the female is generally most powerful in some domestic, intimate, and individual sort of murder, resembling the murder of a mouse. And I do think the males are generally most powerful in some sociable, companionable, comrade-like sort of murder, like the murder of a fox. And I did find, I fancy, that the feminists themselves lived to discover the difference and the difficulty they had ignored, as when the suffragette discovered that her solitary and secret ballot paper was of very little use against the iron and brazen brotherhood of the masculine trades unions. But I am not now thinking of this example, nor indeed do I think it by any means the clearest or most convincing example. The comparative disappointment of suffragettes with the suffrage is merely a faint chill in the atmosphere, or change in the mood, compared with the violent, abrupt, an absolute reversal of ethics and politics, which I have lived to see in many progressive movements, and notably in the Bolshevistic type of socialism. At least as long ago as the beginning of the war, I, for one, began to reason with the type of socialist who insisted on being a pacifist. He took up a position sufficiently summed up in a formula I have just read, cited with approval in my favorite organ, the Bolshevist Liberator of New York. Quote, that war is an inevitable consequence of the capitalist regime, that no war, defensive or offensive, is justifiable, that the effective and real struggle against war ought to attack its actual cause, the capitalist regime. End quote. And I pointed out that the first and third statements are not quite senseless by the second statement. A revolution is itself a war. A revolution against real tyranny is morally the most defensive of all wars, and therefore the most defensible of all wars. 
but externally and in form it is necessarily the most offensive of all wars, for it is the interruption of some sort of existing social order, because, in the legal sense, it is a breach of the peace. It must be legally offensive because it is a legal offense. Therefore, a revolution might be called morally a defensive war or legally an offensive war. But if all wars are unjustifiable, whether they are offensive or defensive, then obviously all revolutions are unjustifiable, whether they are offensive or defensive. I might have respected a man who says frankly that he did not object to fighting, but did object to fighting Germans. And there was many a socialist, and many a capitalist too for that matter, who really had that curious feeling. They sympathized with Prussia because it was a servile state, which they held in their hearts to be the next best thing to a socialist state. But what they said was, first that it would only be right to attack the capitalist state, and then that it could never be right to attack any of the existing capitalist states, and that because it could never be right to attack anybody. But the irony and inconsistency went further still. At the very moment when they were offering us an alternative fight as better than our own fight, they specialize in the vituperation, not of our own fight, but of the very nature of fighting. Their worst denunciations were directed against things that would be absolutely inevitable in anybody attacking anything, or indeed in anybody defending anything. They complained of the danger as such, of the sacrifice as such, of command, of a concerted plan, of prompt obedience, and prolonged endurance. They reviled every virtue that would be as vital to a revolutionary war as to any other war. I pointed all this out to them, as did thousands of other moderately sane Democrats, when they could find nothing but an occasional conchi to admire in all that hell full of heroes. I pointed out that no revolution could remove the possibility of self-defense in some form and that for the most reasonable of all possible reasons. The reason is that self-defense cannot depend on oneself. By definition, the occasion of self-defense can never be self-made. I urged that if they did found their communist state, they would probably have to defend it. If they founded a pacifist state, it could not be sure of remaining at peace. If they founded a state in which people wore wings like angels and lived at the top of trees like birds, and hygienically ate nothing but the fruit of the tree that they might become as gods, knowing good and evil, they would still have to make some arrangements to prevent their feathers being plucked or their nests being rifled, their groves cut down by an enemy, and their apples stolen by a thief. Even if they were angels, they would soon discover why the leader of all the angels is conceived as clad in armor with his foot upon a dragon. And even in their own paradise, they would find the meaning of the flaming sword. When one said all this self-evident sense to them, they did what such people always do. They repeated their formula, some such formula as I have quoted from them, quote, that no war, defensive or offensive, is justifiable, end quote. Strangely enough, when one had heard this sentence some 200 times, one became a little tired of the subject, or rather of the people who could not be induced to stick to the subject. Then other things happened and the tremendous tragedy developed in more and more dramatic ways in Europe generally, and Russia in particular. I open my Bolshevist magazine again after an interval, and I find a rather curious thing. I find Lenin and Trotsky being lauded to the skies for their realistic candor and their scientific boldness in facing the cold facts of life, and especially for the intellectual courage in investigating the psychology of war. It seems they have discovered that a new force called discipline is necessary in war, that military plans require the development of a secret and subconscious faculty called obedience, hitherto hidden from psychologists, and they are objects of peculiarly passionate praise because they have inflicted something called the death penalty on an enormous number of deserters and mutineers. Death is spoken of as an entirely new discovery, for they are the vanguard of the new world and anything they do is new, so long as it is new to them. I need not say that while militarism is a mark of originality in them, it is still a mark of conventionality in other people. It never occurs to them to reconsider their original criticisms of patriotic militarism. 
Foch or French are still entirely wrong for doing what Lenin and Trotsky have since found to be entirely right. The conscientious objector must still be praised by socialists, as at the beginning of the war, even though he is shot by Bolshevists before the end of the war. This very magazine, The Liberator, which I am taking as a text for these studies in Bolshevism, often prints, side by side, a satire on France being military and a defense of Russia being militarist. But I draw attention to this inconsistency at this stage for a further reason, which I can only develop fully in a further article, and the first outline of which I will only indicate here. These Marxians have already discovered that a knowledge of Marx is by no means identical with a knowledge of man. They started out with the arbitrary dogmas that democratic states need no armies, or that democratic armies need no discipline. It was admittedly a mistake, and they themselves now largely admit that it was false psychology. They have made huge concessions to the need or notion of military discipline. They have also, in practice, made concessions to the need or notion of private property. Might it not dawn on them that their communist theory is as wrong as their pacifist theory, and that they must think again about the nature of property as well as about the nature of arms? End of section 8. Section 9 of G.K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. G.K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922, by G.K. Chesterton. Section 9. At the Sign of the World's End, the Socialist as Schoolmaster. The modern situation is well symbolized by a man caught in a machine. Some feel a most sincere and earnest sympathy with the machine. They urge that an alien substance has been introduced into the mechanism in just such a fashion as to impede its practical work, and they are quite right. Others are so sentimental as to be interested in the man, and it is here that the parallel has another point less generally noted. Even of the humanitarian reformers there are two schools. There are those who wish, when releasing the man, to release a whole complete man, the old original familiar man, with all his arms and legs, or in other words, with all his normal traits and human relations, of family, of piety, of ownership. There are others who wish to take advantage of an accident to effect an amputation. Some social advisor, a socialist or what not, says to the man being torn to pieces among the wheels, Come now, would not this be a good opportunity to get rid of that left leg of yours? Consider that it would have the cost of boots. Surely you have read H.G. Wells's great Fabian pamphlet, The Misery of Boots, where he says with a sort of tenderness, Let me implore you, dear comrade, to leave your right hand behind you when you emerge from this entanglement. What is a hand but a human claw grasping with hideous avarice and selfishness the coins and goods of others? In other words, these thinkers will only rescue a man from the wheels of capitalism on condition of his losing the limbs of property. The Bolshevists are still trying to preach this simplification to the peasants. They are educating them, and I should like to pause at this stage to ask how the education progresses. The difficulty of permeating a peasantry with culture and science is something which we heard all about from the Russian intellectuals in the old days. Even then I thought it was only fair to remember what the culture was like. An extraordinary habit has arisen in modern times of describing the history of a creed, the acceptance and refusal of the creed, the imposition of the creed, the persecution of the creed, and so on through all its adventures without it ever occurring to anybody to say what the creed is. Now the creed behind the culture of these intellectuals was rather interesting, and the curious thing is that even those who would probably hesitate to accept it for themselves seem to have accepted with ardor the educational activity of spreading it to other people. They wrote of the ignorance of the peasants, of the appalling number of peasants who could not read, of the tireless efforts of the heroic Nobsky or the martyred Nobunov to spread instruction among them, of the cruelty of reactionary governments that came between the people and the light. Now I am all in favor of the people seeing the light, but I do not see why I should not see the light too. I do not see why I should not be allowed to look at the light for myself and see what I think of it. I encountered an illuminating flash of it the other day from a Russian lady who said that the greatest Russian dramatist had summed up his message by saying, Life is a gray corridor of which the only door is death. This burst of sunshine did to some extent enlighten me, 
and it may be argued that the peasantry would benefit by the Enlightenment, but I do think that all the phrases about that Enlightenment should be taken with some references to the quality of the light. We should consider seriously the peasants' ignorance of the fact that life is a gray corridor, the appalling number of peasants who were unable to read in print that life was a gray corridor, the tragic disappointment of Nobsky and Nobinoff in being unable to persuade them that life was a gray corridor, and the cruelty of reactionary government which prevented them from hearing the happy news. I do not mean, of course, that all the culture had any such hopelessness, or that all the reaction had any such excuse. But I do say that much of the culture of the 19th century simply despised a peasant for not knowing enough to be a pessimist. It despised the peasants for making dolls of red and green and yellow, instead of devils of blue and black and gray, for clinging to some traditions of poetry when science had insisted upon prose, and still keeping in their country villages the dance of love while the cities knew nothing but the dance of death. In short, what was called culture was also what could truly be called nihilism, and the peasant retained an obstinate prejudice that to learn nihilism is to learn nothing. Tolstoy, whose greatness showed itself at least in his appreciation of the peasants, said in answer to the cheery remark about the corridor, Andreev is trying to frighten us, but I am not afraid. The peasants were not even sufficiently frightened to say they were not afraid, and therefore profoundly skeptical about the advantages of skeptical culture. It always hardens into half-baked dogmas, that hang together just long enough to mislead one generation and make sure of one mistake. People have already discovered that the pessimism of the last century was a mistake. There are already a good many people, skeptics included, who realize that babies, battles, the daybreak, a thunderstorm, or even a good dinner are curious things to meet walking down a gray corridor with no outlet but death. And even Bolshevism will not make that particular mistake again. This is all to the good. For I confess I prefer the red devils of communism to the blue devils of nihilism. But the point which concerns me at this stage is much simpler. It was the claim of the old intelligentsia that it tried to instruct the peasants, but failed in instructing them. But only suppose, for one wild moment, that it had succeeded in instructing them. In reason it should have produced a popular religion of raving despair, with corpses hanging thick in every forest or men drowning themselves by thousands in the sea. They would not be fighting the Russian famine as a foe, but rather hailing it as a deliverer. For it would seem that there is only one lively action possible to man, and that is the pleasure of rushing down the corridor and bashing down the door. If we can imagine one of these advanced philosophies really popularized, its popularity would simply mean depopulation. It would litter the field and streets with the dead faster than any famine. And when the people were all dead, the intellectual would look up with mild surprise for he would have forgotten all about pessimism and the corridor by that time, having just heard of a new notion which must be taught to the ignorant peasantry. It is called Marx, or the materialist theory of history. When therefore the Bolshevist begins to educate the peasant, he must remember that the peasant has already been half-educated once, and the half of him that was uneducated turned out to be the better half. For a moment the world had a horrible fear that the poor man had been educated all wrong, when it discovered with a gasp of relief that he had not been educated at all. The precedent is not favorable, and the situation is highly similar. Communism, like nihilism, is the last thing in simplification and therefore in limitation. As one says that life is a corridor with no door but death, the other says that life is a cubicle with no window but economics. Another alarming effort will be made to educate the people in the culture of cubicles or corridors, and again we shall have cause to be thankful for the fortunate escape of its failure, for it certainly will fail. It is confronted with a colossal difficulty that is not yet understood, either by those who call themselves cultured or by those who call themselves scientific. A peasant, it is said, cannot read, but he can see. He can smell, taste, touch, and hear. And about the realities he has touched with his five wits, he has a faith of unalterable fixity. He cannot be made to accept a generalization that is merely a metaphor. He knows that a green field is not a gray corridor. He cannot be persuaded to see corridors and cubicles when he looks at rocks and trees. You cannot impose on him a nightmare in broad daylight by the necromancy of long scientific words or talismanic aesthetic images. Property to a townsman is often an abstraction, a row of knots in a ledger, but there is nothing abstract about a row of eggs in a larder, and you cannot persuade a peasant that it is safer to put all our eggs in one basket, or that fewer eggs will be broken if they are all thrown pell-mell into an official basket made of wire netting, wide as the Russian Empire. End of section 9
Section 10 of G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns. The New Witness, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns. The New Witness, 1922. By G. K. Chesterton. Section 10. At the Sign of the World's End. The Shield of Private Property. By G. K. Chesterton. The socialist critic commonly proceeds directly to denounce capitalism without defining property. This is very much as if a man set out to denounce Mormonism without having heard of marriage. For that matter, there seems to be a good deal printed in the papers about Mormonism just now. Why only just now, I do not profess to know. I should have thought that the appropriate time for discussing Mormonism would have been when we were discussing undenominational religion and how it would be possible to teach an essential Christianity which would reconcile all sects of Christians. It was then ingeniously argued that if the Bible were only read without comment, it would naturally be open to exhaustive criticism. And if any Christian can listen to the Bible and draw his own moral, there seems no reason why he should not listen to the Old Testament and draw the Mormon moral. I hope I need not remark that I have no sympathy with the sulky barbarism of this sect, whether it practices polygamy or not. To think of one woman being married to a Mormon is a quite sufficient tragedy. But I think that those who are making a scare about the matter have fallen very much into the fallacy already mentioned. They are really, in a sense, denouncing Mormonism without recognizing marriage. They do not seem to see that polygamy is only wrong because monogamy is right. And judging by the delight with which they throw themselves into the most polygamous extravagances of divorce, I am by no means certain that they really think monogamy is right. A Muslim may be a good man in every sense except being a monogamist. He may have four wives and work for them and keep them and be kind to them. He is relatively a very respectable person. On the other hand, a man calling himself a gentleman will seduce his friend's wife in his friend's house while he is enjoying his friend's hospitality, and will only figure in a fashionable divorce case and then continue in the present social chaos to adorn fashionable society. He seems to me far more disreputable than a Muslim or even a Mormon, but he has not made an object of attack, or indeed an object of anything but advertisement by people who are horrified at a Muslim or a Mormon. But I only mention such things here as part of a particular parallel in the case of property. Just as these people denounce polygamy without really considering whether monogamy is right and rational, so the collectivists denounce capitalism without considering whether property is right and rational. For there is obviously some connection between the two ideas, whether or not it be the connection we allege of abuse and antagonism. Even if they do not admit that capitalism is wrong because property is right, they will at least agree that capitalism exists because property exists. Socialists generally assert that all property must inevitably end in capitalism. This is a somewhat sweeping assertion, and rather similar to saying that when a man begins to get married, he cannot leave off. Moreover, it is manifestly inconsistent with all the realities of the world as we know it. Capitalism, in the sense of the concentration of capital, covers a considerable part of the modern world, but it does not cover anything like the whole, even of the modern world, any more than polygamy does. Industrialism is hardly larger than Islam, and it might well be maintained that industrialism is a sort of fad or provincial fashion on the northwest fringe of Europe, as is Islam on the southeast fringe of Europe, and that the European center remains unchanged, and its pivot is the peasant. Industrialism has been a marvelous manifestation of the genius and energy of man, but so was Islam. Industrialism appeared to be more progressive and enlightened than its rural rivals, but so did Muslim monotheism seem for a time more rational and human than the creed of Christendom. Industrialism is still a very fixed and formidable thing, and so is Islam, as our fools of politicians will soon discover. But because the habit of having four wives is permitted over the whole field of Islam, it does not follow that it is the central field of the world, or that it is still largely occupied by private property that has not evolved into capitalism, just as it is occupied by a household that has not evolved into a harem. But even those who differ from us about where property ends might take an intelligent interest in where capitalism begins. And if they are really dealing with where it begins, they might reasonably begin at the beginning. But the socialists seldom tell us anything about private property, even as a thing that is ultimately abused, or is bound to be ultimately abused. They leave out the whole notion of property, not merely as a truth, but even as a temptation. They choose to assume that private property was never anything but a sort of crude capitalistic luxury. And they are very much startled when they collide with the peasant, as in Russia, and find that the strongest sense of property is not found in the world of luxury, but in the world of poverty. The result was that the Bolshevists had to surrender to the peasants all along the line, because, although they hated the peasants and their principle, they also despised the peasants and did not try to understand their principle. Yet the principle is very simple, 
It is that private property is not one of our luxuries, but one of our liberties. Property has two primary social functions. It is protective and it is creative. When an earlier and more spirited generation of Zionists were engaged in rebuilding Zion after the Babylonian captivity, the vivid narrative notes that they had to work with the trowel in one hand and the sword in the other. Property is to the citizen what those implements were to the city. Property is both the sword and the trowel. It enables the citizen to do something, and it defends him while he's doing it. The idea of property as protection is partially guessed at in our groping sociology. It is stated as one of those half-truths that make one feel as if the world were half-witted. It is generally stated just now under the title of security. Now there is a sense in which we might be very well content with the ideal of giving a man security. But security of what? It is typical of such short-winded speculations that scarcely anybody goes on to ask what a man should be secure of having, any more than what he should be efficient in doing, or what he should be organized to do. If it merely means that his life shall be secure, it is probably that the place where his life would be most strictly and solidly secure would be in Dartmoor Prison. A man condemned to live in a bare cell for ten years cannot be run over by a cab or drowned in a river. He cannot die in battle or drink himself to death. Unless he is condemned to be hanged in prison, he is quite unlikely to perish prematurely while he is there. This quite simple fact disposes of the whole of the old argument, used by Macaulay in the Manchester School, of the proof of prosperity from longevity. But it would be even stronger against the socialist than against the individualist. But suppose we do not merely mean security of life, but also security of liberty or, in other words, security of life worth living. We shall then find that to leave to the citizen some private powers is the only possible way of protecting him against abuse of public powers. Anything is something of the nature of property, if it renders secure not only his own life, but his own mode of life. Of the creative function of property, I hope to offer some final summary in an article next week. Here I will conclude on the political point of property as the sword of the citizen. It is his private defense against the possible tyranny of the city or of the rulers of the city, he will not give it up except to a perfect prince. A logical socialist government cannot allow of an opposition. It may have an official opposition, a thing like His Majesty's opposition, a team of tame critics pledged not to criticize too much. But that is only to say that socialism will be as hypocritical as capitalism. Real criticism could not be permitted for a reason that is not only in the nature of socialism, but is part of the case for socialism. The case for socialism is a very strong and sincere case so far as it goes, and those who pretend that it is merely lawless and sentimental deserve to suffer from its triumph. A socialist state cannot allow opposition, because a socialist state cannot allow anything. It is the whole point of it, that it produces everything, possesses everything, and is directly responsible for everything. It is its whole claim that nothing is merely tolerated as the abuses of property are tolerated. It has all the means of production, distribution, and exchange. And if there is any shooting, material or moral, it produces the shots, and distributes the shots, and arranges for the exchange of shots. We cannot imagine people going to a king in the old days and saying, please, will you give us a thousand bows and two thousand lances, because we want to raise a rebellion against you. Rebellions were made by people who possessed weapons as private property. Neither can we imagine people going to a government that owned all the paper and printing presses and saying, do lend us your machinery and we will print the clearest possible proofs of your corruption and criminality. We could not go to a politician and borrow a platform from which to convict him of taking bribes. We could not ask him to pay for the circulation of a pamphlet exposing him as an obvious traitor. And we may be certain that if there is no private property, many other things will remain only too private. End of section 10. Section 11 of G.K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. G.K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922, by G.K. Chesterton. Section 11. At the Sign of the World's End, Two Letters on Socialism, by G.K. Chesterton. It is always well worth while to argue with socialists, especially when they are not politicians. I intend the comment as a compliment, and the further compliment is also due to them that socialists very seldom are politicians, though there are sometimes politicians who say they are socialists. But a man who is a socialist in private life, without much reference to what is called practical politics, is not only nearly always a sincere and high-minded man, but is generally a man who has reached his conclusion by a genuine and consistent course of disinterested thinking, 
and as he has reasoned himself into that position, he can be invited to reason himself out of it. In these few papers I have attempted to reason him out of it, but I will have nothing to do with any attempt to bully him out of it, to blare at him about Bolshevism and Red Revolution, or to pretend that all the nonsense is on his side. I know that when I was a socialist, I was not to be bullied in that fashion, and I give my opponents credit for having as much self-respect as myself, and very probably more. In this spirit, I should like to comment on two letters that have appeared in provincial papers with reference to the views I expressed here about the relations of socialism and pacificism, for they contain things which I think are at the back of the mind of many thoughtful theoretic socialists, particularly those scattered about among the ordinary hard-working population. One is a letter from a Bradford socialist and appeared in the Yorkshire Observer. The writer dissociated himself from complete pacificism in theory and also from Bolshevism in practice. He agrees with me in saying that revolutions are themselves wars, and therefore, if there are no democratic wars, there are no democratic revolutions. But he seems to maintain that no national wars are democratic wars, and that all national wars have had a capitalistic motive. Then he says, After all, Bolshevist is merely the Russian for majority, and Lenin and Trotsky are the leaders of the majority of Russians, while Foch and French, worthy generals though they be, were during the war but the minions of imperialism which constitutes the powerful minority. This seems to me a singular thing to say in a letter otherwise very sane, and a thing which seems on the face of it quite the reverse of the fact. It is much more certain that the majority of Frenchmen would be in favor of resisting Prussia than it has ever been that the majority of Russians are in favor of Trotsky and his dictatorship. One could only test the matter by a sort of hypothetical experiment. Suppose a man had gone through all the villages of the Vosges just before the war and said, we are going to fight the Germans. And suppose a man had gone through all the villages in the Caucasus just before the revolution and said, We are going to fight to establish the dictatorship of the proletariat and the assumption by the state of all the means of production, distribution, and exchange. To the French peasants, no doubt, the news would have been tragic, but to many of them inspiring and to nearly all of them unanswerable and unavoidable on the assumption of German aggression. To the Russian peasants, the news would have been unanswerable because it was unintelligible. So far from agreeing with it, they would hardly comprehend it enough to disagree. If you had told any group of poor people anywhere in France that Foch was a minion of imperialism because he wanted to drive the enemy out of the country, you would very probably have been torn in pieces. It is by no means so certain that every group in the vast and varied and bewildering continent called Russia would even now show such a sentiment on behalf of the Jews of Moscow. The support given to the Bolshevists is markedly less swift, spontaneous, and instinctive than his national support in a nation. It was only obtained by compromise and even surrender. Lenin's government secured the peasants only by promising to preserve the very private properties which had only existed to destroy. In short, peasants now support Bolshevists because Bolshevists no longer support Bolshevism. But it is perhaps needless on this point to answer the writer, since he had already answered himself. Only a few lines before he says it strikes him as a very curious thing that most workers of all lands, will fight for king and country, but will not fight for themselves. It may be a curious thing, but it seems a still more curious thing that anybody should first lament that national wars are popular, and then go on immediately to say that they are not popular. Now when an intelligent man finds himself forced into such a contradiction, he ought to cast back and consider whether there is not something unsound or inconsistent in his assumptions. The assumption here is that the only evils which a populace can resent are economic evils and it is neither self-evident nor sensible. Indeed, the point can be made plain by reference to another passage in the same letter. The writer agrees that all revolutions are wars, but seems to distinguish between revolutionary wars and national wars. Surely it may be further pointed out that there are such things as national revolutions. If the Italians rose against the Austrians, or the Irish against the English, or the Poles against the Russians, it certainly was not only because they had calculated their economic chances under the change. It was not because being a workman under one employer means so much wages, and under another employer more wages. It was because being a slave in the house of a stranger means having your life starved in every sense, and not only in the economic sense. It means that the manners and the laws and the language and the worship, and the very art and public ornament of the stranger, offend you when they are forced upon you. If the Mormons were established as conquerors and rulers of the English or the Irish, these peoples would not be discontented on merely economic grounds. Indeed, I have heard that the economic conditions of the Mormon states happen to be comparatively prosperous. But the people would not object to economic conditions. 
they would object to Mormons. That is the point about the popularity of patriotism, which puzzles my critic to the point of contradiction. A man is an Englishman about a thousand things. He is only a socialist about socialism. Nationality is not narrower than economics. It is wider than economics. I do not in the least mean that patriotism is the whole duty of man, any more than economic justice is the whole duty of man, though both are duties, and the latter one, which capitalism neglects and insults. But I do mean that a man's nation is a thing that means so many things to him that he has no time to count them when he is called upon to fight for them. If a man hears the news, the barbarians are burning your home, he does not disintegrate the word home into all its elements. He does not say, they are burning the green banisters and the watercolor sketch in the bedroom, also doubtless the cheap edition of Treasure Island, not to mention the geranium in the flower pot. He knows that a whole mode of life is in peril. That is what happens when aliens threaten a nation, and that is why most men will die for a flag. Now I not only admit, but have always warmly affirmed, that economic justice demands that the books and the potted geraniums should be much more equally distributed. But I am so revolutionary as to maintain that the poor man should own not only a flower pot, but a garden, not only the watercolor landscape, but the land. In short, I agree with the Russian peasants and therefore disagree with the Bolshevists. And this brings me to another letter on this point, which appeared in the Portsmouth Evening News, urging that it was the fault of the capitalist nations that the Bolshevists had to go to war. If this were true, it would not affect my point. The fight of the communists may have been forced on them by circumstances but it does not alter their mistake in having said they would not fight under any circumstances. But the correspondent offers an explanation which appears a little curious, saying that socialists are divided into Christians and non-Christians, and that only the non-Christians approve of any sort of fighting. It seems odd to make a generalization about Christians which excludes all the great churches that claim to be Catholic and most of the sects that profess to be Protestant. But as a matter of fact, the absolute pacifist dogma I quoted that no war, defensive or offensive, is justifiable, was quoted from a manifesto of the extreme group of French socialists, who are the last people in the world even to pretend to be Christians. If my critic told them that their disapproval of physical violence was due to their Christianity, I think their disapproval of physical violence would be put to a severe test. In point of fact, my experience, and I think most people's experience, is the other way. It is almost always a man who is not a Christian who reproaches the crusader with not being a Christian. I have quoted a passage from the French socialists, and it would be easy to quote 20 passages from the Russian socialists, most of whom were Jews. It is the same Russian Jews who were once pacifists in the most rigid fashion, who are now militarists in the most ruthless fashion. That is the inconsistency which was the matter of my accusation, and I do not think it has been shaken. End of section 11. Section 12 of G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922, by G. K. Chesterton. Section 12. Hotels and the Sense of Honor, by G. K. Chesterton. I have never gone out of my way to join the critics of Mrs. Asquith, because I think the errors arising from incautious speech are far less dangerous just now than the much larger errors arising from systematic suppression. But I can understand the case against her, which may be summarized by saying that even the virtue of saying what you think will be the better for the other virtue of thinking what you say. But while I can understand the sentiments of those who denounce her as well as those who defend her, there seems to me something very odd about the things they select to denounce. This is notably so in the case of Lord Lee's public protest against her criticism of drink as a sort of secret luxury at American dances. Lord Lee said nothing about her previous and far less defensible eulogy of prohibition as a preventative against drinking among English servants. Now I should have thought, if there was one remark about which even those disposed to defend her 
must feel a little disappointed in her it was the latter and not the former i confess i gave her credit for a degree of cynical magnanimity that would not condescend to talk about controlling the lower classes as if they alone required control but i imagine it was said at random and i am sure she would be the first to admit that in ordinary decent houses the servants are as sober as their employers and that in smart luxurious houses the employers drink at least as much as the servants only it occurs to me that an english gentleman of the better sort like lord lee representing england in a foreign land may possibly have said a word in defence of his own countrymen and not only of the foreigners i think he might have been the champion of the english poor as well as of the american rich as a matter of fact touching a certain sort of drinking and dancing in smart american hotels the english lady only said what numbers of sensible american ladies are constantly saying but in revolving the problem i came back to a very simple distinction between different kinds of houses and especially between houses and hotels nobody supposes that fine ordinary parlour-maid opens the front door of a balham villa reeling like a bacchanate and nobody supposes that the millions of natural and normal american girls would think of getting drunk at a dance where it occurs in either case it is in the anarchical atmosphere of particular places and as i would suggest especially semi-public and impersonal places this sort of luxury and laxity occurs where there is not a definite tradition of domestic responsibility and honor whether the place be a fashionable house or a fashionable hotel but it is not the only kind of evil that comes of such large and loose institutions from this also comes the abuses of capitalism and the loss of the better sense of property ending in that socialist reaction i have been criticizing here last week i paused to reply to two individual criticisms and i will now resume the rounding off of the matter by considering the creative side of ownership in the matter of property we may find an obvious but useful parable in this difference between living in a house and living in a hotel there are some practical conveniences in the hotel but there is first of all a sort of megalomaniac glamour of great spaces and gilded ceilings that is not practical at all a man cannot breakfast at a hundred breakfast tables or sleep in a hundred beds and if he is of so sublime and imaginative an altruism as to delight in the mere thought of all those people having beds and breakfasts why then there is no particular reason why he should not affect the same social and spiritual self-multiplication touching all his neighbors in the street or all his fellow townsmen in the town but as a matter of fact this imaginative interest in others is much rarer in a hotel than in a street or a town and infinitely rarer than it is in a village where there are real private houses there is real interest in private lives sometimes the right and sometimes the wrong sort of interest sometimes the interest of the fisher of men and sometimes of the snarer of souls perhaps the best definition of a modern hotel and its difference from an ancient inn is that in a modern hotel this personal and domestic element is not extended but extinguished an inn is a public house that is also a private house and hotel is a public house that is not a private house at all and its importance in the present case lies first of all in this simple fact that even in the most complex and populous plutocratic hotel a man can only live one life or perhaps if he be sensitive to social atmospheres die one death the late lord salisbury disposed of the nonsense about the number of public houses making people drunken by saying that there were a number of bedrooms in hatfield but they never made him sleepy the satire is very sensible and he may not have noticed that it was a satire on the oligarchic tory traditions of hatfield as well on the idealistic liberal traditions of upper tooting it is out of proportion that a hundred little inns and innkeepers 
should be destroyed without destroying the hotel cecil that it is quite as much out of proportion even when the tradition is three centuries old that a single solitary guest should live in the hotel cecil and it is both verbally and vitally true that hatfield is the hotel cecil but though an aristocrat might not notice that the case against plutocratic hotels is also the case against aristocratic houses still less would his extreme enemies notice that the case against aristocratic houses is also the case against communist communities in this there is little more than the difference of one letter between the thing called a hotel and a thing called a hostel the two words of course have the same root as each other and the same root as the word hospital they have further the touching similarity that they are both used wrong perverted from the historical meaning and that particular form the word hotel was aristocratic the hotel de rohan let us say meant the mansion of the noble family of rohan and the hotel cecil would really mean hatfield the word hostel was medieval and therefore spiritually democratic it always connoted free services whether of monks to the poor and sick or of guildsmen to each other it was the age of volunteers and there is the same foundation of charity in the word and the idea whether we agree so heartily that we adjourn to celebrate it in a hotel or disagree so heartily that we end by being removed to a hospital but all this though really relevant as a preface is too much like a parenthesis the fact which needs to be noted is that the first difference between living in a hotel and living in a house is not a practical difference at all but a vague atmospheric difference produced by multiplicity and size the individual's pleasures are still very isolated perhaps more isolated because of the crowd he has one out of a hundred bedrooms as a prisoner has one out of a hundred cells and whatever are the merits of that social order it is not sociable at best there is the romance of personal adventure and accident but there is no corporate and communal life it is enough to say here about the great modern hotels what i have said already about the great modern tea-shops let anyone try to create in them a sort of camaraderie and unanimity there can be in a village inn or a wayside public house let anyone try and approach the english ladies and gentlemen who freeze each other with their eyes at the charing cross hotel or the lord warden and induce them to shout and cheer like a small and select mob he will soon be convinced of the first fact in this inquiry into the example of the hotel as a type of more communal life whatever these society people want it is not society it would be nearer the truth to say that it is size the vague sense that things are organized on a magnificent scale and cover a multitude of people and this the real motive of what we call society is also the real motive of what we call socialism but it is when we pass to the practical differences between a house and a hotel that we come to the creative nature of property i have taken this figure of speech for convenience and clarity because i do not think everybody understands what we mean by this creative quality now a man in a hotel is entirely receptive he may receive as many things as an average man in an average house he may receive more things than most modern men in most modern houses but these things must all be of a certain recognized and conventional character he cannot add anything to the hotel if he were to attempt to improve the hotel in any sweeping and striking fashion his adventures would be somewhat sensational indeed they would be so picturesque that they must like other thrilling serials be continued in our next End of section twelve recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section thirteen of G. K. Chesterton's newspaper columns, The New Witness, nineteen twenty two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns The New Witness, 1922, by G. K. Chesterton 
Section 13. The Eugenist versus the Man of Science. I should like to add a postscript upon some points that have arisen since my recent debate with the Dean of St. Paul's, commonly called the Gloomy Dean. I have already remarked on the misfortune of this brilliant cleric being chiefly mocked for the very thing for which he ought to be chiefly respected, the fact that he does face the uglier facts of the modern problem. I may add in all sincerity that I not only congratulate him on being exasperated with things, but I even congratulate him on being exasperated with me. I hope I am not flattering myself with excessive egotism, but I venture to believe that I am among the things the Dean dislikes most heartily, and I really have a hearty liking for all those hearty dislikes. I speak with all seriousness when I say that hatred seems to be by far the most Christian thing about him. Otherwise, it's a little difficult, and requires an effort of the imagination, to see him as a Christian, though it would be easy enough to see and respect him as a Confucian, or any kind of stoical and rather hopeless pagan. The curious thing about Dean Inge is that he doesn't seem to say of Christianity, as do many skeptics, that its dogmas are bad but its spirit is good, but rather that its dogmas are doubtful but its spirit is bad. That ethical or essential Christianity, as in the poetic parts of the New Testament, which has had a softening effect on so many infidels, seems only to have a hardening effect on this particular Christian. It would be fun to write a gospel of the gloomy Dean. Left to himself, I can't imagine him having the smallest sympathy with the prodigal son, while I can imagine the very words in which he would exalt the solid superiority of the elder brother. I can imagine every one of the sociological arguments by which he'd show that the good Samaritan was a bad Samaritan. The idea of chivalry, of a mystical respect for the humble, seems to move him by rule of contraries. The idea of the richer or more respectable classes being called upon to bear any of the burdens of the unfortunate or the weak never fails to make him fly into a passion. It would be interesting to guess what he supposes that the saints ever meant by the divine virtue of love. But at least he has the divine virtue of hatred, and that's enough to give him something of communion with the saints. At least he is so far a Christian that he is driven by a sublime passion to destroy, to destroy what he regards as hypocrisy and stupidity, and the strong madness of falsehood, and for that alone I, for one, shall always hold him in honour. But my purpose here is merely to clear up one or two matters on which I have had more light since the last time I answered his questions. To begin with, there is the passage in my book on eugenics, which many reviewers have quoted and exaggerated rather out of its proportionate place in the argument. I mean the phrase about the consumptive tendencies of Keats and Stevenson. The dean did not quote it, but did criticize it, in such a way that I am tempted to suspect that he hadn't seen it in a book, but in a review of the book. In the book it's quite trivial, and almost a parenthesis in the main argument. The dean charged me with saying that eugenists would suppress Keats and Stevenson, whereas they might be content to sterilize them. To begin with, I never said anything about eugenists legally suppressing Keats. The phrase does not occur in my warnings about eugenic legislation at all. It's a preliminary phrase, demonstrating a doubt and mystery hanging over the whole relation between heredity and health, and between health and happiness. I suggested that even in the clearest and most extreme cases, such as tuberculosis, where caution is most defensible, we do not actually know for certain whether a child will be happy or make others happy. I said, what is the use of telling people that if they marry for love they may be punished by being the parents of Keats or the parents of Stevenson? The dean entirely missed or muddled the point even of this problem, which is not the problem of whether Keats shall be married, but of whether Keats shall be born. He seemed to imply that he ought to be born in spite of eugenics, but not married in spite of eugenics. But anyhow, what I said, or rather what he said I said, moved him to the utmost fury, and he called me the drunken helot of radical sentimentalism. It's not everybody who's been called all that. But if I really had been as shocking as he implies, I should not be entirely unsupported. I imagine that the learned professor of genetics, appointed to give the Galton lecture at the Royal Society, is not a drunken helot. I gravely doubt whether he is even a radical sentimentalist. And I have just discovered that he said almost exactly what I said, except that it was a little more like what the dean abuses me for saying. These are his words. But I would especially emphasize a doubt whether, from the point of view of society, which is that in which we are here concerned, families which have suffered from definite stigmata may not at last contribute their proper share to the success and delight of mankind. 
we should hesitate to assert that either special susceptibility to tuberculosis or any form of mental instability is associated with genius either directly or collaterally but the frequency of such association has not often been noticed and i cannot deny that it is sufficient to suggest the reality of some positive connection at least i imagine that by the exercise of continuous eugenic caution the world might have lost beethoven and keats perhaps even francis bacon and that a system might find advocates under which the poet Haley would be passed, and his friends Blake and Cowper rejected. It will be observed that the Galton lecturer to the Royal Society goes much further than I ever did. He is a far more drunken helot and a much more sentimental radical. I never especially emphasized the doubt about the value of consumptives. Any one who will read my book will see that it was incidental and no part of my main argument. I never dreamed of suggesting that a child could possibly be more likely to be a genius through being consumptive. Mr. Bateson distinctly suggests that there may be some such likelihood. I was not talking of a definite eugenic system at all. He does definitely say that there may be such a system, and that it may do the very thing that the dean declares it would never do. He actually uses one of the names I mentioned, and then he adds no less than four other names to strengthen the same argument and as the lecture contains several polite references to Dean Inge himself, I hope that the Dean will respond with equally polite language to the lecturer, in which case this opinion must be judged differently when it comes from him than when it comes from me. The Dean concluded his article by saying that his only comfort in the chaos and ruin of my nonsensical notions, such as the old notion of Christian men bearing one another's burden, was the resolute and rational attitude of the men of science themselves. Well, this is the resolute and rational attitude of one of the men of science themselves. It is the man chosen by the highest scientific authority to speak to the students of eugenics in the name of Galton himself. I should be much interested to know what the dean has to say about him. But there is another respect in which, in the light of this lecture, I should like to add another word. It is quite true that I am a radical in my own understanding of the term. In my sense, a radical sentimental or otherwise, means a man who declines to be a helot, drunken or otherwise. It is surely unlucky for the dean that he took his illusion from the usages of Sparta, the most brutal and barren of historic oligarchies, which did indeed produce something like eugenics, and therefore something very like hell. I am a radical if it means preferring the city of Pericles to the city of Pausanias. And though I do not think I am now a helot, I will handsomely concede that I may be a helot, when the dean's pure republic is established, but he is quite mistaken if he supposes that his favorite tyrannies will only be possible in an aristocracy like that of Lacedaemon. Some of the utopians he most denounces are quite likely to give him the utopia he most desires. And here again I have to thank Professor Bateson, FRS, for information and support, for he states most strongly that sections of what was once the American democracy have already begun to play the fool with eugenics, so that a fantastic perversion of science by the state has already begun. If this has captured the casual democracy of America, it will be even more sympathetic to the fussy and official socialism of England. The reason that I should call myself a radical, rather than a socialist, has nothing to do with the stale materialism which seems to move Dean Inge in his denunciation of socialism. It has nothing to do with all the heathen jargon about nature's failures, of which the Dean still seems to be the dupe and for which Huxley expressed a final contempt forty years ago, when silly people were thus trying to use Darwinism for the purpose of diabolism. My objection to that concentrated collectivist state, for which many sincere intellectuals are working, is that it would do hurt to certain dignities of human nature which must not be destroyed, that it would certainly rob the peasant, that it would probably persecute the priest, that it would make democracy a dream and make government a nightmare, but worst of all, because it might quite well be in the mood to establish the cattle-breeding paradise of the Dean of St. Paul's. End of section 13。section 14 of G. K. Chesterton's newspaper columns, The New Witness, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns. The New Witness, 1922. By G. K. Chesterton. On Adding Insult to Injury. I have recently seen something of a municipal or parochial election. 
and observed some curious things in the cross-purposes called politics. I mean the general problem of where the reformers are wrong even when they are right, and where the populace are right even when they are wrong. A man I know was a candidate in a country town. His philosophy is too Fabian for my taste, but he is a man of very honorable sincerity and public spirit, and many things he would have reformed badly wanted reforming. And the odd thing is this, that his unexpected defeat was attributed to his unpopular action in calling the poorer cottage property a slum. This was so much resented that there were rumors of violence and ducking in ponds and so on. I do not believe anybody dreamed of so dirty and disgraceful an action, but the very idea seemed to suggest to me a certain truth. If a reformer were ducked in a pond, he might not wish his friends to dwell on his dingy and dismal appearance when fished out of the pond. Well, the poor have been plunged forcibly into filth by the plutocratic progress. But we may well be careful in what words we call them filthy. In other words, we must be careful that all modern reform is not the literal fulfillment of a proverb, adding insult to injury. After all, in this, as in so many things, we have only to shift the social levels to see the truth. Suppose a grave, grey-haired, well-groomed gentleman of the governing class, coming out of Parliament or a Pall Mall club, has his hat smashed over his nose, is kicked into the gutter and rolled in the mud, and so on. We may rightly feel that the old gentleman has been abominably treated. But we shall be lacking in psychological tact and sympathy if we keep on saying in a loud voice, "'Consider the outrage upon his dignity!' Think how absurd he must have looked sitting down suddenly in a puddle. Picture to yourself the pathetic expression of disconcerted surprise upon his venerable features. Calculate, for one moment in your mind, the exact angle at which the hat, a dissipated concertina, must have been tilted over one eye. Consider the laughter to which our friend was exposed among the vast crowds, including so many ladies and gentlemen whose opinion he especially valued. Realize how hearty, how happy, how prolonged that laughter must have been, how long the legend of this incident will linger, and then ask yourselves whether an atrocity more abominable, and so on. Anybody who defended the old gentleman so eloquently as that might be surprised to find he was rather more huffy about being defended than about being attacked. Or suppose the case of a young wife who has been given a black eye for it is a first principle of social reform that every husband having less than a certain income gives his wife a black eye. You may be chivalrous in your concern for the young lady, but if you dilate with too much enthusiasm upon the hideousness and repulsiveness of the eye, you may find that your chivalry is not appreciated. She may not altogether desire to have it triumphantly proved that she is now the most loathsome and revolting spectacle in Clapham. Doubtless she resents being made ugly, but she also resents being made out uglier than she is. Now that is what remains of the idea of personal dignity, which is the soul of property. And that is what poor people feel when they resent having their cottages called slums. The old gentleman whose hat is smashed feels that after all it is his hat. He dislikes it being destroyed, but he also dislikes it being derided. He even dislikes its destruction being derided. The young lady who has her eye blackened feels that, after all, it is her eye. She does not want it plugged by the fist of violence, but neither does she want it pointed at by the finger of scorn. So it is true to say that the home also has been blackened by industrial grime and intolerable grievances. It is often true to say that the house has been smashed like the hat. But still, the man does feel, in some dim way, that it is his house, or is supposed to be his house, or ought to be his house, and that to insult it is in some way to insult him. And that feeling works back, as so much else works back, to the true tradition of property. And he distrusts the progressives, because they are not working back to that, but working forward to something quite contrary. Both reactionaries and revolutionaries commonly complain of the ingratitude of the poor. It is possible to sympathize with them in the sense of knowing what they mean. 
it is also possible to push sympathy to the fantastic length of knowing what the poor mean. The revolutionary, as a rule, has even more reason to complain than the reactionary. The poor certainly complain of him even more than of the reactionary. To begin with, the situation cannot be understood until we realize that most of the populace, especially the rural populace, regard both as types of the same social class, and one quite separate from their own social class. They are both representatives of gentry, and just as a loose squire is still a squire, so a liberal scholar is still a scholar. It might be roughly represented by the attitude of a poor landlady towards two lodgers. The conservative is only a self-indulgent lodger. The socialist is only a fussy lodger. One is a peppery major who demands curries. The other is a priggish vegetarian who demands lentils. But these two things are not seen primarily as the extremes of two opinions, but as the eccentricities of one class. In this sense, the poor are as class-conscious as any Marxian professor can wish them to be. They are quite sufficiently conscious of their own class to know that the Marxian professor always belongs to another class. But there is another idea in this ingratitude attributed to the working classes. It is as much an instinct as an idea. And it is true, though the psychoanalysts do say so, that what is subconscious often expresses itself in symbols. A cottage woman in my neighborhood actually complained that her new cottage was provided with a tap over the sink. The only actual expression that could be got out of her was something like, I've always had to go out for my water. To many, this may well sound like the most wild and whimsical sort of thanklessness and discontent. It is as if she had cursed her stars because the river ran by her own door and did not give her the healthy exercise of walking a mile to the parish pump. It is as if she blasphemed the gods because the apples grew on the lowest branch within her reach, because they did not give the old lady the joyous and juvenile adventure of climbing to the top of the tree. But for anyone who understands something of the tangle of traditions involved, it is not altogether like that. It is not a complaint of the water flowing where it chooses, but of it being diverted to a place which she did not choose. And it is not a memory of walking to the parish pump, but of walking to the private well. Anyone who knows anything of the real history of England, largely hidden by the best English historians, knows that this cottage woman's great-grandmother, or even her grandmother, may quite well have been the wife of a yeoman, owning his own freehold and drinking from his own well. That is, on the rare occasions when he had not something better to drink, for he, or his yet more superstitious ancestors, could get a gallon of ale for a few pence. Now every step of the process, from the conditions when he could get ale so cheaply, to the condition in which he is almost forbidden to get it at all, has been represented as a step of progress, of what Cobbett called vast improvements. The squires who enclosed commons, the merchants who cut down wages, the organizers of machinery and the preachers of utilitarianism, all claimed that logic and enlightenment were entirely on their side. If, therefore, the status of the yeoman had lingered as late as the woman's grandmother, it could only be by the sort of tradition that is called prejudice. It could only be by a tough conservative instinct, the poor man clinging almost blindly to custom. In short, freedom could only survive by his repeating, with an almost brutal and brainless obstinacy, I've always had to go out for my water. He had nothing else to say. But what success he had came from saying it. He had never read the encyclical of Leo the Thirteenth, or Mr. Belloc on the servile state. He did not even take in the new witness. He is now called merely ignorant, and indeed he had the deepest and darkest sort of ignorance. He did not even know that he was right. But suppose that when he could easily get a gallon of ale in the market, or even brew a gallon of ale in the house, somebody proposed that the ale should be laid on to his house like water, with pipes and taps. That would seem to some a glorious, and to others a bestial freedom. But in practice it would have worked out as the reverse of free. As the fad of temperance grew more and more intemperate, 
the same system that allowed of unlimited supply would have allowed of unlimited limitation. Great official corporations, commanding beer like water, could much more easily have cut down the drinking hours and diluted the drink. They could have done it without any fuss of parliamentarism or even of police. They could have done it not even with a stroke of the pen, but rather with a turn of the tap. And if ever science advances so far as to find alcohol in water, as well as animalculae in water, or any other peril or need of precaution, that precaution would really be prohibition. That is what the poor woman obscurely felt about the terrors of the tap. She had the instinct that when everything can be laid on, everything can be cut off. When, as in some socialist vision, nothing is bought or owned, but everything is supplied, the supply can cease suddenly. We are only safe at present because the powers do not happen to object to washing or water drinking. But if ink were laid on in pipes like water, from some great collectivist ink works as large as the water works, we might soon discover that the powers may happen to object to writing. They might well object to what I am now writing, and still more to somebody who should write it better. I should be lucky to have an inkwell of my own. End of section 14、section、15 of G. K. Chesterton's newspaper columns, The New Witness, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joseph Grimer. G. K. Chesterton's newspaper columns, The New Witness, 1922. By G. K. Chesterton. Section 15. Mr. Belloc and the Jews. In the case of Mr. Belloc, I have always found that my attempts at a criticism of his books tended to turn into a criticism of his critics. Doubtless it will be so with this hasty note on his new book, The Jews, and doubtless there are reasons for a trick so unjust to his genius and originality. The superficial cause is a sort of surprise at the strange disproportion between such creation and such criticism, or in other words, the strange separation of so much journalism from the serious thought of the age. Mr. Belloc is one of the first intellectual influences in modern history. He is not merely admired, he has convinced men, he has turned their minds. I cannot believe that men who said this fifty years ago were received in the press for the first twelve years with a silence punctuated by sniggers. It was as if nobody had ever read a word about Darwin, except a very occasional paragraph about a lunatic who said men had tails. It is as if there had been no mention of Carlyle at all, beyond a rumour that a crazy old man lived in Chelsea, who thought that talking was wicked and that every man should wear a gag. This misunderstanding of Mr. Belloc is so strange and striking as to distract us even from the understanding of him. A deeper cause is that his theses are not inventions, but discoveries. If he had merely invented the servile state or the Jewish problem, as his enemies say, he might have all the glory of it as a wizard or a romancer, as he has discovered them because they are there. We also know that they are there, and we should continue to know that they are there, even if he went mad and denied it. In short, in this he is scientific and not artistic, for only the artist can repeat the artist's spell, but any fool can verify the discoverer's find when it is really found. Last, and the reverse of least, it is because he is, in a sense, far too real for what we call practical politics. A practical man, a book like The Jews, aims at an effect. The understanding reader watches for the effect. The author propounds and proposes something. Is there a chance of his achieving it? When the great gun has fired, we no longer look at the gun, but at the target. For this reason, I despair of doing justice to the book as a book, to its literature, its learning, its imaginative justice, its generous causatory. Only one thing I will say of it is a symbolic summary. Any man who says that Mr. Belloc has merely written a book against Jews is mad. He must be a man insatiable of flattery and falsehood, and deaf and blind with the mania of persecution. No unionist justifying his distrust of the Irish would dream of taking so much trouble to allow for Irish feelings or state the Irish. Case, as Mr. Belloc takes for Jewish feelings and the Jewish case. No Englishman criticizing France has ever thought of having so much sympathy and self control as Mr. Belloc shows in criticizing Israel. Any man who says Mr. Belloc has a prejudice against Jews is mad, mad with prejudice. 
A prejudice plainly means a dislike for a thing before we know anything about it, and it is madness to say that Mr. Belloc knows nothing about Jews. Historically, he knows more about Jews than they do. He knows more in favour of Jews than they do. They complain of massacres, but few are likely to dwell on those in Cyrencenia in the second century. They urge toleration and peace, but they are not likely to look for them, as he does in a particular period of medieval Poland. Finally, and most emphatically, any man who says Mr. Bullock believes in a conspiracy of Jews is not even mad, he is simply lying. That there is not a conscious conspiracy, but only the sort of cooperation natural in a scattered nation, is here stated by the author in the plainest possible words, not for the first time, nor I fear for the last. His main thesis about that nation is that which has long been maintained in this paper, that the solution is some separation of the Jews as a national unit or corporation, with some new points in it I may deal in another article. But the reception of the book resolves itself into one very simple question. Is it possible to get people to listen to reason? They will listen to rhetoric. They have long listened to rhetoric in favour of Jews. They are now more and more listening to rhetoric against Jews. If we go that wild way, there will be a worse than rhetoric against them. But nobody who listens to reason can pretend that Mr. Belloc's thesis is an insult to Israel, unless Sinn Féin is an insult to Ireland. I am glad to say that Mr. Belloc's book has raised some reasonable discussion among intelligent Jews. There are some letters in the Sunday Times which are sincere and sensible enough, as far as they go. They plead that particular Jews are really deeply embedded in English life. Some of them do indeed remind Mr. Belloc that he had external relations with the French tradition or the Roman obedience. Now, even if this were true in their sense, it is really itself an answer to their question. I happen to know Mr. Belloc very well, and I know that he is an Englishman interested in France and not a Frenchman interested in England. I know that his soul will really sing on Duncton Hill and not on the highest peaks of the Pyrenees. But nobody will deny that, whichever way we put it. He is in a rather exceptional position among Englishmen. And that is exactly the point. The Jew, in living among Christian nationals, is not in an exceptional position among Jews. And that is exactly the point. If Belloc were really an exile or an alien or a hybrid, he would still only be Belloc, while the Jews would be a race of Bellocs. But there is no such community in his case. Suppose, for the sake of argument, that he is a French exile in England. Still, there is not another Belloc in Sweden, writing weekly articles for the, a new witness in Stockholm, as he does for the new witness in London. There is not another Belloc in Russia, writing poems about the Caucasus as he writes poems about the Downs. There is not a fourth Belloc in Turkey, having written military criticisms in a Turkish paper throughout the war and a fifth Belloc in America, having denounced a piece of political graft in New York, in the manner of the Marconi case, and a sixth Belloc in India, having just written a book on Buddhism called Asia and the Faith. In short, he would only be an individual instance, even as a hard case. If he is really an exile, he is really an exception. Now nobody but a fool would deny that those individual exceptions do exist in any international relation. A division of England from Ireland, for instance, will undoubtedly uproot some families rooted in both islands, but that alone does not prove that the Irish are not and ought not to be a separate union. Now I, for one, agree with the individual Jews about the individual cases which they describe in the Sunday Times. There are individual Jewish friends of mine, whom I know well as I know Mr. Belloc, of whom I should be inclined to say that they have assimilated so much of the English soil and habit as to make it at least very difficult and possibly very harsh to detach them. These cases really are, in that sense, like the case of Mr. Belloc, or at least like his case as they honestly conceive it to be. To them, at least, he is an exception, and to me, at least, they are exceptions. They are the hard cases that can be found under any rule, but for that very reason they do not themselves constitute a rule, they do not destroy the general truth about the nomadic and cosmopolitan condition of the Jew. And then follows what always happens. The Jews, having urged these individual instances that really might support their case, rush on to pile up all the instances that prove ours. They demand, with innocent indignation, whether we do not admit the national quality in the very people we should ourselves select as most anti-national. Mr. Kaufman Nirokesti asked for ordinary European citizenship for a crowd of clever cosmopolitan Jews reigning, ranging from Hein to Lombroso, from Spinoza to Durdenberg, from Brandes to Balin, and so on. 
I could prove Mr. Belloc's case from nearly every one of these names, one after another. If I were a German, I should have been very angry with Heine's French sympathies, because he was not a German rebuking his country, but a sham German who has really preferred another country. The names of Nordeaux and Lombroso, which he quotes, are very unfortunate, for the two unquestionably backed each other as being both Jews and kinsmen. George Brandes did disastrous harm to Denmark by being supposed to be a Dane. It was quite allowable that a Jew should have sympathy with Germany, but it was deplorable that a Dane should do homage to Prussia. These men are startling demonstrations of the very false position that Mr. Ballock describes. For the moment, my last word, as I expected, has to be given not to Mr. Ballock, but to the Jews whom he is trying to save. But if it were truly my last word to them, then this is what it would be, that Mr. Belloc is simply trying to save them. It is no good now to discuss the merits of the Victorian Compromise, in which I lived like everything else until I was about twenty-five. The idea that the Jews are an English sect, or that there is no Jewish problem at all, that view is dead already, as dead as Queen Victoria or Queen Anne. What is boiling up in England now on every side is a sheer instinctive anarchical anti-Semitism. The Jews have to choose between that and the other thing, which is listening to reason, and in this case means listening to Belloc. End of section 15section 16 of G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922, by G. K. Chesterton. Section 16. The Greed and the Company Promoter, by G. K. Chesterton. The sensational exposure of the plot between Bolshevists and the German government for the reversal of the Great War and the ruin of Western Europe interests everyone intelligent enough to know his own interests but it interests me in a small and special fashion also because it affects what i recently wrote in these columns about bolshevism i can honestly claim that in the course of many controversies there have been few things that i have had cause to recant there are some i may have had cause to regret i have generally been able to stick to my guns but the laugh is certainly against a gunner who was fired at a target because he thought it was a castle. In this sense, I might regret some assaults on some positions, not because they were more solid than I suggested, but because they were less solid than I supposed. I have aimed at something which I thought was a head and was only a hat, or, in other words, what I thought was a philosophy and was only a fashion and the fashions can fly faster than the shots or arrows. In my youth I made tremendous efforts against the boom in the materialism of Heckel, as popularized by Mr. Blatchford. Nowadays we never hear the name of Heckel. Morally he is one of the men killed in the Great War, and he has not even got a war memorial. Jena, where he was a professor, has more than once been the scene of disasters to Prussia, Similarly, I have covered many pages with refutations of state socialism, and now it have been officially abandoned by the socialists. All this would have happened just the same if I had spent the time in writing detective stories about the murder of the vicarage and the guilt of the governess or the curate of vocation, which I vastly prefer. It is so in the sensation of Genoa, those who talk of two entities called germany and russia are misled by mere symbols it is as if they talked of russia as double-faced under the impression that there really is an eagle with two heads or of the embrace of russia as if it were really a bear what has happened is simply this that certain cosmopolitans largely jewish living in moscow have destroyed the national government under cover of communism, are now engaging in similar commercial cosmopolitans living in Berlin or Frankfurt, 
by frankly falling back on capitalism the commercial central europe is to be established in spite of the war of course there are sincere men involved lenin probably cares for communism trotsky probably cares no more for communism than for calvinism and not half so much as for capitalism but that individual sincerity is not the main truth about bolshevism now the truth about bolshevism is very simple it is that we all wasted our time in disproving it in theory instead of waiting for it to disprove itself in practice but i do not mean merely disproving its own excellence i mean disproving its own existence there is not and never has been any such thing as bolshevism as described and desired by the truest and genuine bolshevist they have not been disappointed in the end they have been deceived from the beginning what they were watching with admiration was an operation entirely different from their notion of it from beginning to end we were quite as much deceived into denouncing it as they into admiring it neither the thing we hated or the thing they loved is there at all to be loved or hated what is there is something quite different it is rather like spending hours in scientific debate with a crank or a crazy inventor merely to find that he is a common company promoter in a sense we take the scheme less seriously and the schemer more seriously suppose a man comes to us with flashing eyes and flourished papers to prove the feasibility of some great communist or communal scheme let us say a colossal umbrella to be erected over the whole of london to keep off the rain if we find his eyes and papers and personal magnetism beginning to prevail among our neighbors we may endeavor to dissuade him and them from the scheme we may argue in a rationalistic fashion that the roof which kept off the rain would also keep off the sun we could insist that london seldom suffers from a tropic excess of sun and that so covered it would be as dark as a buried city we may take the higher ground of the imagination and insinuate that under so large an object something would be lost of the exquisite skyline of st paul's and the tower bridge or the spires of westminster seen from the river we might even argue in our fantastical and utopian fashion that there is a sort of advantage in each man owning his own umbrella because he can put it up and down when it suits himself we might exhaust ourselves with eloquence and logic watching the skyline of chimney-pots all the time with hourly alarm for the first beginnings of that top-heavy tower that mighty mushroom spreading over the sky but we should rather regret our wasted words if we found that the bright-eyed gentleman with the papers was one of those purely commercial characters for whom promoting a thing means anything but producing it we should count our words wasted when we found he had never had the smallest intention of raising an umbrella all over london but only of raising a subscription all over london if a man wanted us to quarry for gold in shakespeare's cliff our first resistance might be instinctive and emotional we might adjure the vandal not to violate the symbol of the national poet or we might see an omen of disaster in making caverns of the white cliffs of albion our further objections might be geological and concern the probabilities of finding gold in the lump of white chalk but the objections would vanish with the advantages from our mind for the most vital objection of all and that is the simple fact that the gentleman was not dreaming of digging for gold however much he might be dreaming of finding it in pockets not of the geological sort in short it is the experience of everybody in connection with wildcat schemes especially in finance that they are subject to summary or detailed criticism according to whether they are seriously intended at all we do not call in naturalists to consider the wildcat as a domestic animal when once we are sure it is a fabulous animal now the bolshevist is that prophet who turns out to be a promoter he has led us into wasting words over whether his aim was possible when in fact even if it was possible it was not his aim he has led us to criticize the communist state like the communal umbrella and to seek for the golden age in the russian cities like the gold in the dover cliff 
but though we were looking for it, he was not. He was looking for something much more solid, and his new combination with the cosmopolitan element in Germany has only solidified it. The critics of the Bolshevist may have managed to prove with laborious lucidity that utopia is utopian, but he was not looking for utopia. He was looking for Mittal Europa. He is looking for the old, pre-war ambition of a more or less financial and cosmopolitan consolidation of the Teutonic and Slavonic worlds, generally under a domination that is neither Slav nor Teuton. We may have shown socialism to be unworkable, but this is not socialism, and this is not unworkable. It is capitalism of the worst type, and on the largest scale and it is workable enough in the sense of making other people work. This is not anybody's utopia, and cannot be dismissed by anybody for its utopianism. This is not an earthly paradise, though it is earthly enough. This is not a golden age, except in the sense of being greedy for gold. This is not a new Jerusalem, except in the sense of being run by Jews. This is not even Bolshevism. It is only the thing that Bolshevists have aimed at and Bolshevists have achieved. What the Russian Revolution did, so far as this argument is concerned, was simply to ensure that the Russian people should not be exploited by Russians. It arranged for their being exploited by aliens, and especially by Asiatic aliens. It destroyed the old monarchy and aristocracy, which, bad as they were, might have been more or less patriotic, destroyed them largely because they might have been more or less patriotic. They were destroyed in the name of communism, but not for the sake of communism, though of course there were many honest dupes, even among the leaders, who were really communist. It was done for the sake of a capitalist combination, which might have been imposed by German Jews on a defeated Russia, but is now extended by Russian Jews to a defeated Germany. It seems almost as if it were time that the nations which were not defeated had something to say in the matter. End of section sixteen. Recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section seventeen of G. K. Chesterton's newspaper columns, The New Witness, nineteen twenty two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922. By G. K. Chesterton. Section 17 at the sign of the world's end freedom and the film by g k chesterton long lists are being given of particular cases in which children have suffered in spirits or health from alleged horrors of the cinema one child is said to have had a fit after seeing a film another to have been sleepless with some fixed idea taken from a film another to have killed his father with a carving knife through having seen a knife used in a film. This may possibly have occurred, though if it did, anybody of common sense would prefer to have details about that particular child rather than about that particular picture. But what is supposed to be the practical moral of it in any case? Is it that the young should never see a story with a knife in it? Are they to be brought up in complete ignorance of The Merchant of Venice? because Shylock flourishes a knife for a highly disagreeable purpose? Are they never to hear of Macbeth, lest it should slowly dawn upon their trembling intelligence that it is a dagger that they see before them? It would be more practical to propose that a child should never see a real carving knife, and still more practical that he should never see a real father. All that may come, the era of preventative and prophetic science has only begun. We must not be impatient, but when we come to the cases of morbid panic after some particular exhibition, there is yet more reason to clear the mind of Kant. 
it is perfectly true that a child will have the horrors after seeing some particular detail it is quite equally true that nobody can possibly predict what that detail will be it certainly need not be anything so obvious as a murder or even a knife i should have thought anybody who knew anything about children or for that matter anybody who had been a child would know that these nightmares are quite incalculable the hint of horror may come by any chance in any connection if the cinema exhibited nothing but views of country vicarages or vegetarian restaurants the ugly fancy is as likely to be stimulated by these things as by anything else it is like seeing a face in the carpet it makes no difference that it is the carpet at the vicarage i will give two examples from my own most personal circle i could give hundreds from hearsay i know a child who screamed steadily for hours if he had been taken past the albert memorial this was not a precocious precision or excellence in his taste in architecture nor was it a premature protest against all that gimcrack german culture which nearly entangled us in the downfall of the barbaric tyranny it was the fear of something which he himself described with lord simplicity as the cow with the india rubber tongue it sounds rather a good title for a creepy short story at the base of the albert memorial i may explain for those who have never enjoyed that monument are four groups of statuary representing europe asia africa and america america especially is very overwhelming borne onward on a snorting bison who plunges forward in a fury of western progress and is surrounded with red indians mexicans and all sorts of pioneers o oh, pioneers armed to the teeth the child passed this transatlantic tornado with complete coolness and indifference europe however is seated on a bull so mild as to look like a cow the tip of its tongue is showing and happened to be discolored by weather suggesting i suppose a living thing coming out of the dead marble now nobody could possibly foretell that a weather stain would occur in that particular place and fill that particular child with that particular fancy nobody is likely to propose meeting it by forbidding graven images like the muslims and the jews nobody has said as yet that it is bad morals to make a picture of a cow nobody has even pleaded that it is bad manners for a cow to put its tongue out these things are utterly beyond calculation they are also beyond counting for they occur all over the place not only to morbid children but to any children i knew this particular child very well being a rather older child myself at the time he certainly was not congenitally timid or feeble-minded for he risked going to prison to expose the marconi scandal and died fighting in the great war here is another example out of scores a little girl now a very normal and cheerful young lady had an insomnia of insane terror entirely arising from the lyric of little bo peep after an inquisition like that of the confessor or the psychoanalyst it was found that the word bleating had some obscure connection in her mind with the word bleeding there was thus perhaps an added horror in the phrase heard and hearing rather than seeing the flowing of blood nobody could possibly provide against that sort of mistake nobody could prevent the little girl from hearing about sheep any more than the little boy from hearing about cows we might abolish all nursery rhymes and as they are happy and popular and used with universal success it is very likely that we shall but the whole point of the mistake about that phrase is that it might have been a mistake about any phrase we cannot foresee all the fancies that might arise not only out of what we say but of what we do not say we cannot avoid promising a child a caramel lest he should think we would say cannibal or conceal the very word hill lest it should sound like hell all the catalogues and calculations offered us by the party of caution in this controversy are therefore quite worthless it is perfectly true that examples can be given of a child being frightened of this that or the other 
but we can never be certain of his being frightened of the same thing twice it is not on the negative side by making lists of vetoes that the danger can be avoided it can never indeed be entirely avoided we can only fortify the child on the positive side by giving him health and humor and a trust in god not omitting what will much mystify the moderns an intelligent appreciation of the idea of authority which is only the other side of confidence and which alone can suddenly and summarily cast out such devils but we may be sure that most modern people will not look at it in this way they will think it more scientific to attempt to calculate the incalculable so as soon as they have realized that it is not so simple as it looks they will try to map it out however complicated it may be when they discover the terrible detail need not be a knife but might just as well be a fork they will only say there is a fork complex as well as a knife complex and that increasing complexity of complexes is the net in which liberty will be taken instead of seeing in the odd cases of the cow's tongue or the bleeding sheep the peril of their past generalizations they will see them only as starting points for new generalizations they will get yet another theory out of it and they will begin acting on the theory long before they have done thinking about it they will start out with some new and crude conception that sculpture has made children scream or that nursery rhymes have made children sleepless and the thing will be a clause in a program of reform before it has begun to be a conclusion in a serious study of psychology that is the practical problem about modern liberty which the critics will not see of which eugenics is one example and all this is amateur child psychology is another so long as an old morality was in black and white like a cheese board even a man who wanted more of it made white was certain that no more of it would be made black now he is never certain what vices may not be released but neither is he certain what virtues may be forbidden even if he does not think it wrong to run away with a married woman he knew that his neighbors only thought it wrong because the woman was married they did not think it was wrong to run away with a red-haired woman or a left-handed woman or a woman subject to headaches but when we let loose a thousand eugenical speculations all adopted before they are verified and acted on even before they are adopted he is just as likely as not to find himself separated from the woman for those or any other reasons similarly there was something to be said for restrictions even rather puritanical and provincial restrictions upon what children should read or see so long as they are fenced in certain fixed departments like sex or sensational tortures but when we begin to speculate on whether other sensations may not stimulate as dangerously as sex those other sensations may be as closely controlled as sex when let us say we hear that the eye and brain are weakened by the rapid turning of wheels as well as by the most revolting torturing of men we have come into a world in which cartwheels and steam engines may become as obscene as racks and thumbscrews in short so long as we combine ceaseless and often reckless scientific speculation with rapid and often random social reform the result must inevitably be not anarchy but ever-increasing tyranny there must be a ceaseless and almost mechanical multiplication of things forbidden the resolution to cure all the ills the flesh is heir to combined with the guesswork about all possible ills that flesh and nerve and brain cell may be heir to these two things conducted simultaneously must inevitably spread a sort of panic of prohibition scientific imagination and social reform between them will quite logically and almost legitimately have made us slaves this seems to me a very clear a very fair and a very simple point of public criticism and i am much mystified about why so many publicists cannot even see what it is but take refuge in charges of anarchism which firstly are not true and secondly have nothing to do with it End of section seventeen recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida.
Section 18 of G.K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. G.K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922, by G.K. Chesterton, 18. May 19, 1922. The New Witness. At the Sign of the World's End. The Real Case Against Revelations. By G. K. Chesterton. A vast amount of nonsense is sure to be talked about the correspondence of Mr. Bernard Shaw and Sir James Barry with Mrs. Patrick Campbell, both in defense and denunciation. It will probably be both solemn and trivial, for the two things generally go together while i take the matter itself much more lightly i should like to use it as a text for some social criticism about something that is worth talking about i am not in the least taken in by mr shaw as a lover because of what he wrote to mrs campbell any more than i regard mr shaw as a thief because of what he writes about communism but i do think he is a socialist because he does not understand the intellectual point about property and i do think he consents to pose in this way because he does not understand the intellectual point about privacy and this limitation logical rather than ethical is really important the modern world is not really suffering a moral breakdown but rather a mental breakdown it is not too wild to endure old conventions it is rather too tired to understand them a strong example may be seen in all this cult of indiscretion or the publication of intimate things that is criticized in mrs asquith or mrs campbell it is not wicked but it is quite wonderfully stupid it is not necessarily wicked to fire off a pocket pistol under the impression that it is a big gun it depends what or whom you are trying to hit but it is stupid to not know that a pocket pistol has not got the range and cannot hit the mark it may seem queer that we have lately seen a decrease of privacy and an increase of secrecy i mean that while private things are made public public things are kept private evil is always a place where extremes meet and he who holds a candle to the devil always burns the candle at both ends societies decay largely by getting things displaced or reversed in this fashion thus while we are seeing around us a degree of license that can rightly be called pagan we are also seeing a destruction of liberty that is rightly called puritan what is bottled up in one place breaks out in another place only it is the wrong place instead of the right place the police having been set on a campaign against drink the papers are full of an orgy of drugs the age of materialism is ending in the maddest and most credulous sort of spiritualism all these examples are obvious and they throng in thousands to the memory but this particular paradox of the growth of secrecy in the wrong place and the loss of privacy in the right place is rather especially connected with the crucial political and social problems of the hour that which is said in the inner chamber is sometimes proclaimed on the housetops but that which obviously ought to be proclaimed on the housetops is only whispered in the inner chamber anything can be trumpeted abroad so long as it is trivial anything can be buried and destroyed so long as it is important our civilization seems to have entered the epoch of a new sort of publicity and privacy in which it will be entirely occupied with washing dirty linen in public and whitewashing dirty scandals in private this idea gives a singular and sinister irony to the phrase about personalities which was so consistently used to combat an effort for clean government those who complained of the hushing up of the marconi mystery were called personal for all the world as if they had been talking about a pimple on lord murray's nose or a patch on mr fenner's trousers what they were complaining of was the use which certain public men had made of their public position in relation to a public contract which they ought to have made public in a public senate but which they did not since then we have had a flood of all of the futilities that we did not want and all of the facts and fancies that really were private or might well have been private the politician's nose or the financier's trousers might very well have figured in the reminiscences of mrs asquith or mrs patrick campbell 
all the reticence that was really due to tolerably good motives, to motives of politeness or delicacy or dignity or old friendship, has largely been swept away. But there has been no break in the reticence that was really due to bad motives, to fear and financial pressure and the more cynical sort of favoritism. And if we ask for the cause of this curious inversion, it can be found, I think, in the matter which is the moral of so many of our social stories, the mental fatigue that misses the intellectual point about the ancient independence of the home. Thus, I am quite ready to believe Mrs. Patrick Campbell and Mr. Bernard Shaw, if they agree in saying that the correspondence just published was altogether a joke, but I cannot agree with them in thinking it sensible to publish such a joke. It seems to me a blunder in psychology not to be expected of a fine dramatist and a fine actress. It is the essential of a skit that it must sound serious, but it's the nature of the crowd to take anything that sounds serious and assume that it is serious. The point about the jokes of friends, like the jokes of families, is not so much that they must not, is that they cannot be explained. To expose them is not to explain them, but rather to obscure them. Their publicity is not even a revelation. It is rather a noisy concealment. This applies equally to a burlesque love letter and to a serious love letter. In the case of the serious letter, the mistake of printing it is that it never seems to be serious. The point is not that the feelings are too sacred to be communicated to the public. The point is that they are not communicated to the public because it is not a public mode of communication. It is not that a man is telling us about his most secret emotion. It is that he is not telling us anything because he is talking in a secret language. That is the difference between a love letter and a love song. There is nothing foolish about publishing a love song any more than about publishing a hymn. No feelings can be more sacred than religious feelings, but religious poetry is roared aloud by a great mob of people in an enormous public building. But the difference is in the medium chosen. When a man writes a poem, whether religious or romantic, he deliberately selects dignified words which express the dignity of his subject by the standards of established speech. Whether he always achieves that dignity, a study of some hymns and some love's poems have led the sensitive to doubt but he means to reveal his private feelings in the recognized public diction. He is not only trying to praise, but to do it so that the praise may itself be praised and praiseworthy. But private praise that is only meant for private acceptance will not sound like praise at all. It will sound like piffle, and anyone with the least notion of human nature ought to know it. I have often tried to insinuate, onto the strange souls of our social reformers, the startling paradox that there is something rather impressive about the institution of motherhood, even among persons who have less than five hundred a year. But I doubt if I should assist my propaganda on behalf of maternal dignity if I had all the conversation of mothers to their babies taken down by a dictaphone and proclaimed over the country through a megaphone. It is not because the love of a mother for a baby is a secret too holy to be known. Human life is so constituted that most of us happen to know it. It is because the thing is of such a kind that when it becomes publicity it becomes parody. So it is with any other kind of love. And if it be true of a love letter that is really a love letter, it is if possible more true of a love letter that is only a lark. And the serious thing will never sound serious, so the funny thing will never sound funny. The fun is funny because the friend is friendly. The very fact that a man has a friend ought to teach him that he cannot suddenly turn ten thousand total strangers into his friends. Even a communist ought to know that you cannot revolutionize the community so suddenly. But for all that, the fallacy of communism has some serious connection with the matter. I do not know if Mr. Bernard Shaw would really differ from me on this point, but if he does, I am sure it is for the same fundamental reason for which he differs from me about socialism and property. What the socialist does not understand is that there is a field of operations which must be independent because it is incommunicable. A peasant will not report to a county council exactly what he is going to do with his own house or field any more than an artist will report exactly what he is going to do with his unfinished story or statue. The difficulty might be expressed in many more subtle ways, but it can be expressed roughly by saying that he does not know. He feels that he has motives that would be meaningless to the world, 
and that if he has to justify everything he does, he will justify it badly and do it worse. In this sense, property is as much a secret as a love affair, and the family itself is a family joke. End of 18. Recording by Tindra. Section 19 of G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922 by g k chesterton cannibalism and chivalry by g k chesterton a distinguished lady has just returned from a visit to a very interesting community such as the most enlightened and experimental sociologists love to study it has already experimented in many of the innovations still only tentatively advocated in the newspapers for instance it is a society in which women propose nearly everything about it strikes the same modern note we are told that the flappers or very young women have a considerable emotional experience and that degree of progress which some call precocity it is true that when the precocious lady has proposed to the more or less complacent gentleman other things sometimes follow sometimes the gentleman hits the lady on the head with a club sometimes he even eats her but from an enlarged point of view i am not sure that this last detail ought to militate against the claim of the society to be truly modern we know that the mark of modern emancipation is the elimination of artificial boundaries why not the artificial boundary between one kind of cold meat and another we know it means the enlarging of our bibles and prayer books so they contain all the scriptures and litanies of all the religions of the world why not the enlargement of our cookery books and bills of fare until so they cover all the varied customs of the various tribes of the world we know it specializes in the idea of assimilation or the digestion of different systems into a substantial unity and where could there be a more perfect example of assimilation than anthropophagy the very word contains the greek substance of the word philanthropy indeed the word philanthropy by a slight extension of its meaning might be used as a euphemism for cannibalism i once saw an ethical hymn book full of religious poems purged of the irrelevant expletive god in this an old and familiar hymn reappeared in the form near mankind to thee nearer to thee it always suggested to me the conditions of a suffocating crush in the tube but i am not sure that the expedient of cannibalism does not more aptly represent the idea of the hymn or even solve the problem of the tube it seems to be the most effective and economical way in which many could be combined in one and we could unite the assimilation of substance with the amplification of space nothing stands in the way of this reform except one of these sentimental prejudices or superstitious fears which we are more and more shedding in every other department of life anyhow what interests me at the moment about the account of the cannibal islands given by the intrepid lady explorer is not the second point about cannibalism but the first point about courtship it is perhaps the more practical and immediately relevant of the two progress goes step by step and we shall probably see ladies obtain the privilege of proposing before they obtain the further privilege of being eaten and the fact that the women who ask the men to marry them are also the women who allow the men to brain them interests me very much in a larger connection it interests me very much but it does not surprise me at all the two things seem to me to go together quite naturally and even inevitably I think I should always have argued in the abstract that it must be so. Describe to me some remote or imaginary utopia in which a man has a harem 
so literally like a herd of cattle that he can even knock a wife on the head and eat her and i think i could have deduced from that fact alone that the woman proposed to the man as in the most advanced novels of the suffragettes in those novels and the newspapers that review them it always seems to be assumed that the custom of letting the proposal come from the man indicates in some way the greater despotism or at least the greater dignity of the man in itself it obviously indicates the exact opposite the despot does not crave an audience with his subject or beg a boon of his subject the subject craves the audience from the despot and begs the boon of the despot the king does not petition the people the people petition the king in short it is certain that the custom as it has existed in moderately recent european history at least is a part of the chivalric idea of a certain kind of dignity belonging to the woman which does not belong to the man now it is perfectly consistent to say that the chivalric notion is all moonshine it is perfectly consistent to say that any notion of a special female dignity is all moonshine some of us may content ourselves with answering that diana is not so easily defeated and that moonshine has to all appearance come to stay but it is perfectly logical on certain premises to deny the dignity of diana it is quite tenable that women would have been happier if they had always been entitled to propose it is also very tenable indeed that women would have been happier if they had always been in a harem the method meets hundreds of the most pressing modern problems from the proportions of the sexes to the burden of reproduction and for that matter i cannot see that it is untenable that they would have been happier if they had always been eaten considering how much more comfortable and contented are most of the creatures whom we keep for eating compared with the numerous human beings whom we never provide with enough to eat and this is all quite tenable and upon certain first principles quite logical and in the same sense it is quite logical to say that all forms of ceremonial respect paid to women as such are absurd what is not tenable or logical or even intelligent is to deny the difference between a thing being absurd and a thing being meant to be absurd it is one thing to say that we ought not to look up to an idol and another to say that we look up to it because we look down on it a man may say that he is of so detached and rational a spirit that a man on a throne is no more impressive to him than a man in a pillory he may be perfectly sincere and it might also be worth while to test his sincerity by putting him in the pillory but if he says that people put a man on a throne because they meant to put him in a pillory then the test has had a clearer scientific result and he may well be put in a straight waistcoat he may say that a mitre is like a dunce's cap in the sense that the bishop is a fool but not in the sense that the congregation meant to make a fool of him if he seriously says that we have not to look far for the fool it may be silly that the lord mayor of london should be encumbered with a great golden chain but it would hardly be more sensible to go about saying in london they chain up the lord mayor and exhibit him like a bear or a monkey to the derision of the mob it may be silly that he should travel in a great coach but it would not be sensible to say that he is dragged in a cage or box as a captive of the coachman and the same elementary sanity which teaches us that the mayor is not dragged at the chariot wheels of his own coachman or that the mitre is not put on the bishop as an extinguisher to make him invisible to the multitude ought to tell us that the custom of the man coming to the woman instead of the woman to the man is meant to increase the prestige of the woman corresponding as it does to numberless other ceremonial relations of the same sort of course it is always possible in this as in numberless other things to confuse the living issue by all sorts of hazy conjectures about evolution the thing may not have been exactly like this in remote or prehistoric conditions when nobody knows what it was like it may have been it may be still indeed it certainly is complicated by other social ideals and necessities that do give a superiority to the male for certain purposes and on certain occasions but the instinct which most civilized europeans feel against the reversal of parts in this matter 
except for special causes or in special circumstances, is quite certainly, so far as it goes, the instinct of chivalry. It is quite certainly not merely the instinct of barbaric domination. And the proof of this, in fact, which is already obvious a priori, is to be found in the very interesting experience of the lady traveller, which I quoted at the beginning of this article. The place where the woman does really make the proposal is exactly the place where she is really put in the pot. It is perhaps worth while to make a note on this very natural fact, because most of the current ideas on all these matters of sexual dignity and sexual difference seem to be in an almost unlimited chaos. It is not so much that I disagree with them as that I can never exactly discover what it is with which I have to agree or disagree. I know what I myself think, and it is something exceedingly dull and commonplace, because it is what the whole common sense of Christendom thinks and is generally thought. I think women should have a certain place of dignity specially preserved for them by the manners of civilization, because their highest function is one which in its nature requires protection and a certain degree of withdrawal from extreme activities and competitions. There are a great many exceptions to this rule, and I am quite ready to make allowance for the exceptions, but not to allow them to disprove the rule. I am most emphatically not prepared to treat women, or men either, merely as individuals, as if there were no such thing as families. That is what I think, but what the reformers who rebuke me think I have never been able to discover. Sometimes they seem to be protesting against my unchivalrous conduct in wishing to insult women with chivalry. Sometimes they seem to suggest that I am in favor of hitting women because I explain why they should not be hit. Sometimes I am told to pity the toil and tragedy of the lonely working woman. Sometimes I am told it is pitiless to thwart her when she rushes on such a tragedy or sells herself into the slavery of such a toil. I am perfectly ready to pity everybody in the tangle and muddle of the modern world. But the person I pity most is the philosopher or historian whose duty it shall be to describe this modern movement in anything like logical or intelligible words, or to tell posterity what these people really wanted and what they were really driving at. Current Affairs Things are moving pretty fast towards a demand for interference in Irish affairs. When that demand comes, it is possible enough that the quarrel it will excite may give finance the opportunity it desires for getting rid of Lloyd George. The financiers will take any opportunity they can get. The politician will sit very tight in his chair, and the process of eviction will, as I said last week, be well worth watching. The farce will be a good one. For international finance is really a matter of urgency. It is already an uncomfortable feeling that it is beaten, but that is only an instinct. The recent breakdown of Genoa is much more obvious and immediate, and since Lloyd George, acting as the financier's agent at Genoa, has let them down, not from ill will, but from sheer incapacity, they will and must get rid of him. I think it is probable that their chance will come over Ireland. The run of our newspapers give us no more understanding of the Irish position than they do of any other problem in Europe. It is presented in our press, as all the other problems are presented, it is made out to be a mere confusion and folly, the result of trusting political power to debased creatures living in the plain below our own. The international policy of France is represented as a piece of stupidity, a blunder in elementary arithmetic. The international policy of Poland is represented as a piece of wild unreality, the action of men who know nothing of the world as it is, with its powerful armed Prussia, its magnificent, eager, patriotic Russian army, the opinion of Europe, and all the rest of it. The result of such newspaper work is to leave the average educated reader in a dense fog. He thinks the world has gone mad, outside his own country, or, alternatively, he nourishes the more comforting thought that, outside his own country, white men are as incapable as children. The disadvantage of this kind of public education is that it heads the country into disaster. It is as much as though you blindfolded a man and then turned him into the London traffic, and nowhere has the process had worse effect 
than in the matter of ireland to read the papers you would think the irish were people who killed men women and children at random burned down houses for the sake of burning them quarrelled among themselves to no purpose at all and with no aim the whole welter vaguely illuminated by some strange principle of religious difference itself quite incomprehensible for is not religion nowadays but an ill-defined and unimportant personal opinion seeing ireland thus general opinion reflected of course in the professional politicians has blundered so enormously that now at last it has created a permanent and very grave point of weakness in the international position of this country and it looks as though the weaknesses were to be aggravated in the near future yet the problem is simple enough if we put it as every political problem should be put in terms of its chief historic elements and those elements in their proper order the irish nation is the oldest nation in europe it is also the nation with the strongest sense of patriotism there is only one older nation in the world that we know of and that is the dispersed nation of israel the irish never came under the discipline of the roman empire therefore when in the continued expansion of our civilization eastward and westward britain attempted to include ireland within its realm as the germans civilized from france attempted in their turn to include the slav the irish found themselves ill-equipped for the struggle but the attempt to include them in the british realm never completely succeeded the efforts at conquest were spasmodic and the results slipped back after the reformation came a new and much stronger element of disruption the irish kept their faith the english lost it to the profit of the great landlords who were the backbone of the reformation movement after that prodigious change the attempt to subjugate ireland took the form of a protestant colonization which in its turn had two main limbs the confiscation of all the land for protestant advantage and the planting in the northeast of alien homogeneous protestant bodies the climax of this was reached at the end of the seventeenth century for three generations the alien domination remained complete then came through stages that are familiar to all of us but from causes which will never be fully analyzed the revolution in the relation between the two countries which has led at last to a position in which the independence of the irish people became a practical possibility and therefore our own defeat in the matter a practical possibility also every event converged towards this end equally did these events adverse to the irish and those favourable to them led on by a strange destiny to the same result the liberal movement in france made for the political emancipation of the catholics in ireland the delay in granting it did but strengthen its power the famine which seemed to have destroyed the irish people again strengthened them enormously by spreading them throughout the new world and bringing them in masses to permeate the towns of england the struggle for the land which appeared hopeless was won every act of our foreign government was swept into the tide acts of coercion proved to the advantage of the irish so did acts of conciliation murder and treachery by the police warmed the national feeling the land acts and the country council strengthened it just as much on the other side to the various home rule bills of the eighties and nineties you need pay no attention they were hypocritical and not intended to succeed but just before the great war came the final crisis the little minority in the northeast of ireland seeing that at last their domination was threatened decided to rebel they were aided in this by a military pronunciamento a general officer in command of the english garrison supported the decision of the officers to disobey the law mr asquith's government gave way with incredible weakness they bowed to the military mutiny they allowed the rebels in the northeast to import arms openly from germany they had the reward the rising in nineteen sixteen finished the affair it left two plain alternatives to conquer ireland and hold it by force of arms or to grant full autonomy observe what followed for it is a capital example of how corrupt politicians are invariably weak and foolish politicians as well a few months after the rebellion a group of millionaires three of whom worked through great newspaper combinations overset the last traditional administration 
the last prime minister who was in the long line of the educated english gentlemen who since walpole had administered the state they set up lloyd george it was a change far greater in import even than the irish rebellion of the preceding spring the new government began by trying to make peace secretly with the enemy behind the back of the allies and from that enormity one can judge the spirit in which it would deal with the particular problem of ireland it proposed to subjugate the irish by a method of terror and cruelty which it would excuse to the united states who were pressing us very hard by repudiating its own agents the result was grotesque you had some fool of a politician or other saying openly in the house of commons for american consumption that the people of cork had burned down their own city you had the most lamentable shiftings and twistings explanations and excuses made to the various american envoys you had another politician shouting in the midst of these negotiations that there would be no surrender till the last arms had been taken from the hands of the last rebel then upon sharp determined pressure from the foreigner and from finance there was a complete surrender it was a matter of a few hours the politicians unsaid all that they had been saying and proclaimed their indifference to the success of the irish army had they in this abject and lamentable surrender been consistent something might have been saved from the wreck we should have come out of the venture heavily beaten and lessened in the eyes of the whole world but at any rate with a clear policy we should have been free of the burden of ireland but the smaller kind of liar cannot live without blunder and the arch blunder of all was made at that very moment the fools who thus surrendered at the wrong hour thought it a clever piece of intrigue to promise two incompatible things to two warring sets of men they told the newly enfranchised irish that though there would be partition the frontier of the little northern eastern state should be drawn so as to leave to the national government all except the small districts wholly protestant and alien they told the orange men that they should be given control over as large a portion of the catholic and nationalist districts as was compatible with keeping a bare protestant majority they thought in their wretched incompetence that to lie no matter how clumsily was always the best way out of a difficulty the consequences of that lie are before them to-day there are only two paths possible now either the reconquest of ireland at heaven knows what expense to our remaining international strength or the abandonment of partition and therefore the abandonment of the orange men to their fate a thing abhorrent to english opinion the politicians have put us into a cleft stick and left us with the choice between reconquest at the peril of failure and universal breakdown elsewhere and a completely independent and hostile ireland united under one government we may guess well enough what will happen the politicians will fall between two stools they will attempt interference but they will attempt it clumsily and with insufficient force in the breakdown the financiers will get rid of lloyd george End of section 19. Recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section 20 of G. K. Chesterton's newspaper columns, The New Witness, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adrian Stevens. G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns. The New Witness, 1922, by G. K. Chesterton. Hamlet and the Humanitarians. The psychoanalysts continue to buzz in a mysterious manner round the problem of Hamlet. They are especially interested in the things of which Hamlet was unconscious, not to mention the things of which Shakespeare was unconscious. It is in vain for old-fashioned rationalists like myself to point out that this is like dissecting the brain of Puck, or revealing the real private life of Punch and Judy. The discussion no longer revolves round whether Hamlet is mad, but whether everybody is mad, especially the experts investigating the madness. 
and the curious thing about this process is that even when the critics are really subtle enough to see subtle things they are never simple enough to see self-evident things a really fine critic is reported as arguing that in hamlet the consciousness willed one thing and the subconsciousness another apparently the conscious hamlet had unreservedly embraced and even welcomed the obligation of vengeance but the shock we are told had rendered the whole subject painful and started a strange and secret aversion to the scheme it did not seem to occur to the writers that there might possibly be something slightly painful at the best in cutting the throat of your own uncle and the husband of your own mother there might certainly be an aversion from the act but i do not see why it should be an unconscious aversion it seems just possible that a man might be quite conscious of not liking such a job where he differed from the modern morality was that he believed in the possibility of disliking it and yet doing it but to follow the argument of these critics one would think that murdering the head of one's family was a sort of family festivity or family joke a gay and innocent indulgence into which the young prince would naturally have thrown himself with thoughtless exuberance were it not for the dark and secretive thoughts that had given him an unaccountable distaste for it suppose it were borne in upon one of these modern middle-class critics of my own rank and routine of life possibly through his confidence in the messages at a spiritualist seance that it was his business to go home to brompton or surbiton and to stick the carving-knife into uncle william who had poisoned somebody and was beyond the reach of law it is possible that the critic's first thought would be that it was a happy way of spending a half-holiday and that only in the critic's subconsciousness the suspicion would stir that there was something unhappy about the whole business but it seems also possible that the regret might not be confined to his subconsciousness but might swim almost to the surface of his consciousness in plain words this sort of criticism has lost the last rags of common sense hamlet requires no such subconscious explanation for he explains himself and was perhaps rather too fond of doing so he was a man to whom duty had come in a very dreadful and repulsive form and to a man not fitted for that form of duty there was a conflict but he was conscious of it from beginning to end he was not an unconscious person but a far too conscious one strangely enough this theory of subconscious repulsion in the dramatic character is itself an example of subconscious repulsion in the modern critic it is the critic who has a sort of subliminal prejudice which makes him avoid something that seems very simple to others the thing which he secretly and obscurely avoids from the start is the very simple fact of the morality in which shakespeare did believe as distinct from all the crude psychology in which he almost certainly did not believe shakespeare certainly did believe in the struggle between duty and inclination the critic instinctively avoids the admission that hamlet's was a struggle between duty and inclination and tries to substitute a struggle between consciousness and subconsciousness he gives hamlet a complex to avoid giving him a conscience but he is actually forced to talk as if it was a man's natural inclination to kill an uncle because he does not want to admit that it might be his duty to kill him he is really driven to talking as if some dark and secretive monomania alone prevented us all from killing our uncles he is driven to this because he will not even take seriously the simple and if you will primitive morality upon which the tragedy is built for that morality involves three moral propositions from which the whole of the morbid modern subconsciousness does really recoil as from an ugly jar of pain these principles are first that it may be our main business to do the right thing even when we detest doing it second that the right thing may involve punishing some person especially some powerful person third that the just process of punishment may take the form of fighting and killing 
the modern critic is prejudiced against the first principle and calls it asceticism he is prejudiced against the second principle and calls it vindictiveness he is prejudiced against the third and generally calls it militarism that it actually might be the duty of a young man to risk his own life much against his own inclination by drawing a sword and killing a tyrant that is an idea instinctively avoided by this particular mood of modern times that is why tyrants have such a good time in modern times and in order to avoid this plain and obvious meaning of war as a duty and peace as a temptation the critic has to turn the whole play upside down and seek its meaning in modern notions so remote as to be in this connection meaningless he has to make william shakespeare of stratford one of the pupils of professor freud he has to make him a champion of psychoanalysis which is like making him a champion of vaccination he has to fit hamlet's soul somehow into the classification of freud and jung which is just as if he had to fit hamlet's father into the classifications of sir oliver lodge and sir arthur conan doyle he has to interpret the whole thing by a new morality that shakespeare had never heard of because he has an intense internal dislike of the old morality that shakespeare could not help hearing of and that morality which some of us believe to be based on a much more realistic psychology is that punishment as punishment is a perfectly healthy process not merely because it is reform but also because it is expiation what the modern world means by proposing to substitute pity for punishment is really very simple it is that the modern world dare not punish those who are punishable but only those who are pitiable it would never touch anyone so important as king claudius or kaiser william now this truth is highly topical just now the point about hamlet was that he wavered very excusably in something that had to be done and this is the point quite apart from whether we ourselves would have done it that was pointed out long ago by browning in the statue and the bust he argued that even if the motive for acting was bad the motive for not acting was worse and an action or inaction is judged by its real motive not by whether somebody else might have done the same thing from a better motive whether or not the tyrannicide of hamlet was a duty it was accepted as a duty and it was shirked as a duty and that is precisely true of a tyrannicide like that for which everybody clamoured at the conclusion of the great war it may have been right or wrong to punish the kaiser it was certainly even more right to punish the german generals and admirals for their atrocities but even if it was wrong it was not abandoned because it was wrong it was abandoned because it was troublesome it was abandoned for all those motives of moral weakness and mutability of mood which we associate with the name of hamlet it might be glory or ignominy to shed the blood of imperial enemies but it is certainly ignominy to shout for what you dare not shed to fall a cursing like a common drab a scullion granted that we had no better motives than we had then or have now it would certainly have been more dignified if we had fatted all of the region kites with this slave's offal the motive is the only moral test a saint might provide us with a higher motive for forgiving the warlords who butchered Friat and edith cavell but we have not forgiven the warlords we have simply forgotten the war we have not pardoned like christ we have only procrastinated like hamlet our highest motive has been laziness our commonest motive has been money in this respect indeed i must apologize to the charming and chivalrous prince of denmark for comparing him even on a single point with the princes of finance and the professional politicians of our time at least hamlet did not spare claudius solely because he hoped to get money out of him for the salaries of the players or meant to do a deal with him about wine supplied to elsinore or debts contracted at wittenberg still less was hamlet acting entirely in the interests of shylock an inhabitant of the distant city of venice doubtless hamlet was sent to england in order that he might develop further these high motives for peace and pardon 
twill not be noticed in him there there the men are as mad as he it is therefore very natural that men should be trying to dissolve the moral problem of hamlet into the unmoral elements of consciousness and unconsciousness the sort of duty that hamlet shirked is exactly the sort of duty that we are all shirking that of dethroning justice and vindicating truth many are now in a mood to deny that it is a duty because it is a danger this applies of course not only to international but internal and especially industrial matters capitalism was allowed to grow into a towering tyranny in england because the english were always putting off their popular revolution just as the prince of denmark put off his palace revolution they lectured the french about their love of bloody revolutions exactly as they are now lecturing the french about their love of bloody wars but the patience which suffered england to be turned into a plutocracy was not the patience of saints it was that patience which paralyzed the noble prince of the tragedy accidia and the great refusal in any case the vital point is that by refusing to punish the powerful we soon lost the very idea of punishment and turned our police into a mere persecution of the poor end of section 20「Section 21 of G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922, by G. K. Chesterton. At the Sign of the World's End, The Boycott and the Bolshevist, by G. K. Chesterton. It has been said that it is not easy to make a figure of speech go on all fours. And this is true even when the figure is itself a four-footed animal, such as a mad dog. Such a quadruped figures in a passage about France in a famous weekly paper of the pacifist sort, edited by that highly intelligent Tolstoyan, Mr. Massingham. And in this metaphor, the mad dog is rather a lame dog, of the sort that needs to be helped, if I may be so flippant, over the author's style. The passage runs, quote, We believe that the whole country is tired of these reiterated threats to play the mad dog. It is time to tell the French military party that if they are bent on cultivating the symptoms of hydrophobia, they will find themselves in the unenviable case of the infected animal. If they insist on rushing off to bite the Germans, the rest of Europe will, sooner or later, put them into quarantine. End quote. Now, I do not mention this metaphor here as a text for any discussion about French policy at the present moment. I do not here inquire how far a house dog must be mad if he barks to warn people that all the wolves of the forest have combined with all the wolves of the plains. I am not concerned with the foreign politics of the moment, but with the general ethics of the modern world, especially the world of Tolstoy and Mr. Massingham. I only take the metaphor as a text for some enquiry into their view of evil, their conception of resisting the devil, or, as they would say, the mad dog. Now if a Frenchman or any other foeman has cultivated the symptoms of hydrophobia and has realized too late that he is in the unenviable case of the infected animal, he will naturally be interested to know what that unenviable case may be. What do we in fact do with the mad dog? According to the writer's argument, we leave him alone. We boycott him and decline any social relations with him. We do not bow to the mad dog when we meet him in the high street. We go so far as to cut him and pass coldly on, like Beatrice Portinari refusing Dante her salutation. We make the mad dog feel he is not really one of us. He is not in our set. Nobody leaves cards at his kennel, and if he put up for the club, he would be blackballed. This seems, on the face of it, to be the Tolstoy and Massingham theory of the common treatment of mad dogs. But, as a fact, it is not a very common treatment of them. When the mad dog enters the club, he is generally blackballed in more abrupt fashion. He is, not to put too fine a point on it, shot. Which is a very shocking thing, according to the theory of these writers. A thing we can thankfully leave to militarists and murderers, even as these Frenchmen. 
Nevertheless, the fact remains that if the French really did behave like mad dogs, or even if they really did behave like murderers, it would come at last to a question of shooting them like mad dogs or hanging them like murderers. And all the nonsense in Bedlam and Utopia has never found an escape from that necessity. What interests me here is the particular escape attempted in this particular passage. Now what does the writer mean by the metaphor of putting the French in quarantine? Quarantine certainly means something. It means putting people in a particular place and forbidding and forcibly preventing their exit from it. Are we to draw a cordon of troops all round France and fight every Frenchman who tries to go abroad? When we so besiege two military empires, of which the militarists really had behaved like mad dogs, these Tolstoyans did not like it at all and said it was a wicked thing called war. I think this cannot be what they mean by quarantine, nor can I seriously think that they mean the mere social ostracism already mentioned, the mere habit of not taking off our hat to any mad dog we may meet. There is only one practical thing they can possibly mean, and that is a matter of morality, and perhaps a new morality, about which I feel considerable curiosity. The only practical parallel to quarantine would be an economic boycott. In the case of the mad dog, in short, the only alternative to shooting him is shutting him up and starving him. Now I am so strangely constituted that I cannot see that starving a dog is more humane than shooting him. I am so darkened with sentimental superstitions that killing a living thing by slow starvation is one of the few things that I would not do, even to a mad dog and I cannot for the life of me see why the humanitarians of the school of Tolstoy and Massingham should think the economic weapon any more humane than the military weapon. The economic weapon would certainly be cruel, granted that it would certainly be effective. I pass over for the moment the question of whether it ever would be effective, and even the fact that in the French case it would almost certainly not be effective. By wisely neglecting industrial progress, and preserving agricultural prosperity, France has largely escaped the degrading dependence which forbids a state to resent a massacre for fear of losing a market. The French have been enabled, in a sense quite special and literal, to fight for the independence of their country. But I am not arguing the French question here, nor does it necessarily arise out of my present text and topic. I am not even sure that the writers meant in this case to crush France by an economic boycott but I know that the same writers have often proposed to crush other countries with such a boycott. And they have always mentioned it with a most mysterious air of moral superiority, as if there were something merciful about this method as compared with the military method. It is this moral attitude of which I cannot make head or tail. I understand the Tolstoyan principle to be that we must only use moral force and not material force. But hunger is just as much of a material force as hitting people is a material force. Supposing both to be thorough and final, it is very much the more cruel of the two. It is also, I need hardly say, very much the more cowardly of the two. For by hypothesis the man who shoots others does risk being shot, whereas the man who starves others does not risk being starved. I do not, in any case, admit that material methods are necessarily worse than moral methods. The man who raves and bullies by a sickbed is using moral force, and using it very villainously. The man who turns him out of the sick room is using material force, and a jolly good thing, too. These people seem to forget that not only can good be done by coercion, but evil can be done by suggestion, and even by persuasion. However, let us assume, for the sake of argument, that a thing is right if it is done by persuasion. But starvation is not persuasion. To lock a man up in a tower and leave him to die by inches is a process which we should hesitate even to describe as suggestion. The course obviously indicated by the principle of pacifism is to go on preaching to Monsieur Poincaré until he becomes a pacifist, in which case we have to look forward to rather long sermons. Now the moral matter which I here desire to have cleared up is at the bottom of many modern evils. The cosmopolitan conspirators who masquerade as Bolshevists, 
the alien financiers who support them in the money markets of the West, the worst type of moneylender who ruins a score of villages in Russia, the worst type of trust capitalist who breaks a score of businesses in America. All these sneaks and bullies have based all their moral repute upon this most amazing and mysterious principle of morals. The notion that so long as a thing is merely an economic action, it cannot be condemned, considered as an ethical action. They tell us repeatedly that the pen is mightier than the sword. We might be allowed to add that the pen is dirtier than the sword. The pen with which Bismarck wrote the Ems forgery was dirtier than the dirtiest sabers of the Prussian guard. And the pen with which Trotsky signed the invitation to foreign capitalists to come in and freeze out the free peasantry was a very much filthier instrument than any instruments of torture used by yellow executioners or red guards. Half the men who have risen to financial dictatorship in the modern European quarrel have risen by destroying families and devastating homes. Only they have done it with bills instead of bombs, and policemen instead of soldiers. Anyone who likes may call this pacifism. Anyone who likes may call it peace. But it is as well that he should clearly understand that some of us do not admit that such pacifism has the faintest pretension to idealism, or that such peace is in any sort of moral fashion superior to any sort of war. We do not think that men who starve dogs are any better than men who shoot them, nor do we think it a sign of hydrophobia that the dog should bite the hand that would steal his food, as much as the hand that would blow out his brains. And by way of making clear the final and catastrophic chasm between my own school and all modern and enlightened schools of morality, I may explain that in this matter I am prepared even to exalt men to the same level as dogs. End of section 21. Section 22 of G.K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. G.K. Chesterton's Newspaper Column, The New Witness, 1922 by G. K. Chesterton. At the Sign of the World's End, Bolshevism and the Black Army, by G. K. Chesterton. The fact that Mr. Bernard Shaw is gratified about Genoa will be taken by many as a sort of symbol or summary of the fact that nobody else is gratified with it. Of course, Mr. Shaw does not rejoice in it as a triumph for the British any more than the French Prime Minister, but for the Bolshevists. In a recent article in the Sunday Pictorial, he describes socialism wiping the floor with the backward and barbarous nations of Western Europe. I do not here dispute whether Genoa was a triumph for Bolshevism, but I do dispute that Bolshevism was a triumph for socialism. Bolshevism was a triumph for slavery and forced labor, managed first theoretically by communism, and now openly by capitalism. But anyhow, his joy is mixed with bitterness for in the same article he breaks out in the queerest way about France and her army, which it seems is a, quote, black army, unquote. This ethnological explanation certainly explains much. Mr. Shaw himself, for instance, has extolled the merits of Carpentier as a pugilist. How much more natural they seem now we know he is a replica of Jack Johnson. The French are Negroes, and presumably have always been Negroes. Their Algerian conquests are the natural return of Africans to Africa. The mystery of Napoleon in Egypt is explained. The phrase sans culotte will be simple to those who realize that Paris is in equatorial Africa. How does so clever a man come to be talking such pitiable nonsense? Let us think. Mr. Bernard Shaw shines as a controversialist in nothing so much as his unaffected good temper. He generally keeps himself above his subject, as it were, by a sort of magnanimous flippancy. He does not allow his subject to provoke him, a point which gives him some advantage over his intellectual equals, such as Mr. H. G. Wells. As no one has been better treated by this genial genius than I, I must say with some regret that there seems to be an exception to the rule. There is one subject that does irritate Mr. Shaw, 
and most of those who think with him, in what must seem a queer and disproportionate fashion, and that is the subject of France. To him that lucidity is a mystery. To this master of paradoxes, its very platitude is a paradox. The reason of this subconscious irritation is natural enough when we think it out. The French are a people who have admittedly maintained through many centuries a certain relative leadership of civilization, chiefly by intelligence and skill. Things that require rapid but detached thinking they do better and quicker than most Europeans, such as military strategy or, for that matter, fencing. Yet they do all this without taking any notice of new religions or new and negative ideals. They will never be vegetarians. They will never be teetotalers. They will never be socialists. They will never be feminists. For those who think such fads are the faiths of the future, France never seems to have made a step toward the future. She seems to be merely marking time, yet she is always in the front rank. She seems to be always doing the old things of the old peasant and the old soldier, but doing the old things so successfully that they seem to be new things. She leaves the paths of progress to right and left of her as byways that would be in her own phrase bag ends. She goes along a highway that is like one of her own straight military highways. That is, it is so monotonous that those marching on it hardly seem to be moving, although they are moving very fast. It is so straight that it seems as if it would never get anywhere, but it gets there all the same. For the straight road always is the shortest and always seems to be the longest. In the matter of the supernatural, for instance, the French have a curious carelessness about anything except an old religion and a still older irreligion. For new religions they care nothing, and for new irreligions even less. They are indeed an extraordinary and exasperating phenomenon. They are something that ought to be left behind and is always in front. Now this is the one paradox that logically throws out and baffles all the Shavian paradoxes. There is much to be said for a winding road full of surprises, but the discovery that the man plodding along the dull road is still ahead is the greatest surprise of all. A man like Mr. Shaw, great as he is, must live by a sectarian sensationalism, crying lo here and lo there the flying paradise being open only to the Tolstoyan or the perfect Wagnerite, or the quintessential Ibsenist. He is naturally annoyed with the sort of civilization that can disregard Tolstoy and do without him, that can ignore Ibsen and outlast him. The Shavian enthusiasms are things of the past because they were things of the future, and his plays are all the more dated because they were post-dated. We can always date a period by its prophecies, especially its unfulfilled prophecies. But the importance of farming and the importance of fighting are never prophesied, but only fulfilled. That a peasant can live when a merchant and his clerks are starving is not something seen by anybody as a vision of the future. It is only something now seen by everybody as a fact of the present. If an army counts for as much 50 years hence as it did 500 years ago and five years ago, that sort of fact will not be predicted it will only be proved. Extraordinary things are always expected, but ordinary things, like arms and agriculture, are never expected, and they always return suddenly, like Ulysses. Now I urge all this by way of excuse for Mr. Shaw, and to cover up the lamentable lapse and loss of temper, otherwise so very unlike him, which led him to drop for a moment into some drivel about the Senegalese and France's, quote, black army. Unquote. It may not be generally known that Foch is a Negro and Joffrey a black gentleman from Senegal. But Mr. Shaw may know it or may believe it. Anger can always find the weak spot in a man's mind. But the excuse for the weakness is that France angers him because France puzzles him. He is puzzled by the fact of a very civilized people being always a very military people. He feels that being military ought to mean being black and barbaric so he tries desperately to believe that it does. But if this be true about militarism and peace, it is still more true about socialism and property. On Shavian principles, all private property ought to be dying, and small, rustic, hole-in-corner private property ought to be dead. As a fact, 
It is the only economic thing that is not either dead or dying. It is the one thing that is thriving in the desolation of Europe. The peasants have succeeded everywhere. They have won back their private land alike, from the revolutionists in Russia and from the reactionaries in Ireland, and in France they have never lost it. That is what makes France so annoying, that the French have put their money on the right horse, though it had been turned out to grass as the old horse. They will never be theoretical vegetarians in thousands of years. They have only already been practical vegetarians in the sense of making better meals out of vegetables in every cottage than we can make in luxurious vegetarian restaurants. They will never have any temperance reform. They only have temperance, and prove it by drinking nothing but wine. They will never really have a woman's movement, having already the most powerful and comfortable women in Europe. Similarly, they will never really be socialists, not even honest socialists like Shaw, far less dishonest socialists like Bronstein, who calls himself Trotsky. For that is the very simple issue which Mr. Shaw ignores in the article in question. He calls the announcement of a commercial compact between the Jews of Russia and Germany the first fight between socialism and the old diplomacy. Surely there had been a previous fight before Lenin himself admitted that Russia is again a capitalist country. Surely Lenin did not accept that slight modification altogether without a fight. But the truth is that he first yielded to something much older than the old diplomacy. He was forced to allow private property to the old peasantry. And then he and Bronstein actually called in the worst kind of private property to crush the best. They openly called in the rich to crush the poor. The Bolshevists themselves explain, in words I could easily quote, that they have tried to destroy the peasantry not by communism, but by capitalism and by all the very vilest of the vile tricks of capitalism, by cornering and conspiracy and undercutting and freezing out. Bolshevism by this time is not merely the capitalism that employs and exploits, but the capitalism that swindles and sweats. In short, there is an even simpler reason for denying that what appeared at Genoa was the first fight of socialism with diplomacy. What appeared at Genoa was not socialism at all. It no longer even pretends to be socialism at all. It is only defended by the Bolshevists themselves as capitalism, and openly on the ground that, quote, capitalism is better than medievalism, end quote. They mean by medievalism, of course, the notion of some moral dignity in man. It would be extraordinary enough that a man of Mr. Shaw's abilities should figure as such a dupe, but in this case we can hardly say he has even the right to be a dupe. We can hardly say that he is even deceived by the Bolshevists, when the Bolshevists are no longer even trying to deceive him. Bronstein and his friends tell Mr. Shaw quite plainly at the top of their voices that their Russia is a capitalist country, that their object is a capitalist object and the worst of capitalist objects, the oppression of the poor, that they are calling in the Rockefellers and Rothschilds of the world to ruin a hard-working populace, and that all this is a thing to be bragged about merely because it is not medieval, or in other words, merely because it is not moral. And all Mr. Shaw can do is to wink at us with a sort of childlike cunning and tell us to admire the subtlety of socialist diplomacy. If it were socialist diplomacy, it would certainly be highly diplomatic socialism. As a fact, it is about as socialist as a soap trust. It is a vulgar trade bargain between the financial Jews who live indifferently on either side of the faded frontier between two dead empires. Financial Jews who fancy that they have done the trick and can afford to throw off the mask. But he still thinks the mask worth worshipping when they no longer think it worth wearing. And the real mystery is not so much that they could deceive him when they wanted to. It is that they cannot undeceive him when they try. End of section 22. Section 23 of G.K. Chesterton's newspaper columns, The New Witness, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adrian Stevens.
G.K. Chesterton's newspaper columns, The New Witness, 1922, by G.K. Chesterton. Section 23. The Mercy of Mr. Arnold Bennett. Mr. Arnold Bennett recently wrote one of his humorous and humane causeries, pleading very properly for social imagination and the better understanding of our fellows. He carried it, however, to the point of affirming, as some fatalists do, that we should never judge anybody in the sense of condemning anybody in connection with his moral conduct. Some time ago the same distinguished writer showed that his mercy and magnanimity were indeed on a heroic scale by reviewing a book of mine and even saying many kind things about it. But to these he added a doubt about whether true intelligence could be consistent with the acceptance of any dogma. In truth, there are only two kinds of people, those who accept dogmas and know it, and those who accept dogmas and don't know it. My only advantage over the gifted novelist lies in my belonging to the former class. I suspect that his unconsciousness of his dogmas extends to an unconsciousness of what he means by a dogma. If it means merely the popular idea of being dogmatic, it might be suggested that saying that all dogmatism is unintelligent is itself somewhat dogmatic, and something of what is true of his veto on dogma is also true of his veto on condemnation, which is really a veto on vetoes. Mr. Arnold Bennett does not darken the question with the dreary metaphysics of determinism. He is far too bright and adroit a journalist for that, but he does make a simple appeal to charity and even Christianity, basing on it the idea that we should not judge people at all, or even blame them at all. Like everybody else who argues thus, he imagines himself to be pleading for mercy and humanity. Like everybody else who argues thus, he is doing the direct contrary. This particular notion of not judging people really means hanging them without trial. It would really substitute for judgment not mercy, but something much more like murder. For the logical process through which the discussion passes is always the same. I have seen it in a hundred debates about fate and free will. First, somebody says, like Mr. Bennett, let us be kinder to our brethren and not blame them for faults we cannot judge. The same casual common sense person says, do you really mean you would let anybody pick your pocket or cut your throat without protest? Then the first man always answers, as Mr. Bennett does, oh no, I would punish him to protect myself and protect society, but I would not blame him because I would not venture to judge him. The philosopher seems to have forgotten that he set out with the idea of being kinder to the cutthroat and the pickpocket. His sense of humour should suggest to him that the pickpocket might possibly prefer to be blamed rather than go to penal servitude for the protection of society. Now, of course, Mr. Bennett is quite right in the most mystical and therefore the most deeply moral sense. We do not know what God knows about the merits of a man, nor do we know what God knows about the needs of a community. A man who poisons his little niece for money may have mysterious motives and excuses we cannot understand, and so he may serve mysterious social purposes we cannot follow. We are not infallible when we think we are punishing criminals, but neither are we infallible when we think we are protecting society. Our inevitable ignorance seems to me to cut both ways, but even in our ignorance, one thing is vividly clear. Mr. Bennett's solution is not the more merciful, but the less merciful of the two. To say that we may punish people, but not blame them, is to say that we have a right to be cruel to them, but not a right to be kind to them. For, after all, blame is itself a compliment. It is a compliment because it is an appeal, and an appeal to a man as a creative artist making his soul. To say to a man, rascal, or villain, in ordinary society, may seem abrupt, but it is also elliptical. It is an abbreviation of a sublime spiritual apostrophe, for which there may be no time in our busy social life. When you meet a millionaire, 
the cornerer of many markets, out at dinner in Mayfair, and greet him, as is your custom, with the exclamation, Scoundrel! You are merely shortening for convenience some such expression as, How can you, having the divine spirit of a man that might be higher than the angels, drag it down so far as to be a scoundrel? When you are introduced at a garden party to a cabinet minister who takes tips on government contracts, and when you say to him, in the ordinary way, scamp, you are merely using the last word of a long moral disquisition, which is, in effect, how pathetic is the spiritual spectacle of this cabinet minister, who being from the first made glorious by the image of God, condescends so far to lesser ambitions as to allow them to turn him into a scamp. It is a mere taking of the tail of a sentence to stand for the rest, like saying, bus for omnibus it is even more like the case of the seventeenth century puritan whose name was something like if jesus had not died for thee thou hadst been damned higgins but who was for popular convenience referred to as damned higgins but it is obvious anyhow that when we call a man a coward we are in doing so asking him how he can be a coward when he could be a hero when we rebuke a man for being a sinner, we imply that he has the powers of a saint. But punishing him for the protection of society involves no regard for him at all. It involves no limit or proportion in the punishment at all. There are some limits to what ordinary men are likely to say that an ordinary man deserves, but there are no limits to what the danger of the community may be supposed to demand. We would not, even if we could, boil the millionaire in oil or skin the poor little politician alive for we do not think a man deserves to be skinned alive for taking commissions on contracts but it is by no means so certain that skinning him alive might not protect the community corruption can destroy communities and torture can deter men at any rate the thing is not so self-evidently useless as it is self-evidently unjust and vindictive we refrain from such fantastic punishments largely because we do have some notion of making the punishment fit the crime and not merely fit the community if the state were the sole consideration it may be inferred a priori that people might be much more cruel and in fact where the state was the sole consideration it was found in experience that they were much more cruel they were much more cruel precisely because they were freed from all responsibilities about the innocence or guilt of the individual i believe that in heathen rome the model of a merely civic and secular loyalty it was a common practice to torture the slaves of any household subjected to legal inquiry if you had remonstrated because no crime had been proved against the slaves the state would have answered in the modern manner we are not punishing the crime, we are protecting the community. Now that example is relevant just now in more ways than one. Of course, I do not mean that this was the motive of all historical cruelties, or that some did not spring from quite an opposite motive, but it was the motive of much tyranny in the heathen world, and in this, as in other things, the modern world has largely become a heathen world, and modern tyranny can find its prototype in the torturing of heathen slaves in two fundamental respects first that the modern world has returned to the test of the heathen world that of considering service to the state and not justice to the individual and second that the modern world like the heathen world is here inflicting it chiefly on subordinate and submerged classes of society on slaves or those who are almost slaves for the heathen state is a servile state, and no one has more of this view of the state than the state socialists. The official labour politician would be the first to say in theory that punishment must not be a moral recompense, but merely a social regulation, and he would be the first to say in practice that it is the poor and ignorant who must be regulated. Doubtless, it is one thing to be regulated and another to be tortured but when once the principle is admitted broadly the progress towards torture may proceed pretty briskly 
in the psychological sphere it is already as bad as it has ever been it may come as a surprise to the humanitarian to learn it but it is none the less true that a mother may undergo moral torture in the last degree when her children are taken from her by brute force and that incident has become so common in the policing of the poor nowadays as hardly to call for notice and that example is particularly relevant to the present argument nobody could pretend that the affectionate mother of a rather backward child deserves to be punished by having all the happiness taken out of her life but anybody can pretend that the act is needed for the happiness of the community nobody will say it was so wicked of her to love her baby that she deserves to lose it but it is always easy to say that some remote social purpose will be served by taking it away thus the elimination of punishment means the extension of tyranny men would not do things so oppressive so long as they were vindictive it is only when punishment is purged of vengeance that it can be as villainous as that for that matter it would be easy to find examples much nearer than this one to the torturing of the roman slaves there is a very close parallel in the third degree as applied by the police to the criminal class on suspicion especially in america for the criminal class is a submerged class like the slaves and it is but an experiment on the nerves in one way instead of another like a preference for the rack rather than the thumbscrew but the point is that it is applied to the criminal type without any proof that it is in this case criminal and the thing is justified not by the criminality of the individual but by the needs of the state the police would answer exactly as the pagans answered we are not punishing the crime we are protecting the community this tyranny is spreading and there is no hope for liberty or democracy until we all demand again with a tongue of thunder the right to be blamed we shall never feel like free men until we assert again our sacred claim to be punished the denunciation of a man for what he chose to do is itself the confession that he chose to do it and it is beneath his dignity to admit that he could have done nothing else the only alternative theory is that we can do nothing but what we do and our rulers can do anything whatever to restrain us compared with that it would be better that roaring mobs should rise all over england uproariously demanding to be hanged End of section 23Section 24 of G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922, by G. K. Chesterton. Section 24. At the Sign of the World's End. The Materialist in the Mask by g k chesterson the old phrase that clericalism is the enemy is natural enough in those who use it but they must at least agree that anti-clericalism is in a rather special sense an enemy and nothing but an enemy it is by definition no more than the enemy of clericalism clerics may have burned anti-clericals but they did not exist only to burn them nevertheless this negative character is not now the chief charge to be brought against such a party nor need it in itself be a charge at all a priesthood is a powerful thing and a man is entitled to think it too powerful and i for one have far more sympathy with the old anti-clericals even when they called themselves atheists than with a certain sort of new anti-clericals who may in a rather special sense be called secularists they are secularists in the sense of professing only to pursue some secular aim in a positive and constructive manner and to attack religion only by accident there are some people of whom this is true and they are worthy of all respect but in the mouths of many i will maintain this constructive pretense is really a piece of cant they really have a negative and destructive enthusiasm in the matter of the christian tradition nor do i blame them for that their negative and destructive cause is much nobler than any of the small and generally servile reforms in favor of which they renounce it. 
If Christianity is a lie, it is certainly a great thundering lie. No man is to be blamed for denouncing what he thinks a thundering lie. But a man is to be blamed for telling small and sniveling lies in defense of his own denunciation. And I honestly think that there is now much more of this sort of humbug on the irreligious than on the religious side. A man who professes a creed confesses a partiality for the creed. When he loves it, he is necessarily partial. But when he hates it, he generally professes to be impartial. He pretends that the thing he hates is obstructing his way to other things, such as education or hygiene or science or social reform. But the kind of man I mean is seldom heard talking about these things for their own sake. No man is less likely to do exactly what he ought to rejoice in doing, occasionally forget the obstacle in admiration of the object. But for him, indeed, the obstacle is the object. No man is less likely to forget the religious question than the irreligious man. No man is less secular than the secularist. Priests and pontiffs are constantly paraded as hypocrites, and many of them have been hypocrites. But it is obvious in this sense that there is no hypocrisy in their pontification. They do not invoke a secular aim for their clerical action. A high church bishop, who is blamed for wearing a meter, does not pretend that he wears a hat that is open at the top for the purpose of ventilation. He does not recommend frequent genuflection as an athletic exercise for the muscles of the legs. A Christian does not say that the sign of the cross is merely educational, because it is merely the sign of addition in algebra. He does not say that baptism is instituted solely for motives of cleanliness, to make sure that every person shall be washed once in his life. Yet this would be an exact parallel to many of the political pretexts for unmistakably anti-clerical action. When the small group of fanatical anti-clericals ruled in France, for instance, they drove from the country a multitude of monks and nuns. There cannot be the slightest doubt, for anybody with the rudiments of common sense, that they did it because they hated monks and nuns and all they stood for. In their more sincere moments, they would probably have answered that the monks and nuns hated them. But, however this may be, the monks did not profess that they lived together only from motives of economy, like people in a boarding house, or that they kept the hours to encourage businessmen in the practice of punctuality, or that they shaved themselves to encourage the trade in razors or scissors but men full of a partisan passion quite as concentrated and peculiar as theirs did profess that they destroyed monasteries only to encourage schools, or that they interfered with the church only when it interfered with the republic, or that they were not persecuting the priest but only protecting the citizen. It is true, in the French case, the pretense of impartiality was sometimes broken by the boiling realism of the French temperament. A man who had been intoning with classic calm the formula that the Republic had no enemies except the enemies of the truth, of the justice, and of the humanity, would say with a sudden snarl like a wild beast, Nous avons chassé ce Jésus Christ. Anyone who understands that contrast has begun to understand France. In England, where conventions are at once less stiff and less brittle, the cant is at once less conscious and more complete. When there was a dispute about a war memorial in my own little town, the people who wanted a cross said they wanted a cross because it was a cross. They did not say they wanted it because so simple a shape would be easier to make or cheaper to pay for. But the people who hated to have a cross, for certain sincere reasons of religious origin, did talk about having something cheaper and easier, and then developed a sudden taste for a town clock, or represented themselves as thirsting day and night for a drinking fountain. All Europe is thus suffering from suppressed religious zeal. The case of the Bolshevists, who have undertaken their last attack on Christian Russia in the name of economy, is but one of hundreds that could be found all over the continent. Everyone knows by this time that in Bolshevist Russia, as much as anywhere else, there is at present a class living in comparative luxury while others starve. It is not that class that will be deprived of its luxuries. Whether it be the official class enjoying the expenses of officialism, or the new capitalist class introduced by the recent compromise with capitalism, their profits and their pleasures will be quite safe. But poor priests who could not possibly be luxurious will be attacked, and even rich priests who were luxurious will not be attacked because of their luxury. They will be attacked by the anti-clericals for being clericals, and all that I complain of is that the anti-clericals will not say so. Someday, people may admit psychology into fact as well as fiction. Someday, 
there may be a little realism in the newspapers dealing with public life, as well as in the novels dealing with private life. Then we may hear something of the type that really is Bolshevist and generally is Jewish. Now there is a type, generally sound at heart though not very clear in the head, that does become an atheist from a vague idea that it is part of being a revolutionist. Of him, we can really ask why he needlessly adds this inhuman negation to his very human hopes. But there is another type, less common but more clear-headed, who has really become a revolutionist only as part of being an atheist. It is no good to ask him why he tacks on atheism to his idealism, because he would never have had any idealism except as something tacked on to atheism. His materialism is the main thing. He would not even be a Marxian, except as a way of being a materialist. It is vain to ask this particular type of man why he should especially exhort the poor to attack the priest, who is often poorer than they are. It was only in order to attack the priest that he ever troubled about the poor. This special sort of young Jew is rare even among revolutionists. But though he is rare, he is real, and he still awaits a realistic study. Nobody has put the truth about him into even a novel, let alone a newspaper. Yet he is a strangely interesting, though a strangely depressing type. The first two facts that strike, and even shock us about him, are that he is really young, and that there is about him something which is nowhere else found in combination with youth. We feel something like the phrase in the poem, the wind that blows between the worlds, it cut him to the bone. His soul is homeless. He talks of economics, but he does not mean what the word means, the laws of a home. He talks of psychology, but he does not mean what the word means, the study of a soul. He knows his own religion is dead, and he hates ours for being alive. His eyes are bright with something other than we mean when we speak of eyes like stars. And if we look we shall see that they are like falling stars, meteoric stones drifting and disconnected, wandering and falling through the void in vain. End of section 24 Section 25 of G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns The New Witness, 1922 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922, by G. K. Chesterton. At the Sign of the World's End, The Boredom of the Broad-Minded. If I acknowledge here a friendly criticism by Mr. Bernard Shaw, touching a criticism of my own, which was also meant to be friendly, it is not for the purpose of pursuing the political question. I am not sure that I disagree with his second article, or indeed that he now agrees with his first one, if he only means that a serious problem is raised by the British and French use of colored colonial troops. His position is quite reasonable, but it is not reasonable to talk contemptuously of France and her black army far less reasonable than it would be to talk of england and her black empire but indeed it is rather curious that mr shaw should talk so contemptuously of black things at all for the sentence in his article which really interests me and which i take here as a text for a larger discussion happens to run as follows as to pretending that there is any greater difference between french and german human nature than between Surrey and Middlesex human nature, je m'en fichte, and I think Mr. Chesterton ought to s'en fichter too. If I were to say that there was no more difference between black and white human nature than between French and German human nature, I should have disposed of all his complaints about a black army at a blow. But I should also be talking nonsense, as he is talking nonsense. It is his whole point to dwell upon the deadly difference between an African and a European, at the very moment when he forbids me to see any difference between a Prussian and a Parisian. Anyhow, there is a great difference in both cases. If Mr. Shaw is ignorant of it, he is ignorant of a fact. If he despises it, he despises a fact. In one sense, of course, a Frenchman and a German have the same human nature, because they are both human. 
in exactly the same sense the black soldier and the white soldier have the same human nature because they are both human if i have no right to distinguish between two nations of a continent he has no right to distinguish between two regiments of an army but we shall continue to distinguish in both cases if we happen to know anything about any of them but though i have taken mr shaw's sentence as a text in this matter of international identification i do not here make it a matter of controversy with mr shaw i do not do so because i do not think it at all characteristic of him he has any number of ideas that are really his own some of them true and none of them trite when he compared agnostics dissecting animals to augurs examining entrails he was in a free and refreshing spirit rebelling against his age generally the best thing that a man of genius can do when he created the conventional colonel who told the new woman that if she couldn't behave like a lady she must behave like a gentleman he was really being unconventional but all this international unity and harmony and oneness and men being the same in spite of flags and frontiers is not a case of his rebelling against a convention of his age in that case he was merely drifting with his age and accepting its convention that convention a cosmopolitan sentimentalism that he heard from a hundred other socialists and anarchists the notion that there is no great difference between french and german is simply something he swallowed in his youth as he might have swallowed darwinism so far as it ever meant anything it meant in socialist circles that there is not much difference between french jews and german jews left to himself he would have been a master of the comedy of contrasts including international contrasts indeed he devoted a whole play to showing the vital difference between english human nature and irish human nature real as it is it is a fine shade compared with that between french human nature and german human nature i will not discuss so huge a contrast but only mention one thing relevant to all that is rational in mr shaw's complaint the french are vindictive and the germans are not vindictive the germans never really enjoy killing unless they are wantonly killing people who have never hurt them they call it being a conquering race now i believe all that notion of there being no national differences is simply the effect of being tired when the eye is very weary it can hardly distinguish between blue and gray and it is natural that it should not distinguish between the sky blue of the french army and the field gray of the prussian as fatigue fell slowly on the modern mind it relapsed into the facile simplification of saying that everything was pretty much the same after all it applied the method to man and woman to adults and children to east and west moderns have long applied it to right and wrong and are on the verge of applying it to right and left it is much easier for a tired man to say that these things are all the same than to see where they are really different it is much easier to say that it is six to one and half a dozen to the other than to work out the difference in decimals or vulgar fractions it is much easier to say that it will be all the same a hundred years hence than really to make up our minds on which side we are to act twenty minutes hence we all say these things when we are feeling slack but there is no particular philosophy or philanthropy about feeling slack therefore i have no respect for the modern unities or universalities and superiorities to all distinctions for i think they are merely a mark of low vitality or at the very best of incipient slumber that alone would show that such universalism is not native to anybody so lively as g b s it is only one of the victorian prejudices from which he does not happen to have emancipated himself i mean it as a compliment to his vitality to say that he is still emancipating himself his second thoughts about peasants and soldiers like his second thoughts about frenchmen and niggers are much more sensible than his first but they do not touch my reasons for remonstrating against loose and violent denunciations of france i never talked about the infallibility of peasants or soldiers i never denied the possibility of peasants having their limitations i never said that a commonwealth must consist entirely of peasants 
france is a country consisting largely of peasants but if the enemy of france will make a list of all other social types that he thinks necessary besides peasants he will find that he has answered himself when he has marshaled all his hierarchy of art philosophy science jurisprudence architecture and every talent or craft that can exalt a city he will find there is not a single one of them in which france has not frequently led the world all these leaders were not peasants but they were all products of a predominantly peasant culture and often actually of a peasant class but this is only a parenthesis my business here is with the common modern generalization about internationalism and i repeat that i have no respect for the man who swallows the world whole for i believe he only swallows it because he is yawning in short there is one thing of which j men think with all the gallic vivacity of mr bernard shaw and that is the whole of this modern business about there being no real difference between nations or between sexes or between religions i am bored with it because it is itself only an expression of boredom i readily agree of course that something that sounds rather like it may be a real expression of brotherhood i not only accept but i rather monotonously affirm the very ancient doctrine of the equality of men that is the overwhelming supremacy of the things in which men agree over things in which they differ but the modern humanitarians are not thinking about the things in which men agree if they were they would be talking about the real and positive things in which men really do agree for instance they would be always talking about the foreknowledge of death which is one of the most essential elements in the equality of men but they are exactly the sort of things that such intellectuals almost invariably ignore death is a thing which they first dismiss as morbid and then make a hundred times more morbid by making it secretive they make fun of the poor for making a fuss about funerals and will not learn that this is the right way to humanize the most tremendous of human mysteries or again the natural love of mothers for their own babies is really a universal human fact but when we talk about it these modern critics always scoff at it as a piece of sentimentalism and point out the superiority of some sort of clockwork mother or labor-saving incubator worked by an official now while it is relatively true that mothers and the view of mothers may be the same all over the world it is stark staring nonsense to say that officials and the view of officials are the same all over the world when once we pass from the primitive sentiment itself to its place and practical proportions in any social or official scheme we shall find the widest and wildest contrasts a man has only got to go and be some such officious official first in germany and then in france to find out the fact for himself even in germany he will live and learn in france he will learn but not live i am therefore convinced that this sort of simplification is not fraternity but simply fatigue it is as i have suggested something like the case of dim eyes that can no longer distinguish different colors or dulled and deafened ears that can no longer distinguish different notes it is not because the varieties are not real but because they are too real to be realized it is because they are too towering too challenging too loaded with memories and too complex with controversies to be grasped by the very wits of capitalism in decay the assimilation is really a dissolution the dissolution of death in contrast with the differentiation of life it is the slipping back into that slimy inland sea that monstrous pool somewhere in the dark heart of asia which buddhists call nirvana and christians call nothing end of section twenty five section twenty six of g k chesterton's newspaper columns the new witness nineteen twenty two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by e a gillis g k chesterton's newspaper columns the new witness nineteen twenty two by g k chesterton 
Section 26 Stonehenge and a Modern Myth Agnosticism, the ancient confession of ignorance, was a singularly sane and healthy thing so far as it went. Unfortunately, it has not gone as far as the 20th century. It has declared in all ages, as a heathen chief declared in the Dark Ages, that the life of a man is like the flight of a bird across a firelit room, because we know nothing of whence it comes or whither it goes. It would seem natural to apply it not only to man, but to mankind. But the moderns do not apply the same principle, but the very opposite principle. They specialize in the unknown origins and in the unknown future. They dwell on the prehistoric and on the post-historic or prophetic and neglect only the historic. They will give a most detailed description of the habits of the bird when he was a sort of paradectile, only faintly to be traced in a fossil. They will give an equally detailed description of the habits of the bird a hundred years hence, when he shall have turned into a superbird or the dove of universal peace. But the bird in the hand is worth far less to them than the two mysterious birds in these two impenetrable bushes. They will publish a portrait with life, letters, and table talk of the missing link, although he is missing. They will publish a plan and documented history of how the social revolution happened, though it has not happened yet. It is the men who are not missing and the revolutions that have happened that they have rather a habit of overlooking. Anyone who has argued, for instance, with the young Jewish intellectuals who are the brain of Bolshevism knows that their whole system turns on the two pivots of the prehistoric and the prophetic. They talk of the communism of prehistoric ages as if it were a thing like the Crusades in the Middle Ages. Not even a probable conjecture, but a proved and familiar fact. They will tell you exactly how private property arose in primitive times, just as if they had been there, and then they will take one gigantic leap over all human history and tell you about the inevitable communism of the future. Nothing seems to matter unless it is either new enough to be foretold or old enough to be forgotten. Mr. H. G. Wells has hit off his human habit in the account of a very human character. The American girl who glorifies Stonehenge in his last novel. I do not make Mr. Wells responsible for her opinions, though she is an attractive person and much too good for her Lothario. But she interests me here because she typifies very truly another variation upon the same tendency. To the prehistoric and the post-historic must be added a third thing, which may be called the unhistoric. I mean the bad teaching of real history that such intelligent people so often suffer. She sums up exactly what I mean when she says humorously that Stonehenge has been kept from her, that Notre Dame is far less important and that this is the real starting point of the Mayflower. Now, the Mayflower is a myth. It is an intensely interesting example of a real modern myth. I do not mean, of course, that the Mayflower never sailed, any more than I admit that King Arthur never lived or that Roland never died. I do not mean that the incident had no historic interest, or that the men who figured in it had no heroic qualities any more than I deny that Charlemagne was a great man because the legend says he was two hundred years old, any more than I deny that the resistance of Roman Britain to the heathen invasion was valiant and valuable because the legend says that Arthur at Mount Badon killed nine hundred men with his own hand. 
I mean that there exists in millions of modern minds a traditional image or vision called the Mayflower, which has far less relation to the real facts than Charlemagne's 200 years or Arthur's 900 corpses. Multitudes of people in England and America, as intelligent and sympathetic as the young lady in Mr. Wells's novel, think of the Mayflower as an origin or archetype, like the Ark, or at least the Argo. Perhaps it would be an exaggeration to say that they think the Mayflower discovered America. They do really talk as if the Mayflower populated America. Above all, they talk as if the establishment of New England had been the first formative example of the expansion of England. They believe that English expansion was a Puritan experiment, and that an expansion of Puritan ideas was also the expansion of what have been claimed as English ideas, especially ideas of liberty. The Puritans of New England were champions of religious freedom, seeking to found a newer and freer state beyond the sea, and thus becoming the origin and model of modern democracy. All this betrays a lack of exactitude. It is certainly nearer to exact truth to say that Merlin built the castle at Camelot by magic, or that Roland broke the mountains in pieces with his unbroken sword for at least the old fables are faults on the right side. They are symbols of the truth and not of the opposite of the truth. They described Roland as brandishing his unbroken sword against the Moslems, but not in favor of the Moslems. And the New England Puritans would have regarded the establishment of real religious liberty exactly as Roland would have regarded the establishment of the religion of Mahon. The fables described Merlin as building a palace for a king and not a public hall for the London School of Economics. And it would be quite as sensible to read the Fabian politics of Mr. Sidney Webb into the local kingships of the Dark Ages as to read anything remotely resembling modern liberality into the most savage of all the savage theological frenzies of the 17th century. Thus, the Mayflower is not merely a fable, but is much more false than fables generally are. The revolt of the Puritans against the Stuarts was really a revolt against religious toleration. I do not say the Puritans were never persecuted by their opponents. But... I do say to their great honor and glory that the Puritans never descended to the hypocrisy of pretending for a moment that they did not mean to persecute their opponents. And in the main, their quarrel with the Stuarts was that the Stuarts would not persecute those opponents enough. Not only was it then the Catholics who were proposing toleration, but it was they who had already actually established toleration in the state of Maryland before the Puritans began to establish the most intolerant sort of intolerance in the state of New England. And if the fable is fabulous touching the emancipation of religion, it is yet more fabulous touching the expansion of empire. That had been started long before either New England or Maryland by Raleigh, who started it in Virginia. Virginia is still perhaps the most English of the states, certainly more English than New England. And it was also the most typical and important of the states, almost up to Lee's last battle in the wilderness. But I have only taken the Mayflower as an example of the general truth, and in a way the truth has its consoling side. Modern men are not allowed to have any history. But at least... Nothing can prevent men from having legends. We have thus before us, in a very true and typical modern picture, the two essential parts of modern culture. It consists, 
first of false history and second of fancy history. What the American tourist believed about Plymouth Rock was untrue. What she believed about Stonehenge was only unfounded. The popular story of primitive man cannot be proved. The popular story of Puritanism can be disproved. I can fully sympathize with Mr. Wells and his heroine in feeling the imaginative stimulus of mysteries like Stonehenge. But the imagination springs from the mystery. That is, the imagination springs from the ignorance. It is the very greatness of Stonehenge that there is very little of it left. It is its chief feature to be featureless. We are very naturally and rightly moved to mystical emotions about signals from so far away along the path of the past, but part of the poetry lies in our inability really to read the signals. And this is what gives an interest and even an irony to the comparison half-consciously invoked by the American lady herself when she asked, What's Notre Dame to this? And the answer that should be given to her is, Notre Dame, compared to this, is true. It is history. It is humanity. It is what really happened. What we know has really happened. What we know is really happening still. It is the central fact of your own civilization, and it is the thing that has really been kept from you. Notre Dame is not a myth. Notre Dame is not a theory. Its interest does not spring from ignorance, but from knowledge, from a culture complicated with a hundred controversies and revolutions. It is not featureless, but carved into an incredible forest and labyrinth of fascinating features, any one of which we could talk about for days. It is not great because there is little of it, but great because there is a great deal of it. It is true that though there is a great deal of it, Puritans may not be allowed to see a great deal in it. Whether they were those brought over in the Mayflower or only those brought up on the Mayflower. But that is not the fault of Notre Dame, but of the extraordinary evasion by which such people can dodge to right or left of it, taking refuge in things more recent or things more remote. Notre Dame, on its merely human side, is medieval civilization, and therefore not a fable or a guess, but a great, solid, determining part of modern civilization. It is the whole modern debate about guilds, for such cathedrals were built by the guilds. It is the whole modern question of religion and irreligion, for we know what religion it stands for, while we really have not a notion what religion Stonehenge stands for. A Druid temple is a ruin, and a Puritan ship by this time may well be called a wreck. But a church is a challenge, and that is why it is not answered. End of section 26. Recording by Ian Gillis. Section 27 of G.K. Chesterton's newspaper columns, The New Witness, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arden. G.K. Chesterton's newspaper columns, The New Witness, 1922, by G.K. Chesterton. The Evolution of the Slave, by G.K. Chesterton. A very curious and interesting thing has recently happened in America. There has suddenly appeared an organized political attack on Darwinian evolution, led by an old demagogue appealing entirely to the ideals of democracy. I mean no discredit to Mr. Bryan in calling him a demagogue, for I should have been far more heartily on his side in the days when he was a demagogue than in the days when he was a diplomatist. 
He was a much wiser man when he refused to allow the financiers to crucify humanity on a golden cross than when he consented to allow the Kaiser to crucify it on an iron cross. The movement is religious and therefore popular, but it is Protestant and therefore provincial. Its opponents, the old guard of materialism, will of course do their best to represent it as something like the village that voted the earth was flat. But there is one sharp difference, which is the point of the whole position. If an ignorant man went about saying that the earth was flat, the scientific man would promptly and confidently answer, oh nonsense, of course it's round. He might even condescend to give the real reasons, which I believe are quite different from the current ones. But when the private citizen rushes wild-eyed down the streets of Heliopolis, Nebraska, calling out, have you heard the news? Darwin's wrong. The scientific man does not say, oh nonsense, of course he's right. He says tremulously, not entirely wrong, surely not entirely wrong, and we can draw our conclusions. But I believe myself there is a deeper and more democratic force behind this reaction, and I think it worthy of further study. I recently heard a debate on that American system of class privilege, which we call for convenience prohibition, and I was very much amused by one argument that was advanced in its favor. A very intelligent young American, a Rhodes Scholar from Oxford, advanced a thesis that prohibition was not a violation of liberty because if it were fully established, its victims would never know what they had lost. If a generation of total abstainers could once grow up without the desire for drink, they would not be conscious of any restraint on their freedom. The argument is ingenious and promising, and opens up a wide field of application. Thus, if I happen to find it convenient to keep miners or other proletarians permanently underground, I have only to make sure that all their babies are born in pitch darkness, and they will certainly never imagine the light of day. My action, therefore, will not only be just and benevolent in itself, but will obviously involve not even the faintest infringement of the ideal of freedom. Or if I merely kidnap all the babies from all the mothers in the country, it is obvious that the infants will not remember their mothers, and in that sense will not miss them. There is therefore no reason why I should not adopt this course, and even if I hide the babies from their mothers by locking them up in boxes, I shall not be violating the principle of liberty, because the babies will not understand what I have done. Or to take a comparison even closer in many ways, there is an ordinary social problem like dress. I come to the conclusion that ladies spend too much money on dress, that it is a social evil because families suffer from the extravagance, and rivalries and seductions distract the state. I therefore decree on the lines of prohibitionist logic that the law shall forbid anybody to wear any clothes at all. Nobody who grows up naked, according to this theory, will ever have any regrets for beauty or dignity or decency, and therefore will have suffered no loss. I cannot sufficiently express my admiration for the extraordinary simplicity which can smooth the path of Prussianism with this large, elementary, and satisfactory principle. So long as we tyrannize enough, we are not tyrannizing at all. And so long as we steal enough, our victims will never know what has been stolen. Seriously, everybody knows that the rich planning the oppression of the poor will never lack a sycophant to act as a sophist, but I never dreamed that I should live to enjoy so crude and stark and startling a sophistry as this. But the last example I gave, that of the normality of clothes or of nakedness, has a further relevance in this connection. What is really at the back of the minds of the people who say these strange things is one very simple error. They imagine that the drinking of fermented liquor has been an artifice and a luxury, something odd like the strange self-indulgences praised by the decadent poets. This is simply an accident of the ignorance of history and humanity. Drinking fermented liquor is not a fashion like wearing a green carnation. It is a habit like wearing clothes. It is one of the habits that are indeed man's second nature, if indeed they are not his first nature. Wine is purest and healthiest in the highest civilization, just as clothing is most complete in the highest civilization. But there is nothing to show that the savage has not shed the clothes of a higher civilization, retaining only the ornaments, as a good many fashionable people in our own civilization seem to be doing now. And there is nothing to show that ruder races who brew their native beers in Africa or Polynesia have not lost the art of brewing something better, just as prohibitionist America, before our very eyes, has left off brewing Christian beer and taken to drinking fermented wood pulp and methylated spirit. The very example of modern America falling from better to baser drinks under a dismal taboo is a perfect model of the way in which civilizations have relapsed into savagery. 
and produce the savages we know. But the point is that drink, like dress, is the rule, and the exceptions only prove the rule. There are individuals who for personal and particular reasons are right to drink no liquor but water, just as there are individuals who have to stay in bed and wear no clothes but bedclothes. There have been sects of Muslims, and there have been sects of Adamites. There have been, as I have said, barbarized peoples fallen so far from civilization as to wear grotesque garments or none, or to drink bad beer or none. But nobody has ever seen primitive man naked and drinking water. He is a myth of the modern mythologists. Man, as Aristotle saw long ago, is an abnormal animal whose nature it is to be civilized. In so far as he ever becomes uncivilized, he becomes unnatural and even artificial. Now at the back of all this, of course, the real difference is religious. I only take this one case of what is called temperance for the sake of the wider philosophy that underlies it. When my young American friend talked to the next generation growing up without the desire for alcohol, he had at the back of his mind a certain idea. It is the idea which I have just seen expressed by another American in a highbrow article, in the words, evolution does not stand still. We are not finished. The world is not finished. What it means is that the nature of man can be modified to suit the convenience of particular men, and this would certainly be very convenient. If the rich man wants the miners to live underground, he may really breed for it a new race as blind as bats and owls. If he finds it cheaper to run the schools and school inspections on atomite principles, he can hope to produce atomites not merely as a sect but as a species. And the same will be true of teetotalism or vegetarianism. Nature, having evolved man, who is an ale-drinking animal, may now evolve a superman, or a sub-man, who shall be a water-drinking animal. Having risen from a monkey, who eats nuts to a man who eats mutton, he may rise yet higher by eating nuts again. Thinking people, of course, know that all that is nonsense. They know there is no such constant flux of adaption. So far from saying that the evolution of man has not finished, they will point out that, as far as we know, it has not begun. In all the 5,000 years of recorded history, and in all the prehistoric indications before it, there is not a shadow or suspicion of movement or change in the human biological type. Even evolution, let alone natural selection, is only a conjecture about things unknown, compared with the broad daylight of things known in all those thousands of years. The only difference is that evolution seems a probable conjecture, and natural selection is on the face of it an extravagantly improbable one. All this, which is obvious to thinking people, has at last become obvious even to the most unthinking, and that is the meaning of the attack on Darwinism in America and the battle of Mr. Bryan against the missing link. The secret is out. The obscurantism of the professors is over. Those of us who have humbly hammered on this point from time to time suddenly find ourselves hammering on an open door. For these changes almost always come suddenly, which is alone enough to show that human history at least has never been merely an evolution. As Darwinism came with a rush, so anti-Darwinism has come with a rush, and just as people who accepted evolution could not be held back from embracing natural selection, so it is likely enough that many, who now see reason to reject natural selection, will not be stopped in their course till they have also rejected evolution. They will merely have a vague but angry conviction that the professors have been kidding them, as they had before that the parsons have been kidding them, but behind all this there will be a very real moral and religious reaction, the meaning of which is what I have described in this article. It is the profound popular impression that scientific materialism, at the end of its hundred years, is found to have been used chiefly for the oppression of the people. Of this, the most evident example is that evolution itself can be offered as something able to evolve a people who can be oppressed. As in the argument about prohibition, it will offer to breed slaves to produce a new race indifferent to its rights. Morally, the argument is quite indistinguishable from justifying assassination by promising to bring up children as suicides who will prefer to be poisoned. End of section 27 Recording by Arden Section 28 of G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns The New Witness, 1922 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christopher Gilson. G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922, by G. K. Chesterton, 
Section 28 At the Sign of the World's End An Englishman Looks at the Jew by G. K. Chesterton In one respect, Mr. T. W. H. Crossland has a right to be regarded as a representative Englishman under the modern conditions of England. He has two qualities that are both national and popular in the modern phase of our nation and our populace. First, he has prejudices rather than principles, and second, those prejudices are vitalized by a sense of humor. Prejudices are sometimes very valuable, but they are only valuable to a people that has lost its enlightenment and is left to hold its traditions in the dark. In that lack of enlightenment, the sense of humor is a sort of heat that supplies the place of light. I do not mean this in contempt of Mr. Crossland, for there is very much the same purely instinctive intelligence in Charles Dickens. Dickens managed to reach humanity without history or philosophy, and that is not a small achievement. But Dickens did suffer from his lack of true enlightenment, and never more than when it made him the dupe of false enlightenment. There could not be a better example than his attitude to the Jews. He produced Fagin by instinct, and Fagin is still alive. He produced Raya to order, and Raya was born dead. In this sense, it is true that the Victorians were limited, not by experience, but by convention. They saw much more than they allowed themselves to say. Indeed, the story in which Raya occurs, our mutual friend, has always seemed to me, in this respect, quite a curiosity of literature. Consciously or not, the author is a crypto-anti-Semite. The story has stuck into it, this single dummy labelled an honest Jew, who is not a Jew at all, because he is not a human being at all. And at the same time, the story simply swarms with dishonest Jews, who are too dishonest even to call themselves Jews. Veneering is obviously a Jew. Lamley is obviously a Jew. Fascination Fledgeby is obviously a Jew. All Lamley's business friends with their thick rings and gold pencil cases are obviously Jews. I do not know whether it was in innocence or in irony that Dickens refrained from calling them Jews. But in this, as in other respects, there was a lack of lucidity and order about the instinctive ironies of men like Dickens and it is a compliment to Mr. Crossland to say that he shares with Dickens a defect. He shows both the advantage and the disadvantages in his book on the Jews, The Fine Old Hebrew Gentleman. The disadvantage of a man who has not cleared his thoughts with theory is not merely that he acts on prejudice in practice, it is also that his mind will tend to be a tangle of prejudices, old and new, with one prejudice positively obstructing the practical utility of another. Thus, while Mr. Crossland tells the truth about a man like Mond, he is unable even to see the truth about a man like Disraeli. Merely because it is a Tory tradition to be duped by Disraeli, he is indulgent to that aggressive alien immigrant upon the astonishing ground that he made speeches at diocesan conferences I feel sure Sir Alfred Mond would make any number of speeches at diocesan conferences and prove in the blandest fashion that he was on the side of the angels. Similarly, he has slightly to soften the story of Marconi merely to suit the lingering legend, which seems so pathetic today, that Mr. Lloyd George was a great military patriot who won the war. But here again Mr. Crossland's powerful genius for humour comes to the rescue. It is indeed an admirable example of his method. In the very act of verbally minimizing the Marconi connection, he insinuates an admirable thrust of irony by referring to the old story of the servant girl and the very little baby. By that mere allusion, he dashes into dust all the excuses of the politicians, even the excuses that he seems himself to be suggesting. He could hardly imply more sardonically the essential ethic of common sense, that the crossing of such a borderline of conduct is never a matter of degree. Honour is not judged by the size of bribes any more than chastity by the size of children. 
But that passage is typical in another way of the curious and interesting personality of Mr. Crossland. He is the representative Englishman in that his humour is real, but he is also the representative modern Englishman in that his humour is not free. He has not been allowed to use it freely. He has been no freer than a thousand other men in Fleet Street who have had to live in fear of the libel law and the sack. The hypocrisy of our public life has hardened his humour into sneering or driven it to die away in mere grumbling like that of a mob dispersed by cavalry. Hence arise two characteristics in his literary style which make it exceedingly hard to criticise. One is mystification. There are passages of impenetrable darkness in which it is impossible to discover exactly what the writer does seriously mean in the labyrinth of asides and allusions and slangy exaggerations and satirical understatements, many of them very funny of their kind, but the best in this kind are but shadows. The other quality which goes with it is irresponsibility, and there also, alas, the voice is very largely the voice of the English people, in the sense of the English populace. Never for one moment do we feel that this Englishman, however justly angry at being ruled by aliens, is claiming any real right to rule himself. He would as soon claim to control the weather whenever he grumbles at the weather. He is not a democrat, not a citizen, and therefore not a ruler, nor one desiring to be a ruler. He is a spectator. His grumbling is like the groaning of the crowd around the scaffold of Charles I. His laughter is like the laughter of a patient mob waiting to see the Lord Mayor's show. He is a type of nation of spectators who have looked on at the spectacle of their own history. The significance of this book about the Jews is that the man and the mob are now thoroughly annoyed. At the beginning, the author faces fully and frankly the profoundly Jewish character of the South African War. The point is essential, if only as showing how the Jewish problem cuts across all our party divisions and can never really be used as a party cry. The Morning Post has shown some creditable courage in printing facts about the Jewish problem that nobody else would print. But the Morning Post was as much a tool of the Jews though an unconscious tool, when it supported the destruction of the Boer nation, as is any liberal paper today in supporting the ordinary liberal policy of ruining the Polish nation. Since the Liberal Party seems to have now devoted itself chiefly to the defence of plutocracy, to the toleration of bribery, to the establishment of a Jewish oligarchy over a subject race of Arabs, and to being on the side of the big battalions of Prussia and Russia, against the idealism of the Poles, it is only fair to remember that the other party was quite as much to blame, or rather more to blame. The Conservative Party would hardly have been in existence at all without Disraeli at the head of it, and Rothschild at the back of it. The one great occasion on which the real imperialist really waved the Union Jack and called specially on the British Empire was a war waged in the interests of German Jews. I have already noted that this realism is rather relaxed in dealing with Disraeli, and to some extent in dealing with the Marconi case, and indeed it is the defect of this instinctive and humorous style that is not easy to see upon what principle the pressure varies in lightnings. Sometimes the author is inclined to let the Jews off lightly, where the common sense of the whole world condemns them most decisively. He is inclined to palliate that usury which is confessed by their own reformers and condemned by their own religion. And this, I fancy, merely from some obscure subconscious instinct that an Englishman must defend commercialism against a vague enemy that is really Catholicism. On these things of common morals and common sense, he is really too Semitic in his sympathy, though not being sufficiently Christian in his philosophy. But, on the other hand, while he excuses Jews for things which I and everybody else condemn them, he has no hesitation about condemning them for things about which I, for one, am decidedly doubtful. He seems to accept the protocols of the elders of Zion, not so much without doubt, 
as without thought, and I have always been very careful not to base my own case against Jewish plutocracy on the protocols. There may have been such a document written by such a group, but I am certain that most of the harm done by Jews in the world is not done as part of such a conspiracy. If the passages quoted were really written by Jews, then the Jewish psychology is indeed a thing apart, for I confess I cannot conceive Europeans writing about themselves, we have befooled and corrupted the rising generation of the Gentiles by educating them in principles and theories known by us to be thoroughly false. There is only one sentence that sounds to me human. Politics have nothing in common with morals. That is so piteously stupid that it might be said by a man, and even by a German Jew, if he were a very German Jew. But assuming that Mr. Crossland is right about the protocols, there is one lesson that he and his school might really learn from them. The elders of Zion distinctly say that they have no preference for revolutionary, over-reactionary ideals, and are as ready to be capitalist as communist. And anyhow, we all know that the Jewish problem was capitalist long before it was communist. The same truth is involved in a quotation from a much higher authority, a poem by Mr. Zangwill, full of the fine self-criticism of a patriot. Of Mr. Zangwill's injudicious intervention in a Christian problem of war, I think much as Mr. Crossland does. But I do not think it just or generous to quote Mr. Zangwill's criticisms of his people against him or them. It is the glory of a people to produce a prophet who can rebuke it. In this case, anyhow, the important words run, Taking all colours or none, lying a fox in the covert, leaping an ape in the sun. Mr. Crossland really speaks for those who hardly noticed that the Jew was taking all colours until, as he puts it, the colour they took was red. Then the English Tory began to see red. He forgot that the same chameleon had taken the colours of true blue and primrose yellow, and because his view is thus partial and entangled in prejudices, there is something a little helpless about his belated anti-Semitism. The Englishman is hardly enough of a European to defend England against a European evil, for here, in the last resort, I confess myself much more troubled about the English problem than about the Jewish problem. Fascinating as is the figure of Mr. Zangwill, my imagination is more and more haunted by the image of Mr. Crossland. I seem to see, as the type of my own nation, a tragic figure, deceived and thwarted in a thousand ways, fed on prejudices, starved of religion and rational codes, finding its inspiration in instinct, but still keeping as the gift of God and the glory of the island blood, the unconquerable love of country and the power to jest. End of section 28、section、29、of、GK、Chesterton's newspaper columns, The New Witness, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arden. G. K. Chesterton's newspaper columns, The New Witness, 1922, by G. K. Chesterton. Section 29. On what might have been, by G. K. Chesterton. I once met a mystic who talked about things that were so great that they had never been able to exist. I also met a priest who suggested, if I understood him rightly. That liberty and omniscience could be reconciled, because God knows not only the future that will come, but all the other futures that would come if a finger turned to right or left. And I have often thought that a new sort of romances might be written upon such hints as were here given by the mystic and the priest. They would be a new kind of historical novels. They might rather be described as unhistorical novels. They would be detailed descriptions of the wild and wonderful things that never happened. Many of them, for that matter, very nearly happened. For instance. There was the wild wedding of Mary, Queen of Scots, with Don John of Austria. The richest gold and purple might surely be expended by any romancer upon all the stages and surroundings of that great event, without any trivial scruples about the fact that it did not, strictly speaking, ever occur. Don John of Austria, perhaps the one really heroic figure of the Renaissance period, 
certainly the one really romantic figure of an increasingly rationalistic period, did include in his bold and picturesque plans the idea of rescuing Mary Stuart from prison, carrying her off and actually marrying her, as Andrew Lang sardonically adds, he was incapable of fear. Anthony and Cleopatra are really a very poor substitute for such a historical love affair, but as Cleopatra herself says in Shakespeare's play, nature wants stuff to vie strange forms with fancy. Or in other words, there is not material enough in all the mountains and all the thunderclouds to make anything worthy of that moment of meeting. Between the heart of Holyrood and the sword of Lepanto, I have not seen Mr. John Drinkwater's play about Mary Stuart, much as I admire his play about Abraham Lincoln, and I am a little puzzled by the critical accounts of it. As far as I can make out, it opens with a modern, a very modern argument to the effect that a woman can love two men at once, and Queen Mary is raised from the dead as a sort of illustration, and is represented, very truly, I think, as a woman who suffered from never meeting a man in any way worthy of her. But dramatic critics are curiously obscure, and I cannot quite understand why we should deduce this doctrine that a woman can be in love with many people from the fact that one particular woman was not in love with anybody. But it is unfair to judge an author, especially a good author, through his critics, and I expect Mr. Drinkwater's meaning has in some way been missed. But whether or no his play was consistent with his prologue, it seems to have been consistent with his subject and the historical truth about it. Mary Stewart did, I think, suffer from her own superiority to her own surroundings. If ever there was a woman who went to seed by being left like Penelope among the unworthy suitors, I fancy it was she. No one ever came to draw the bow of Ulysses, but I should like to write a romance in which a very long bow should be allowed to Don John of Austria. I wish he could have taken his very long shot with his very long bow and brought down that wild bird of paradise. There are other frustrated fates of the same kind. Two of them hover over two of the kings of England. After his brilliant raid upon Acre, Richard Coeur de Leon actually came within sight of Jerusalem and refused to see it. With one of those giant gestures that make an epic of the earlier Middle Ages, he hurled his shield and lance to the ground, and lifting up his arms cried upon God to hide the holy city from him, since he might not enter it, a renunciation not without grandeur. But suppose he had been able to advance, suppose his supports had gone forward, instead of turning back, some said by treachery, I think the whole story of the world would have been different, with a new Jerusalem ruled by a hero like Richard and a heroine like Berengaria. Unfortunately for my purposes, there are two fatal objections to both these visions. I will be a patriot even in my dreams, and I deeply regret to say that I do not see how the victor of Lepanto could have rescued Mary Stuart, except by something like a victory of the Spanish Armada, which I absolutely refuse to allow, and I do not see how Richard could have sat in the seat of Godfrey without leaving my unfortunate country even longer under the paternal care of John. But for me, the most moving example of a mysterious might have been will always be Richard II. I think his deposition was the turning point that turned all England in the direction of oligarchy and the race for wealth, but perhaps the more crucial turning point comes not at his deposition but soon after his succession, when he rode forward as a boy beside the body of Watt Tyler and cried out to the revolutionary peasants, I am your leader. He flung open for a moment the gates of a future that was indeed too great to come to pass, and in a real sense too good to be true. Nor was it his fault that those gates of gold closed again with a clang. He was very young, and the letter of the law was on the side of the feudal parliament that overruled him. But young as he was, he did his best in pleading for the popular cause. There are the materials for a marvelous romance even in what is known, or half known, about him. The strange story of the young priest, who was his double, of the alleged escape from Pomfret, of the appearance of the fallen prince like a pale ghost out of the grey mists of the western isles of Scotland, and the tale of how an English jester named him and how he denied his name. Only obviously the romance must end with a restoration, with one of those risings in the north, bearing Richard southward in triumph between the banners of Percy and Douglas, that faced each other so long across the border, as they faced each other at Chevy Chase. And that is another of the things that were too great to happen. Some day I will write a learned and exhaustive history of England since the reign of Richard II, I mean, of course, since the triumphal return of Richard II from Scotland and the overthrow of Henry Bolingbroke. As the story approached modern times, there would be needed, perhaps, a little play of the imagination to describe exactly what was happening by the time that the Parliament was not quarrelling with Charles I. Or at the precise date 
when the American colonies were not fighting against George III. But the study of the events immediately following the medieval restoration would need not a little interesting study of medieval conditions. A friend of mine, who knows much more history than I do, made a very true remark to me the other day about certain catchwords and cant phrases of historical criticism. He said reflectively, and with a sort of absent-minded abruptness, I wonder how many hundred people have written these words. A very different picture is given in Piers Plowman. When he said it, I realized suddenly that I had indeed seen that conventional comparison between Chaucer and Langland repeated everywhere like a pattern. I can truly say that I had always thought it not only conventional, but unconvincing and unreasonable. The pictures of Chaucer and Langland differ as portraits and landscapes differ, because they are meant to be two different things, and not because either of them is untrue. It would be easy to apply the method to two writers in any period. Nothing would be easier than to say of the 19th century that its spirit was delightfully described in Tennyson's poems, but that a very different picture was given in the Book of Snobs. Nay, it would be equally possible to say the same thing, not only of two men of the same period, but of two books of the same man. Nothing would be easier than to dwell on the gaiety and good fellowship of Pickwick, and then say solemnly, a very different picture is given in Oliver Twist. But a study of Chaucer, the humane humorist, and Langland, the spiritual satirist, would alone provide between them hints enough for the happier England that might have been founded at that time. Chaucer and Langland do not differ in the least in any of those things which are called theoretical, and which ought to be called fundamental. Langland was more of a democrat in the sense of a demagogue, because it was his job, but Chaucer was quite as much of a democrat as regards the dogmatic minimum that constitutes Christian democracy. He himself happened to live with gentlemen, but his doctrine is clear enough when he writes of the gentleness that comes of Christ, and not of class feeling. Langland wrote of abuses which thwarted, as he thought, the popular happiness, but there is nothing whatever to show that he would not have been as happy to see happiness as Chaucer himself. And if we read the two side by side, we shall feel that out of them a merry England might indeed have been made. If at the beginning of Richard's reign, anything like a peasant's program could have been bucked by the mighty prestige of medieval monarchy. I do not mean by merry England a modern utopia, which indeed is seldom merry and is not allowed to be English. I do not even mean an earthly paradise in the manner of William Morris, in which everyone is supposed to be happy. But everyone has to be a little flat in order to be decorative. I mean, by merry England, a world of quarrels, controversies, sins, sorrows, and stupidities, such as are jumbled up together in any healthy human life, but of which the test and judgment is Christian, and not, as it has now become, heathen and even barbarian. With the fall of Richard Plantagenet, two fatal ideas entered the English mind. The first was that there is something unanswerable about success, and something promising about new men with their new money. The second was that there is something hopeless about loyalty, or in other words, that there is something useless about tenacity. We learn to talk nonsense against consistency and against logic, forgetting that logic is simply an intellectual sense of honor. Consequently, the moral sense of honor has vanished along with the intellectual, and while other nations are rediscovering their foundations, our own ruins are buried under rubbish heaps of constantly worsening material. The harp that once from Tara's halls is making a considerable noise now, and even the Jew's harp is recalling the harp of David. But of the horn of Robin Hood, we can only say, with little John, I fear my master is nigh dead. He blows so wearily. End of section 29. Recording by Arden. Section 30 of G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922 by g k chesterton section thirty the return of religious war by g k chesterton a critic has recently complained of my article called stonehenge and a modern myth on two counts 
that i was too critical of the mayflower puritans and that i was too complimentary to the morals of mr wells latest novel i think it is right to refer in passing to both those charges though they are of very different degrees of severity i will be patient under the charge of persecuting and slandering the saints of the reign of righteousness but i cannot sit silent under the charge of admiring the philosophy of modern novels and the insinuation that i am in sympathy with serious psychological fiction is more than i can bear but precisely because the second charge must be the more urgently denied it can be the more easily dismissed about mr wells latest heroine i meant merely what i said that i felt her and her prehistoric enthusiasms to be attractively described for her practical morality to use a form once adopted by mr wells himself i say pooh and for her theoretical morality i say bah it is an understatement to say i disagree with it i have no particular proof that mr wells agrees with it. it is not a charge to be brought lightly against any man but i do think the lady shows up rightly beside her elderly lover perhaps anybody would as i explained i can always enjoy the intellectual analyses in mr wells work but if which i doubt he offers the conduct described as a constructive morality really to be built up i should always be delighted to help in knocking it down i do not know for certain whether mr wells writes in order to make all this free love philosophy repulsive i do know that he does make it repulsive but that cannot prevent his making one of its individual victims attractive on the milder charge about the mayflower and the puritans i am less sensitive but equally firm my critic tells me to read more about the mayflower and that is just the trouble there are two kinds of reading about the mayflower and i have some experience of both i have read stacks and piles of victorian history books of textbooks from cambridge or harvard of leading articles political speeches and professorial lectures about puritanism and new england and the voyage of the mayflower i have also read just a little of what was said for and against such puritanism in the puritan period in the contemporary records by scholarly standards it was very little but little as it was it was enough to knock all the modern stuff to limbo i defy anybody to read seventeenth-century literature with a free mind and not come to the conclusion that puritanism was as i said a savage theological frenzy or if we want more sympathetic synonyms an elemental theological fury but it was largely a fury against civilization and quite certainly against toleration puritans were indeed intolerant in very varying degrees touching the degrees and details of puritanism they differed very much among themselves touching toleration among themselves at one extreme was the scottish type of fastidious fanaticism splitting sects by splitting hairs at the other was the english type of cromwellian common sense content with the puritan atmosphere and anxious to secure able men from all groups of puritans or even of protestants but taking the seventeenth century as it was for all civilization the final war between the catholic and protestant elements in christendom there is only one fair test that we can take and only one possible issue of the test it is that while catholics and protestants persecuted each other there were some catholics in favor of tolerating protestants and there were next to no protestants and certainly no puritans in favor of tolerating catholics the puritans were simply a group of protestants who thought that protestantism did not persecute catholics enough the real exceptions among protestants were william penn and his quakers but new england puritanism had no more community with quakers than with buddhists penn and his group were on the side of the stuarts and the catholic scheme of toleration for the rest it is quite possible to admire the puritans as one admires the dervishes from the desert as a wind of wild defiance as a will that can fast and fight and perish in the wilderness for a vision in short it is quite possible to admire it as a savage theological frenzy it is not possible to admire it as the foundation of modern religious liberty 
in short it is not possible to admire it as it is now admired but i have here a rather larger interest in the matter religious passions were very real when rooted in the seventeenth century nor are they dead in the twentieth century and curiously enough both the two political parties have a twentieth century illusion about a seventeenth century passion the legend of the liberals bears the name of new england the legend of the conservatives bears the name of ulster both are concerned to whitewash what has really been a black and bitter calvinism with a much more modern sentimentalism both idealized as a fight for liberty or was simply a fight for ascendancy the honest provincial of the primrose league sincerely supposed that there was in the north of ireland a sort of chivalry of beleaguered loyalists asking only to hold their fort for england and st george but that primrose path of the primrose league really led back to the everlasting bonfire prepared by black protestants for the pope the sincere nonconformist who reads the newspapers and believes that he reads the bible has convinced himself that cromwell and his ironsides were devoted democrats who asked only that all creeds might be equal before the law but if the new nonconformist were put back to live among the old nonconformists he would find them much more interested in demonology than in democracy and i think that this truth involves larger and more important truths just now precisely because these purely spiritual forces are not even things of the past but rather of the future we shall see furious demonology as well as furious theology and see it in the twentieth as well as in the seventeenth century here is an example of what i mean sir henry wilson was a religious leader in ireland a leader of religious war in the northern counties exactly as the duke of alva was a leader of religious war in the netherlands sir henry was a perfectly sincere and convinced man and so was alva he was a brave brilliant and capable soldier and so was alva but he was at the head of an orange system of which the main point was the persecution of catholics just as the main point of the spanish system was the persecution of calvinists now the historical difference is that the modern public is never allowed to see the point the newspapers artificially limit us to things which even when they are the truth are not the point suppose alpha had been assassinated as he easily might have been the spanish people would have felt much as we do but there would have been a difference and it is the whole difference between the enlightenment of a people without newspapers and the ignorance of a people with newspapers the spanish people would have lamented a great national chief and warrior as we do they would have denounced assassination as an atrocious crime as it is but i doubt whether there would have been a single spaniard alive who heard the news down to the rudest peasant in the pyrenees who would not know perfectly well that alva had fallen fighting or persecuting for the catholic religion thousands who read the modern newspapers in the big cities have not so much as a notion that the wilson affair was connected with the catholic religion at all they would say quite sincerely that the simple soldier suffered wholly and solely for his devotion to the union jack no spanish peasant would have said that alva suffered solely for his devotion to the heraldic lion on the spanish station or for the blazoned castles of castile now most of these modern people believe that religious war is a thing of the past in the early summer of nineteen fourteen many of them believed that all war was a thing of the past their philosophy of history is a vague assumption that humanity has passed out of these ancient shadows forever and that things like slavery and persecution and torture and even revolution and all kinds of fighting become in their turn intolerable and are forgotten those who think as i do have often insisted that this is very far from being true in the case of slavery a closer study of the things which modern systems keep secret will make us more and more doubtful whether it is even true in the case of torture but anyhow we know now that it is not true in the case of war and the more we know the less we shall be deceived to thinking it is true of religious war but though it has never been true there was a time when it seemed very much truer than it does now throughout the eighteenth century and even in the first half of the nineteenth century the english aristocracy had the world with them in treating religious controversy 
as a thing that could be despised. It was, in Matthew Arnold's phrase, the way the world was going then. It is not in the least the way the world is going now. Nobody now understands the ways of the world who imagine that they are merely worldly. The once impervious minds of the Puritan and the rationalist are now permeated with every sort of mysticism, good and bad, eastern and western. Science itself has become mystical to the point of madness. Materialism itself is dissolving in mysteries. The supernatural has come again to the surface, like some vast leviathan that dives so deep that its very memory is dismissed as the dream of a distinct monster, which once in a thousand years rises terribly to breathe the airs of heaven. Once the ordinary English officer and gentleman could walk with the same innocent superiority in India or in Ireland, but that was because he had a subconscious, if not a conscious, religion. The historical Protestantism, which was the insular religion of a chosen race, he cannot walk in that way in India if he is himself a theosophist. He cannot walk in that way in Ireland if he is himself a Catholic, not even if he is an Anglo-Catholic. He must feel at least that there is a sort of superior right in the inferior race. He must feel, in the former case, that there may be a philosopher among the slaves, in the latter case, that there may be a saint among the rebels. Even if he professes to be a materialist, he will be affected by the more modern fashions of the mysticism of materialism. With all society seething with hypnotism and faith healing, he cannot treat quite so scornfully abroad what he is obliged to treat tolerantly at home. If the Indians tell him about the mango plant, he cannot be quite so certain that it is at all a plant. If the Irish tell him about a holy well, he will find it harder to deny that there may be truth lying at the bottom of a well. End of section 30 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Section 31 of G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922, by G. K. Chesterton. Section 31. An Extraordinary Argument. When anybody offers a defiance to my views, and professes to be prepared with a defense of that defiance, I have always desired to accept his challenge and give him his chance. When Mr. Cecil Maitland mentions me by name in this paper, and pits his view of Catholic ethics against mine, it is especially necessary that there should be no doubt about the answer. On some points, indeed, there has never been any doubt about it. I really have not the patience to pick up the pieces of the poor old argument, torn ten thousand times to rags, about the immorality of the textbooks of the confessional. Mr. Maitland must excuse me. Fatigue overcomes me with the very thought of it. If he does not very much mind, I would rather it were about Maria Monk, or the horrors of the Continental Sunday, or the very improper conduct of Mr. Guy Fox, or something a little brighter than the confessional business and yet on the same general level of culture. I am also quite content to leave Mr. Maitland to untie himself as best he can from the hideous entanglement of his own argument on this subject. Apparently he denounces the clerical books for immorality, admires the secular story for the same immorality, and is much gratified because the immorality he admires is copied from the immorality he denounces. It all seems to be a little mixed. Nor is it necessary to dwell long on the other details. The comparison between St. Thomas Aquinas and Freud is rather crushing and cruel for the poor German professor, nor do I clearly understand what the comparison means. It may be that St. Thomas Aquinas deals with some of the subjects of Freud. If the critic can suggest any subject that St. Thomas Aquinas does not deal with, it will be much more enlightening. I have not read St. Thomas any more than I have read the Encyclopedia Britannica, and many unpleasant topics are possibly touched on in both. But the friends of Freud say he interprets life by subconsciousness, and the foes of Freud say he is mad on sex. And anybody who said either of these things about St. Thomas would certainly be mad on something. But here again Mr. Maitland seems to get into difficulties entirely on his own account. Let us assume the highly historical proposition that the mind of St. Thomas was poisoned with sex, because it was poisoned with Catholicism. 
Let us adopt the critic's own comparison, and say he has poisoned like Freud. The question still remains, or rather rises with all the dramatic challenge of a detective story, who poisoned Freud? I cannot think that it was the Jesuits. I cannot think that even Mr. Maitland can hear their cat-like tread behind the curtains. The detective story suggests many more of the same kind. Who poisoned Zola? Was his immorality due solely to his devout Catholicism? Did no other influences, beyond his penances and pilgrimages, fill him with these dark emotions? Or is all to be explained by his superstitious self-prostration before the shrine of Lourdes? Even in a matter in which I feel so strongly, I should like to be as friendly as possible, and I fear it is not kind to say that Mr. Cecil Maitland reminds me of Mr. Lloyd George. It makes it little better to add that this is only because Mr. Lloyd George reminds me of hundreds of other people. Our leaders can hardly be said to be leading, even in the sense of misleading. They are following in a rut that is indeed trampled, but is now very nearly abandoned. The politician said something recently that we have all heard a hundred times, and most of us heard too often, wondering why anybody ever said it even once. It was concerned with allegations of the failure of Christianity to prevent the Great War. That many may still be saying this is but another evidence of how few of them ever think of thinking what they're saying. To begin with, of course, no authoritative Christians ever dreamed of saying that wars would now cease, and the wilder sort of Christians were always saying that wars would now be multiplied, being among the apocalyptic portents of the last days. As a matter of fact, the people who really did prophesy that wars would now cease were not the Christians, but the anti-Christians. The people who really did say that war was a thing of the past were generally the people who also said that Christianity was a thing of the past. It was agnostics and anti-clericals of the type of Carnegie who said, in so many words, that there would be no more wars. It is they who were false prophets, if any people were false prophets. It was the Marxian materialists who were always telling us that a general strike, among the proletarians in all nations, would prevent any conflict between those nations. It is they who failed, if anybody failed, to prevent the Great War. It was they who claimed to be able to do it, and they who showed that they could not do it. Nobody had ever claimed that a combination of bishops and curates all over the world could do it, and those who boasted, and failed, then had the impudence to turn round and attribute the failure to those who had never made the boast. But the impudence involved here is even more simple and startling. In any case, it seems brazenly irrational that because people have failed to be Christians, they should say that Christianity has failed. It might be mildly suggested to them that they need not look quite so far afield for the failure. My mother tells me not to climb a certain apple tree to steal apples, and I do it in spite of her. A bough breaks, a bulldog pins me by the throat, a policeman takes me to prison, whence I eventually return to shake my head reproachfully at my mother, and say, in a sad and meditative manner, I had hoped better things of you. Alas, there is something pathetic about this failure of motherhood to influence the modern mind. I fear we must all admit that maternity as an institution is barren, and must be abandoned altogether. The impudence of this illogical shifting of responsibility is bad enough in the case of the Christian councils of peace and pardon, in their strife against the human habits of vainglory and vengeance. But it's a thousand times more monstrous in the case to which Mr. Maitland applies it, the case of the ideal of purity and the practice of profligacy. There the case is not even complicated, as is the case of war, by the possibility of Christian and heroic war. Here, it seems, man is really to treat the religion like the imaginary mother. Instead of blaming himself for not having obeyed her, he begins to abuse her for not having been obeyed. He first despises her advice, and then despises her for giving advice that can be despised. As a general attitude, this would be sufficiently outrageous in its intellectual injustice and insolence. In the particular case in which it is applied, it is outrageous in fact and history as well. The critic has the credit of inventing an entirely new slander against the Irish nation. It is a charge so false that none of the furious and malignant enemies of that nation have ever even attempted to make it before. He takes one particular person who happens to be an Irishman, and whose literary works are said to be very sensual or immoral. He then suggests that the writer is sensual because he is Irish, and that the Irish are sensual because they are Catholic. At least, unless he does that, I cannot make any sense out of his argument. Now it is a matter of common confession and common sense that the Irish are not notable for their sensuality. Men would admit it who admit nothing else in their favor. Men would admit it because they could not deny it. The Irish are accused of being murderous, of being treacherous, of being incurably lawless, of being insanely irrational 
of living for a dance of death only explicable by their being possessed of devils, but they are not accused of being grosser than other peoples in the things of sex, because the contrary is a matter of fact, and almost a matter of statistics. What possible rhyme or reason can there be in proving the effect of a religion on one Irishman, when it doesn't have that effect on one in a thousand of any other Irishman? If one albino were born in a tribe of African negroes, would he say that the tropical sun burns everybody white? If one Chinaman had his pigtail cut off, should we say that Confucianism had always prevented the growth of pigtails? Why cannot people attacking Catholicism retain any common sense? Anyhow, if Mr. Maitland wants to attack Catholicism, he might be advised not to do it with suggestions which thousands of people simply happen to know to be the reverse of the fact. I'm not particularly proud of believing that there is positive evil in the world. I have no pride in it for the same reason that I have no doubt of it. My shame and my certainty both come from the same thing, that I have found the evil in myself. But in so far as it was encouraged by outer influences, I know it was not by religious influences, and could not possibly have been by Catholic influences. I know very well that I could find food for all the vilest cravings in the universe in the ordinary modern materialistic city, with its materialistic literature and philosophy. The suggestion that somebody or other had to go to a confessional box to find it is as absurd a suggestion as that he had to go to church in order to find a crowd of people. It's like saying that London contains no smoke except incense smoke, or no dirt except the dust and ashes of ascetics. It is simply not worth talking about. End of section 31「Section 32 of G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922, by G. K. Chesterton. At the sign of the world's end, the professor and the priests. The critic whom I recently criticized, the critic who compared Professor Freud to a great moralist of the Middle Ages, was in one sense much more right than he imagined, or even than he meant it to be. I had to break off rather abruptly last week the reply I meant to make to him, and this point at least may properly be added now. The critic is certainly quite wrong, historically, when he insinuates that medievalism was merely morbid and had nothing of the roistering familiarity with religion to be found in Mr. Belloc's drinking songs, with their Latin choruses. Small as is my own medieval knowledge, I believe I could pelt him with examples. Walter Mapp's song of Mihi est propositum is pure Belloc, and one could quote countless lines from Chaucer and cite countless carvings from the Gothic buildings in the world. But when we come to those parts of the medieval morality that do avowedly deal with the darker details of life, then it is true, as I have said, that the criticism comes closer to reality than the critic realizes. Indeed, the comparison is correct in every point except the only important point. It is true that the modern world has in many ways copied the medieval world. It is yet more curious that it has copied in the medieval world all that is condemned in the medieval world. Whether or no all mysticism is depressing, modern occultism and tales of terror are very depressing. Whether or no all morality is enslaving, modern prohibition and scientific supervision are very enslaving. And whether or no confession gives a dangerous and indelicate power to the priest, it is at least quite certain that psychoanalysis does give that precise power to the doctor. I should say that psychoanalysis was confession without absolution, because without repentance. But leaving on one side the question of whether it satisfies what people seek in confession, there is absolutely no doubt that it does exhibit all that people detest and denounce in confession. The latest scientific experiment is modeled on the confessional box, and there are at least all the same superficial reasons for labeling it as the wrong box. If such introspection is disease, the patients are doing it as much as the penitent. 
if such questions are degrading the professors are asking them as much as the priest there is not a page or a line written against confession in the whole world atheist or anti-clerical or protestant or puritan that is not of necessity a direct attack on the new psychology it will be much wiser for the enemy to make another hasty alteration drop the old anti-clericalism and go over to the new psychology as a basis for the new attack that is quite new and may last for several months yet so much for the things in which the professor resembles the priest and they are precisely the things and the only things which any honest people anywhere ever disliked about the priest it is very much as if somebody had collected all the scandals about the church and then set them up as sacred things and a substitute for the church it is as if the world made an inquisition into the inquisition and carefully kept all the thumbscrews while throwing away all the crucifixes it is as if men went about to reform the papacy of alexander borgia and destroyed the chalice with which he celebrated in st peter's while preserving for public use the cup of poison which he mixed for his enemies it is as if they collected all the scandals in monasteries and abolished the monasteries and perpetuated the scandals as if they abhorred everything that should have been burned and burned everything that should have been adored if it be a similarity and sympathy to build a church out of nothing but gargoyles to make a miracle play out of nothing but devils to make a theology that consists entirely of demonology and a divine comedy that cannot get any further than hell then indeed we will admit that our faith has been made the subject of the sincerest kind of flattery and no longer withhold from our accusers the compliments that are due to plagiarism so much for the similarity and now for the difference the little detail of difference is this that the religious analysis works for freedom and the scientific analysis for slavery the former results in the stimulation of the will and the latter in the paralysis of the will men may work with much the same tools for very different objects as a spade may be used for growing cabbages or for burying corpses a knife for cutting a loaf or for stabbing a man a physician and a poisoner may work at the same bedside with bottles and chemical preparations and arms and legs may be cut off by huns for amusement or by harley street surgeons for utility now the two types of psychological inquiry are rather like two types of psychical manifestation even in the popular ghost stories there are two kinds of ghosts there is a useless and hopeless sort of ghost who appears only to wail and not to warn he can only announce with the noise of lamentation that a dreadful doom does in fact hang over blunderbore hall he can only remind people by clanking chains and gibbering and other accomplishments that there is in fact a curse on the house of its bumble puppy he considers himself i suppose a sort of candid friend but he cannot be considered a helpful friend he seldom makes any suggestions for exercising the influence of blunderbore hall he does not condescend to point out any way in which the present mr fitzbumble puppy can get round the curse or get out of it for him the doom is a doom and the curse is an incurable disease and he is the exact counterpart of all the modern materialists who tell us in many ways and in the name of many sciences that men are animals and animals are automata that no man can struggle against his heredity that every man is at the mercy of his temperament that one race inevitably dominates and another race inevitably decays that all ethics are the result of economics or that the modern mind must be manufactured by the modern machinery all these are voices of the ancient specter of blunderbore hall and the chain that he clanks is called the chain of causation but to do the popular ghost justice there is another kind of ghost who is naturally rather more popular he is a sensible and useful sort of ghost who tells people to do things to punish crime and clear the innocent or merely to find lost property or hidden documents it would be an exaggeration to call him a sunbeam in the house 
but he certainly throws some light on the subject. By his intervention, Blunderbore Hall may sometimes be restored to the splendor associated with it before the time of the wicked Sir Willoughby, and Mr. Blumblepuppy can get rid of the curse and marry the village maiden. And under the image of these old rustic superstitions about him, the populace did shadow forth some vague impression of the good spiritual forces that come into the lives of men, that they may have more life and have it more abundantly. He is the counterpart of the other part of confession, which comes to remove a curse and not to renew it. But above all, it is the test of his innovation that its issue is in an action. There is something to be done. There is a declaration of liberty for the will. There is the difference between the two types of psychical intervention and the difference between the two types of psychological investigation and the more similar they may appear in a hundred details, the deeper is the abyss between them. Of course, I do not mean that all psychoanalysis, or everybody who goes in for psychoanalysis, must belong to the hopeless rather than the hopeful school. I do not say that the broad distinction exists between the sort of self-analysis introduced in a mystical age and that introduced in a materialistic age. And I do repeat that that the whole difference is determined by this question of liberty, or the possibility of the will being victorious over the destiny. That is the difference that separates the realism of the penitent from the realism of the pessimist. And that is the meaning of the modern paradox, whereby the wildest anarchy of thought and passion is combined with the most servile obedience of organization the materialistic mind has been made familiar with the idea of a force beyond its control to which it is bound to submit whether it be the disease of a remote ancestor or the direction of a remote ruler whether it be the ghost in the haunted chamber or the policeman at the corner of the street it is taught to understand the sentiment of surrender whether it is surrender to passion from within or to power from without it has learned the lesson that its own personality is powerless against impersonal things, whether it be impersonal nature or impersonal government. But the idea that personality has the power to decide has about it something steep and dizzy, like a precipice. For those who have grown used to creeping safely along flat and fallen places in a land of slaves, it is not because the form of penitence is subjection, but because the soul of it is liberty, that it is feared and covered over with falsehoods. And that is the cause of the confusion, even in the mind of the accuser, about whom I write, the incredible confusion by which he first declares that clerical books are as bad as blasphemous books, and then that blasphemous books are as good as they can be. What he means is that there are two ways of revealing the same shameful truth and one of them stuns us like a club, and the other rouses us like a trumpet. End of section 32 Section 33 of G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arden G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922 By G. K. Chesterton Section 33 The Precipice of Power By G. K. Chesterton There is one earnest and almost ecstatic prayer that will be offered up by anyone who has a real sympathy both with England and with Ireland, and that is the prayer that the Irish people may not read the English papers, especially the sympathetic English papers, all the dreadful blows deliberately dealt at the Irish Free State by the Irish minority, even the irreparable loss of a hero like Michael Collins, are less disastrous than the blind blows unconsciously dealt by the poor bewildered English journalists who are told to call him a hero, as they were once told to call him a criminal. It did Collins far less harm to kill him than to call him a loyal servant of the British Empire, and even of the coalition government. In that matter, the journalist was the immortal type of the man who never opens his mouth without putting his foot in it, and the foot was only too easily recognized as the club and hoff. The combination of all this crass idiocy came the other day when a coalitionist paper 
solemnly stated that there had always been a tender personal sympathy between Mr. Michael Collins and Mr. Lloyd George. De Valera would pay a good deal to be able to placard Ireland with that statement. It is no occasion for talking in a personal and acrimonious manner about the comparison. It is enough to imagine something of the mountainous difference if the comparison had really been complete. It is certainly more in sorrow than in anger that any man who cares for manhood will reflect on how much better it would have been with the soul of a certain person if it could have been complete. Suppose he had dedicated himself from boyhood only to the task, however wild it might seem, of the independence of Wales. Suppose he had carried on war in the Welsh mountains against the militarism of a mighty empire till he wore out the will of the government and awakened the sympathy of the world. Suppose he had extorted self-government and restored the full tradition of Luan and the Barnes, and finally fallen fighting in his youth against the malcontents in his new Camorian kingdom. We, knowing to what low alternative the life of a man may lead, might well understand a fresh a proverb about the love of the gods. And indeed the matter that moves me here is in no way personal, in the vulgar sense in which we speak of personalities. What is involved in the comparison is not so much a personality as a policy or a school of politicians. A hasty hostility might say that the mystery of Michael Collins is why he was really shot at, while the mystery of Lloyd George is why he was not shot at. But I, for one, should protest against such a sentiment from every standpoint in the case of a man like Mr. George. I do not think him bad enough to be murdered or good enough to be martyred. I cannot, at the moment, think of anything in the world except being assassinated that could possibly put him in the right. And if I have another earnest and ecstatic prayer of the political sort to offer, it is that heaven may preserve the prime minister. But in truth, he is only one of a whole mob of modern politicians, no worse than many and better than some. And the comparison that concerns me is a comparison between such groups as a whole. The only possible value of the parallel between the two names is in a consideration of the different fate attending the two types of ruler and the two separate nations. And whatever our sorrow, we must have something servile about us if we doubt which fate has been the happier. It is right that the ruling of men should be a dangerous trade. Nobody wants it to be as dangerous as it is in Ireland, but it ought to be a great deal more dangerous than it is in England. It is the normal tradition of sane and spirited nations that power should be balanced by peril. The medieval kings were expected to lead in battle, as Michael Collins to the last was leading in battle. Not a few of them, like Richard I and Richard III, were killed in battle, as Michael Collins was killed in battle. That fact alone is enough to show that their military prominence was not a mere military parade like the uniforms of the German emperor. The nobles who sat at the great council of a medieval king were really held responsible and liable to punishment on the charges of treason and corruption. Not a few of them were in fact executed, exactly as if they were common Irish patriots. Even in later times, a great minister could pass rapidly from omnipotence to impotence and from impotence to extinction. If his towering success was a terror to others, it was also a terror to him. When the tyranny of Thomas Cromwell ended in his execution, a popular and powerful rhyme, which may be found, I think, in Percy's Reliques, contained the terrible but very Christian sentences, Save thou thy soul which Christ hath bought, but for thy body care thou not, let it suffer pain as it has wrought. When the black and tan terror was suddenly dropped, nobody suggested that Sir Hamar Greenwood should suffer pain as he had wrought. Nobody even circulated a rhyme recommending this expiation, as they did in the case of the great destroyer of the monks. In that connection, by the way, there is something decidedly amusing, for anyone who cares to look it up, in the note which Percy, as the polished parson of the rational 18th century, appended to that fierce fragment of the old popular religion of England. He speaks of it as a small piece of spitefulness, only to be explained by the private enmity of some courtier. To anybody who has read it, it is rather like saying that some powdered rival of Madame du Barry at Versailles it was the only possible explanation of the Marseillaise. Of course, these comparisons are much too extreme. Dallas the Great did not always suffer for their crimes like Cromwell. Sometimes they rather suffered for their virtues like Collins. And doubtless, also, there is no friend of normal government who desires it to be conducted in such a savor of death and destruction as belong to the tragedy of the Tudor transition or even to the high but unnatural indignation of the French Revolution, or the Irish Rebellion. 
Nevertheless, all these historic things contain the hint of what is really lacking in our own type of craven security and supine success. It is not merely a barbaric brutality. It is also a very intelligent instinct, which tells men that private life should be safe, but public life menacing. The modern politician has much more power than most kings in the past, but the financiers behind him are in possession of wealth covering a far more cosmopolitan area, and the faddists who follow him turn their legislation into a persecution of much more private things. Henry VIII could break into guild houses in England, but he could not have hoped to begin buying them up all over the world, and although he could abolish monasteries, he would have thought it sheer madness to abolish inns. But though the politicians have in some ways more influence than the kings, they have in most ways much less responsibility, and certainly much less risk. There was much to suggest to a king that the ceremony of putting on his crown might be a preliminary part of the ceremony of taking off his head. There is nothing to suggest to a modern politician that he risks even retirement from public life. It is only a man like Bottomley, who partly through the remains of honesty in him, has remained outside the inner ring, who suffers even for the most extreme moral extravagances. Even that was something of a shock, though on the whole, a salutary one. It is a very ominous state of society when only the liars tell the truth. But there are far worse men than poor Bottomley, men who do not tell the truth even by accident, who are much more secure because they are more mischievous. Fraud and insolence in high places are safe so long as the places are high enough. But it was a much more wise and imaginative instinct which conceived that high places ought to have something of the dizzy and perilous poise of a precipice. It is this vertigo of responsibility which was once the price of power. It is this which has vanished from the vulgar politics of today. It may be a good thing to make the world safe for democracy, but it would be part of the same thing to make it unsafe for demagogues. I have a special reason for making this suggestion, even at this moment. A tragedy like that of Michael Collins fills us so much with distress that there is a danger of its filling us with despair. I would most seriously urge that such a paralysis of pessimism is a profound misunderstanding of so noble a legend. It is not of such deaths that nations die. All history is there to show that the blood of the heroes is as much the seed of the state as the blood of the martyrs of the church. And it would be a melancholy irony if we were found mourning of the death of Ireland after the awful amputation by which she has lost her right hand, while we ourselves were dying even as we mourn from a deeper disease creeping through all our bones. It would be a bitter jest if Ireland were left for dead because of such massacres as raged around the foundation of the Roman Empire and the French Republic, while England looked down in pity upon her from that gilded sarcophagus which was a final monument for Carthage or for Venice. And it is because I care much more about England than about Ireland that I cannot keep out of my ears the echo of an ancient voice. Weep not for me, Weep for yourselves and for your children. I know that there are many for whom such a reversal of sympathies will still seem almost grotesque. Anyone who chooses may misinterpret it as an apology for anarchy or a fanatical exaggeration of our own political scandals. Only somebody with a sense of the right uses of the fantastic would understand the symbol. If I were to suggest that the relations of England and Ireland sometimes remind me of the humorous passage and De Quincey, where he says that he finds it very hard to steer a rational middle course between the extremes of too much murder on the one hand and too little on the other. But since I have discovered, as De Quincey did, that some people are not quite serious enough to understand a joke, I will put my meaning in about as serious a fashion as it is possible to put it. Catholics say that there are four sins crying to heaven for vengeance, and two of them are murder and the oppression of the poor. It is true to say that the Irish commit the one only too often, and the English commit the other all the time. End of section 33. Recording by Arden. Section 34 of G.K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns. The New Witness, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. G.K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns. The New Witness, 1922. 
by G. K. Chesterton, thirty four. At the sign of the world's end, the absence of arguments by G. K. Chesterton. I value Mr. Maitland's tribute to the paper for the same reason that makes me value the paper itself. I have never been in the least blind to the defects any more than to the difficulties of its production, and above all of its editorship. If we all continue to struggle to sustain it perpetually at the point of dissolution, it is not so much because of its achievements as because of its aims, and they are aims at which other papers are not even aiming. But I attach importance to the new witness not only because it is one of the few papers in which we can tell the truth, but also because it is one of the few in which we can discuss whether it is really true. Unless opinions other than our own are present, the reader can never have before him the process of proof, but only the result of it. The best of the party journalists only offer us something that has been proved, and most of them offer us something that has never been proved. Now, many opinions appear in this paper, as well as Mr. Maitland's, with which I do not myself agree. To mention only two names at random, I have disagreed with criticisms on the works of Mr. John Macefield and of Mr. Brimley Johnson. But the matter goes beyond the ordinary accident that I admire books my reviewers do not admire. I think it an excellent thing, from time to time, that an actual attack on the fundamental ideas of the paper should appear in the paper. It is all the more desirable because, outside the paper, they are not attacked or even understood. It is as well that our friends should attack us if our foes find it safer to boycott us. I have to thank Mr. Cecile Maitland very heartily for the handsome compliment he pays to our habit of printing views that differ from our own, but in this case it seems to have become a rather dim and dizzy and bewildering question with what they agree or disagree. Certainly, my only reason for resenting any of Mr. Maitland's remarks was that he was making a provocative attack on a religious tradition, and if he was not attacking it, but defending it, there seems to be nothing left but a rather dazed reconciliation. Suppose Lord Carson were to explain that all his life work and words had really been directed to achieving Irish national independence, and that his intention had been merely misunderstood. I suppose I should fling my arms about him in a reaction of friendly emotion, and not pause to inquire whether my lack of comprehension was not partly due to his own lack of lucidity, and a certain power to popularize his views. Suppose Dean Inge were to assure me that his fine and scholarly irony had been taken seriously only by a blundering simplicity, and that he intended throughout to satirize eugenics, and to glorify the most extreme and leveling doctrine of the trades unions. Doubtless I should embrace Dean Inge, with no more than a momentary speculation about how much of the mistake had been due to obtusity on my own part, and how much to obscurity on his. All things are possible, and some elements in these cases are even probable. Lord Carson certainly was the one original demagogue who advised Irishmen to take up arms against the crown. In that sense, Pierce and D. Valera were merely his imitators, and his work is still going merrily on. As it is with the case of Carson, so it is with the case of the Dean. He may be merely satirizing eugenics. It is very difficult to talk about eugenics without satirizing eugenics. He may intend to arouse people's sympathy for trades unions, as he always arouses mine. There is a great deal that I deplore in the dull bureaucracy and colorous collectivism that often pervades the trades unions, but whenever I feel out of sympathy with them, I read a page or two of Dean Inge's denunciations, and my sympathy rushes back like a flood. And in the same way it is possible that Mr. Maitland meant to offer a compliment, and not an insult to the Catholic traditions, and in that case all ground of serious disagreement might disappear. But I was certainly not the only person for whom it did very obviously appear. Mr. Lois McQuilland, I think, and several others wrote it much more indignantly than I did on the same assumption as mine. With all allowance for her fallibility, it does seem as if there had been something a little confusing in his statement, and I am still a little confused even with his explanation of his statement. There are some points in it to which I may return some time, for the sake of the intrinsic ideas involved, but just now I am only anxious to acknowledge a suggestion of a misunderstanding, as amiably as may be. At first I was tempted to say that if that is a strange and indirect way of defending medieval religion, perhaps it would be safer in the future if he were to attack it. It is like asking a gentleman with a gun and an erratic aim to shoot straight at us, so that he may hit something else. But I am much more disposed to join with Mr. Maitland, on reflection, in recognizing the value of admitting all kinds of aims, 
even when they seem to us erratic. If I disagreed with him where he proves that he agrees, at least I heartily agree with him where he admits that he disagrees. Now, as a matter of fact, there is practically no argument nowadays. We may imagine that we have read a correspondence in the newspapers, which was a controversy about the right of women to be soldiers, or the wrong of men being soldiers, or possibly both at once, when the controversialist was really enlightened and talking at large. But that was an illusion, and we have never read anything of the kind. We may remember dimly having heard, as in a dream, politicians speaking on platforms in answer to other politicians who had spoken on other platforms, but that was an illusion, and they were not doing anything of the sort. The correspondents were never controversialists, the speakers were never debaters. An argument is an appeal, and these people never appeal, because they have nothing to appeal to. Let the reader recall all the controversial correspondences he has read, and count the number of cases in which anybody even asked what was the common ground of controversy. None of the politicians make any attempt to start with their first principles, to state their first principles, or even to have any first principles. If you stated to them the one fundamental principle of all controversy, heaven help their perishing souls, they would call it a paradox. They do not even know that men cannot disagree until they agree. This astonishing ignorance is shown in the very phrase about agreeing to differ. It is always used as if it meant the end of an argument. Obviously, it ought to mean the beginning of an argument. It is very characteristic of the moderns that the phrase which should be a trumpet of defiance is now rather a cry of despair. In truth, we never can defer until we agree to defer, but it ought to mean that we agree to fight, and it does not mean that we agree to run away. And in this latter merely negative and invasive sense, it is indeed true that our life and literature is full of agreeing to differ, so that we never even discover our differences. We can all remember any number of letters in the papers, or speeches on the platform in which men set out to abuse each other, though generally for the wrong reason. But how many of them had set out to convince each other, by the employment of any reasons at all? The controversialist of today only uses reasons that refer to his own philosophy. He only uses terms of abuse which are abusive in his own code of morals. He only calls the papist a papist, which is accepted as a graceful tribute to the Pope. He only accuses the Bolshevist of being a Bolshevist, and the Bolshevist says politely, quite so. There is no real effort to get behind these ideas to the first principles that are at the back of them, and therefore there is no real debate. Another of our idle proverbs says that there is no disputing about tastes. It is so far true that when people have nothing to go by but their tastes, they forget how to dispute about anything. What follows may be a riot, if it is only a riot of words. But it is not a dispute. Note the collision of two correspondents in any ordinary newspaper. One, let us say, is a humanitarian and what the world would call a faddist. He has become an atheist because he wishes to pit humanity against divinity. He has become a socialist because he suspects that it is rather old-fashioned to be a radical. He does not really know what he disbelieves, let alone what he believes, and somebody else must state his own prejudice as a principle. But fundamentally, he believes in a general idea of extension and expansion, that anything is good which goes further than we have yet gone along some particular line, and that anything is good that goes outside limitations and overflows certain particular lines. Let us say that the other controversialist is a type rather more common, a conservative who supports capitalism and imperialism on a material basis. He also is ignorant of his own dogmas, though he is sometimes heard to murmur the name of Darwin. He also is irreligious are the more irreligious, because he often goes to church on Sunday. He is not a humanitarian, but what one of the most brilliant of humanitarians has defined as a brutalitarian. His creed, if we knew it, is simply that man is a brute, and can only succeed by being brutal. But as neither of these men knows his own creed, he cannot be expected to know the other man's creed, and therefore cannot have the faintest effect on the other man's case. These men cannot argue with each other. When the art of controversy comes back, it will not come from the world of skeptics and iconoclasts. It will come rather from the world of believers and of dogmatists. It will not be the work of men who merely ask questions, but of men who believe that they have found answers. It will come out of the clash of real convictions, which are positive and not negative, not from those who say, what is truth, but from those who can still say, this is truth, not from Pilate, but from Paul. Such a renaissance of real controversy, shining with the ancient arts of logic and rhetoric, having the old peaks of eloquence and abysses of irony, may belong to a land of liberty still removed from our own. 
but the beginnings of it will not be found in the vast deserts of negation which we call educated public opinion, but in some such poor patch of private conviction as we cultivate here. End of section 34. Section 35 of G.K. Chesterton's newspaper columns, The New Witness, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicola Jablo. G.K. Chesterton's newspaper columns, The New Witness, 1922, by G.K. Chesterton. Section 35. At the sign of the world's end, three points and the paper. The new witness exists for the sake of three principles, which are, as it were, in a descending order of importance, or at least of importance for those who support the paper. First, we value it simply as a paper, and in a sense simply as a newspaper. We might almost say we value it as a paper merely in the sense of a scrap of paper, a blank piece of paper on which certain words can be printed that cannot be printed anywhere else. The things so printed are quite literally news, in the sense that they are new to most people who read them. It is necessary to insist first on this quite simple notion of a new sort of news sheet it need not be this sort of sheet, or even any sort of sheet. If the same few words could be put before the public in any way, we should be quite content. It might be done with the most prehistoric tools, or with the most modern and scientific instruments. The words might be chalked up on a wall, or carried through the country by a man riding on a horse. The words might be cast in colossal letters on the screen of a cinema, or broadcasted across the world in waves of wireless telegraphy. But as we are not wealthy enough to own any walls or any horses to be used on this scale, it goes without saying that we are not wealthy enough to own the costly scientific engines, which are the gigantic toys of the modern millionaire. One of the most interesting problems of the hour, by the way, will be involved in watching to see how the very newest inventions like aviation and wireless and the film, will in the present moral state of the world coagulate into the same lumps of capitalism and cold corruption as have steam and electricity and petrol. The cinema may or may not, as some say, rival the press in popularity, but it will certainly resemble the press in its type of popularity, and the essence of that type of popularity is that it is not really popular, it is not popular in origin, even if it is sometimes popular in effect. The populace never makes a cinema or a newspaper, as it could once make a guild or a revolutionary tribunal. And in aviation, though the small aeroplane may have defeated the big zeppelin, I fear we are still far from the victory of the small owner over the big owner of such flying machines. We might some day see something like one man, one motor, but as yet hardly one man, one monoplane. For most people, for that matter, owning three clouds and a flying ship would still seem no wilder than owning three acres and a cow. And for the third example of wireless, it is enough that the very word Marconi has sunk to be a password for the worst secrets of the few. It seems a pity that we have discovered how to talk to the whole world at the moment when we only talk in whispers and have nothing to tell but lies. But this is a parenthesis, or merely a part of the primary statement that our first aim is simply to print certain words, since we cannot film them or broadcast them, or write them on a sky sign or shout them through a megaphone. Even if we could afford to do any of these things, we should probably be put in prison on some pretext for doing them. There is always the chance of our being put in prison on some pretext as it is, but it is still possible to print on this blank page what cannot be printed anywhere else in the press, and that is the first thing to realize about the situation. The words in question may be few. It may only be a matter of a single sentence. Sometimes it is only a matter of a single name. Suppose that somebody wishes to print a sentence like this. The Prime Minister was charged with seeking a separate peace, 
that betrayed the Allies, and he has not denied it. Or, the plot to poison him was a faked advertisement, stirred up by a government agent whom the government dared not produce at the trial. Or merely, Herbert Samuel and Rufus Isaacs both told the House a falsehood about the Marconi shares. It is a fact that he could not get those words printed on any piece of paper except this piece of paper. If I wrote them in an article for any other paper, they would be cut out. I have written such things, and they have been cut out. It is for the sake of such sentences that this paper exists. It is necessary to put this fact first, because there are necessarily other things in the paper which are not essential to it and should not be essential to the verdict upon it. We produce this paper under conditions in which it would be counted impossible to produce any paper. It is financed without a financier. It is edited without an editor. It is not only true that the editor is an inefficient editor. It is also true that he has to be an inefficient editor in order to be an intermittent financier. He could not find support for the paper in other ways if he concentrated on it in the official way. Its control is often put into commission among people who have in the same way to support themselves and it by some other work. This is an impossible arrangement, and for some seven years we have been doing an impossible thing. I think it is far better to state these facts frankly in the paper itself. I am aware that it is against all the principles of modern advertisement. It would be easy enough to cover our difficulties by the usual methods of publicity and mass suggestion and mesmerism and general humbug. It would be quite possible in the bottomly fashion to announce every week another magnificent article, to claim a fabulous popularity, to boast of our business methods, to hint at our huge resources. But if there were no other objections, founded on an old-fashioned taste in such things, it would be grossly inconsistent with the particular purpose that we claim. We profess to speak sincerely about modern public weaknesses, and we should be indeed ashamed if we did not speak so of our own weaknesses. We know that capitalism is not efficient, that Parliament is not representative, that the press is not free. We are not going to enjoy a realism about these things, and at the same time pretend that the new witness is a model machine and a magnificent monetary speculation. We would preserve a scrap of paper on which certain words can be written. We will not write on it a denial that the scrap itself is somewhat scrappy. Next, after the unique aim of merely announcing certain facts, facts which cannot be denied but only suppressed, comes something which is equally unique but far less undeniable. It is a conviction about the ethics and economics of the present problem. It is a particular social solution. It is very simple, and all our readers know what it is. It may be summed up by saying that, as most of us agree, that the accumulation of capital by the few has been a bad thing, it would seem to follow that the redistribution of capital among the many would be a good thing. It is so simple as to make it seem a startling thing to say that nobody is fighting for it except ourselves. But though it is startling, it is strictly true, touching the general journalistic output of our time. If the new witness disappears, there will be no paper maintaining this normal and almost commonplace counsel in morals. There are a large number of papers defending capitalism. There are a few papers defending socialism. There are even fewer defending certain modifications of socialism, which make it rather more historic and human by a machinery of guilds. But there is not a single paper which attacks socialism in defense of small property as distinct from large property, except this one. It would be easy to take a working model of what I mean. There are many newspapers and newspaper correspondents that would object to the compulsory holidays or short hours in shops in an old spirit of vulgar gentility. They would snort in their snobbish way at the uppishness of the shop girl and her cool demand for holidays and holiday clothes. It is the happy habit of this type to jeer at the shop girl if her taste is bad and sneer at her if her taste is good, to be scornful if she dresses like a lady and more scornful if she does not. 
There is also a proportion of the press that would take the other view of holidays and holiday finery. There is a singular sort of sentimental optimist writing at large just now, who is made hopeful by the sort of holiday that is obviously a Saturnalia of slaves. The shallowest varnish of vanity and vulgarity is enough for him. He is confident of achieving a brighter London, a utopia of liberty and hilarity, so long as the flappers cut their hair as short as the roundheads, or the female face is decorously concealed like something indecent behind a mask of chalk or grease paint. The first social criticism corresponds to the contempt and ruthlessness of the capitalist state, and the second to the drift and indignity of the servile state. But while some would grumble because the shopkeeper has to give his shop girls a holiday, and some would merely chuckle at the use the shop girls make of their holiday, nobody in all the press would say a word for the shopman who does not keep any shop girls but only keeps a shop. Some would work their slaves oppressively, and others would indulge them intermittently. But there is no mercy for the man who does not want to have any slaves to indulge or to oppress. The worst fate in our society is to be a free man who does not wish to enslave others. Therefore, neither the law nor the newspaper criticism takes any account of any such shop as probably shines like a fairy castle in the first memories of our childhood. A toy shop or sweet stuff shop with a dash of lemonade and cheap tobacco, a shop kept by a poor woman who sells her own wares and talks freely with her own tongue. Nobody points out the shameless cruelty of the law destroying her livelihood in order that she may give a holiday to the servants she hasn't got. Nobody points out that her shop and a multitude like it might flourish if she were not forced by a pointless police regulation to throw herself out of employment on the assumption that she is somebody else, or to give herself a compulsory holiday which she cannot afford to give and does not want to receive. Neither of the two parties, the brutal slave owners or the benevolent slave owners, will say a word for her, though all of them have known and respected such honest people from childhood. For they know well that even if that one little concession of justice were made in the law, the distributive state would have begun. Then again, just as even the distributive state is less vital and universal for us, than the war on corruption and the telling of the truth in politics. So the particular views we hold about those politics are often in their turn less vital and universal than the distributive state. The third purpose of the new witness is to enunciate certain opinions about foreign and domestic policy. We support nationalism against cosmopolitanism. We support Poland against Bolshevism. We apply the same principle to certain views of France and of Ireland. We may sum up many of them, in contrast to a considerable undercurrent in the whole press today, by saying that we at least do not feel the faintest regret for the cause of the Great War. Conductors of this paper have a right to speak so of the war, considering what they lost in it. I have thought it well this week to put this summary of our old situation before our readers, because I think the time has come to consider finally whether the paper can continue in its present makeshift and anomalous manner, whether it is necessary to end it or possible to start it afresh. About this I may have some statements to make in the next number. End of section 35. Recording by Nicola Jablo. Section number 36 of G. K. Chesterton's newspaper columns, The New Witness, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christopher Feckler. G. K. Chesterton's newspaper columns, The New Witness, 1922, by G. K. Chesterton. Section 36. The Camp and the Cathedral It must always be something of a problem how far the private amateur may venture merely to guess that the professional specialist is mistaken. On the one hand, it is quite certain that the man who knows most about a thing is often quite wrong about it. 
he is often quite wrong in fact, and still more wrong in spirit. On the other hand, the fact that the learned man has lost humility is no reason why the unlearned man also should lose that humorous and healthy gift. On the whole, I think the test of the question is in the size and simplicity of the mistake. It depends on whether the scholar is blind to something because it is too small to be seen, or because it is too large to be seen. I cannot draw the learned man's attention to something recondite, for he knows far more of such obscure details than I do. But I may sometimes draw his attention to something obvious, for that is the sort of thing that the learned man has a way of falling over in the street. I may be able to tell the botanist how many beans make five, though he alone can tell me how many vegetable cells make one. I cannot teach the ornithologist anything about the place of flamingos in the world of birds, but I might be able to explain something about the place of ornithologists in the world of men. I shall probably fail if I set out to remind the astronomer royal of a star that he has forgotten in the Pleiades or the nebula of Andromeda. And yet there is a star that he may quite possibly have forgotten, and that is the great world that he walks on. History is the only hobby in which I have dabbled even in this tentative fashion, and it is to history that I should specially apply the test. I mean the test of whether the truth has been missed because it is small and hidden, or actually because it is big and plain. Cobbett, for instance, was an amateur historian in somewhat the same sense, though less amateurish than myself, and when he was right, as I think he generally was, it was because he had an eye for large and obvious things. His eye went across a great landscape like a bird, and was master of the lie of the land. Thus his broadest deduction was simply from the big churches in England, and especially from the very fact of their bigness. Many snuffy and snobbish old dons at Oxford and Cambridge may have known more than he did, especially at the start, about many details of those parish churches especially about the value of the livings and the security of the tithes. The dons might even have dwelt on these details amid polished and rational rejoicings about the emergence of a polite society from the small beginnings, the stunted superstitions, and the starving barbarism of the past. What those who spoke thus could not or would not see was simply the size of the churches. It was a fact filling the sky a thing whose shadow lay at evening on the whole landscape. But it never seems to have occurred to anybody but Cobbett, at that time, to ask whether a sparse remnant of ignorant savages were likely to have raised a sort of sacred tower of Babel to the stars in half the hamlets of England. The obscurantism of the Reformation, and the rationalists who were its heirs, was in this way quite unique. Nobody before or since ever kept a people quite so much in darkness as those who put out all the candles in the sixteenth century. In this, for instance, the anti-Catholic reaction in the sixteenth century was quite different from the first Catholic movement in the fourth or fifth century. The early Christians had a great moral horror of the last phase of the great civilization of Rome, but they never attempted to pretend that it was not a great civilization or that it had not been made by Rome. Their moral horror was in most matters justified, in some matters considerably exaggerated, but in its wildest exaggerations of fanaticism it never talks as if the heathen had not built bridges or produced poetry. They did not call the classical architecture the Vandal architecture, as if it had been built only by the barbarians who destroyed it. Yet, that would have been a parallel to the very word, Gothic, which we are still compelled by custom to use. The medieval world did not talk about Plato and Cicero as fools occupied with futilities. Yet that is exactly how a more modern world talked of the philosophy of Aquinas, and sometimes even of the purely philosophic parts of Dante. The Christians recognized an awful spiritual chasm dividing them from their great ancestors. But they recognized that their ancestors were great. 
At no moment in all those two thousand years was the legend lost that Virgil was something magnificent, whether as a magician in the Dark Ages or a model classic in the Middle Ages. In religion and morals, there had indeed been a shuddering recoil, but it was a recoil from over-civilization, not a complacent contempt for savagery. They thought the Colosseum had been the arena of bestial abominations, of beasts employed by men in a spirit too base to be called beastly, and so it had. But they did not think the Colosseum had been made by beasts, or look at its labyrinth of arches with contemptuous curiosity, as at the rude, instinctive architecture of an ant hill. In all that mixture of regret and pain and fascination with which paganism has haunted the Christian centuries, there was never a touch of the innocent vulgarity with which even the Victorians sometimes talked of monks as if they were monkeys. Now the lifting of this load of obscurantism was a thing largely done by the light of nature, by men like William Cobbett or William Morris. And the light of nature showed them very simple and solid things, like the large churches in the English countrysides. These things are the unanswerable arguments of the amateur. These are the big guns that he can really bring up in order to outflank the specialist. Constitutional historians like Hume and Hallam and Robertson might have read many things that the adventurous amateur could not read. They might declare that there were secret state papers or rare books in the Bodleian, to which the individual inquirer could not have access. But it was impossible to pretend that he could not have access to his own huge, empty parish church. It was improbable that they had secretly hidden Westminster Abbey among the state papers. It seemed unlikely that they had locked up Lincoln Cathedral in the Bodleian Library. It required no spectacles to see a church spire, and the stones of Winchester needed no interpreter to translate them from the Latin. These facts were soon found sufficient to anyone who would use his senses, and it became more and more self-evident that men had been about some very big business in medieval times. The researches of later and more learned scholars like Maitland and Gasket confirmed the random common sense of Cobbett or Morris. But ignorant men had originally made the right guess, and made it merely because they refused to explain away a mountain or ignore the presence of a whale. I have remarked that nobody ever tried to do with Roman remains what was once done with Gothic remains. I mean the attempt to treat them not merely as ruins, but as rudiments. I mean the attempt to look at the stone arches as we look at stone hatchets, or regard carved pillars as we regard chipped flints. Nobody ever condescended to heathen architecture as they condescended to Christian architecture. As a matter of fact, it is far more impossible for us to build a Gothic abbey than a Roman aqueduct. The engineering work of the pagan empire does in many ways resemble the works of more modern times. It resembles them largely because the method is scientific. It resembles them still more because the labor is servile. You could build a Roman aqueduct and improve on a Roman aqueduct with scientific appliances, but you cannot build a Gothic cathedral with servile labor. People who want to work in that way must put up with the pyramids and the Eiffel Tower. And this brings me to a final consideration in this matter of Roman and medieval remains, which has often intrigued and attracted me as an amateur in historical guesswork. It is a yet larger, though somewhat looser, application of the same principle, that the things that are hid from the wise and understanding are the things that are too large for them to see. I have often wondered whether the vastness and vitality of the legends that descend from the Dark Ages, such as the legends of King Arthur and the Round Table, were due to this comparative continuity between the last strength of the empire and the first strength of the church. I mean that there may have been a moment, even in Britain, when that majesty of the old pagan civilization still stood unchanged, save that it was no longer pagan. The combination of the old pride in being Roman 
with the new pride in being Christian, may have created a militant morality really not unlike its later form of medieval chivalry. In other words, the popular tradition may not be so far wrong when it talks of some dim fighter in the 5th century as a knight. It may not be so far wrong when it talks of the table where those fighters feasted as the original model of knighthood. It is only by a sort of symbol that we clothe the body of that British king in 13th century armor, but it may be something more than a symbol which clothes his spirit with the 13th century conception of arms. If ever history did repeat itself, the mood of the first crusaders who fought with the Saracens might really well have repeated, as in a mirror, the mood of the last baptized Romans and Romanized Britons who fought with the Saxons. It is really a historical fallacy to say that the courtliness and polish of Sir Lancelot could not have existed in that barbarous time. Courtliness and polish are exactly the things that would have existed in one of the last of the Romanized Christians in comparison with his barbarous time. It is really a blunder to say that the virginity and the vision of Sir Galahad are a later romantic fiction added to a half-heathen struggle. Virginity and visions are exactly the ideas that would have shown among the last champions of a Catholic culture in a half-heathen struggle. In this matter of Arthurian legend, I am disposed to suspect that the romantic view is really the realistic view and the right view. If others doubt it, it will not be because of any realistic arguments of history against it. It will be because others do not feel, as I do, the enormous argument from the scale of popular stories, in the sense that a story we have all heard from childhood is something solid and colossal, like a Gothic cathedral or a Roman camp. End of section 36. Recording by Christopher Feckler. Section 37 of G. K. Chesterton's newspaper columns, The New Witness, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arden. G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922, by G. K. Chesterton. The Sentimentalism of Big Business, by G. K. Chesterton. Modern flattery, which is mostly flattery of financiers and millionaires and men of big business, is becoming quite as fixed and formal as any flattery in the past. It will be interesting to see whether it is eventually stereotyped into formal titles, like the titles of kings and nobles. For after all, even those antiquated titles all mean something, and must once at least have meant what they said. Our most gracious king was supposed to be gracious. His grace the duke was conceived as having that unbought grace of life, etc. And men called the monarch his majesty, because they sincerely thought that monarchy was majestic. But surely the sincerity of our servility is far greater than theirs, and there is no idolatry so hardy as the idolatry of gold. We already have the fixed phrases and they may soon pass into fixed titles, made out of the adjectives and substantives that recur regularly in the press. If we do not call a millionaire his majesty, we may perhaps call him his energy. If it be a little difficult to call the petrol king gracious, we may at least call him our most efficient king. A hundred words like push and hustle and pep may be gracefully woven into the old heraldic designations. And a duke, instead of being called his grace, may bear the somewhat exotic title of his go, it would be pleasing to pursue the fancy into the forms of correspondence, explaining when it would be proper to write, Very hustling, sir, and when only very enterprising, sir, or to ask how far the titles would be sufficiently recognized if abbreviated into letters after a name, such as LW for live wire. Such an official understanding would be very convenient, and would save our tired journalists the quite unnecessary trouble of pretending to vary these terms slightly and applying them to every rich man who turns up. It would be awkward for the court officials if they were in any sense expected to apply a new royal title to every royal prince, and it is quite as absurd to pretend that there is any such spontaneity or variety about the fixed amount of flattery which is due to any man who by any method can manage to touch a million. It will be much better 
when these faintly fluctuating forms are frozen once and for all into a final etiquette and we have proper tables and works of reference clearly stating the amount of money involved and the amount of reverence required for it as all sorts of totally different kinds of people who have become wealthy by treason or by accident by making a corner or by making a mistake by theft or by mere thoughtlessness by being too smart to go right or by being too stupid to go wrong have all admittedly to be described in the same terms of eulogy and enthusiasm it will obviously be better if the terms are settled equally once and for all so that there may be no jealousy or misunderstanding it is really true that by all historical parallels this should be the future evolution of the present plutocracy from being informally it should come to being formally respected the mercantile spirit has played much the same part in the formation of modern society as the military spirit in the formation of feudal society the difference is unfortunately that while neither is moral in a complete and satisfactory sense the former is so to speak moral as far as it goes a man can hardly be a successful soldier without having at least some of the qualities of a good soldier but a man may be a successful merchant without having any of the qualities that make a man in the serious social sense a good merchant success and social utility are not connected in the same logical process john churchill was a very vile and despicable person in almost everything except his military exploits but he did serve the state by his military exploits john d rockefeller is also a very paltry person and it is not even certain that he does serve the state by his commercial exploits he may help himself at the expense of the commonwealth whereas the worst sort of soldier generally helps himself and also helps the commonwealth it is this element in the triumphs of mere money-making that makes it so dubious the foundation of the state but in any case it is now having its triumphs and it is now being made the foundation of the state and as i have said the natural conclusion would be that the triumphs should be visible triumphs like the cars and laurels of the roman imperial triumphs the natural conclusion would be that what is the foundation of the state should also be the ornamental superstructure of the state like the banners of heraldry on the foundation of feudalism i do not say that lord leverholm will ever enter port sunlight like apollo in the chariot of the sun or less successful salt boilers dragged behind him in chains and i am quite sure that if ever he does he will forget to have a slave behind him to whisper remember that you are mortal i do not say that the millionaire will revive the pennon of heraldry and i am sure he will not revive the lance of chivalry but allowing that all these images are merely symbolical it remains true that financial industrialism like feudalism has to some extent solidified itself into a definite social formation good employers do attempt to treat the service of the firm as a sort of family bad employers do treat it as a sort of slave compound there is something like a uniform though the former may try to treat it like the tartan of a clan and the latter only like the yellow livery of a convict there is something like a court of justice though the latter may make it rather a court of injustice there is something like a fountain of honor though in the latter the commercial morality may tend to honor men for not being honorable a system of fines and holidays and promotions and expulsions does go to make up something rather like a kingdom and it is not really a fantastic but a logical development that it should ultimately include the pomp and titles of a king now one of our first objects is to see that that kingdom does not come in that sense we are rebels though we are rebels against the royalty of the future rather than a royalty of the past in that sense we are iconoclasts not against all the old idols of the marketplace but emphatically against this new idol of the market we do definitely wish to prevent the trademark coming to have the dignity of a crest we do definitely wish to prevent the livery of a servant from seeming like the uniform of a soldier and in face of all the sloppy sentiment in which this vulgar system is already soaked our attitude may come to have something that seems merely derisive and destructive something that has the responsibility of ridicule if our romance is the romance of business i will be a realist if the millionaire is a philanthropist i will be a cynic i had almost said that if he is a philanthropist i will be a misanthrope about the whole of this industrial illusion we cannot be anything but hostile and about what is hostile there must always be something harsh fortunately the financial idealists are always willing to meet us halfway they are always ready to make themselves so ridiculous that nobody could reproach us for our ridicule capitalism is actually trying to make itself attractive but fortunately it is not the faintest notion of how to do it like jezebel 
or like one of its own unfortunate female clerks, it only knows how to paint its face, and tire its head, and look out of the window. In short, the most striking thing about the servile state, more striking than its ignominy, than its inhumanity, is its rotten, reeking, sodden sentimentalism. It is impossible to describe it in dignified and educated language. It can only be described in its own language. Nothing adequate can be said either before or after an extract like the following. This is a true story of American bankers who believe in the personal touch. These mighty men of finance are planning a convention in New York to take place early in October, and have appointed a committee of 100 bankers to make the convention human. For that, we must call in the women, confided Seward Presser, president of the Bankers Trust Company and chairman of the hundred. We want attractive young women with level heads. There were 134 girls who met the requirements, all of whom are now being coached on how to meet and what to tell a banker. The first thing taught is how to smile warmly, glowingly. No, they mustn't grin. Yes, that is a true story of American bankers who believe in the personal touch, and that is a true paragraph from an English newspaper controlled by an English editor, presumably sane and still at large, who also believes in the human touch, who would seem to be not a little touched. I am not sure that I have ever learned the lesson of what to tell a banker. It seems to depend a good deal on one's economic relations with the bank. Most of us can imagine something that we should like to tell a banker, but cannot at the present moment tell a banker. But after carefully studying the explanations of Mr. Seward Prosser, president of the Bankers Trust Company, I have come to the conclusion that I should have no hesitation about what to tell that banker. I think I could promise faithfully to smile. I might even find it possible to smile warmly, glowingly. I fear it is only too possible that I might grin. Consider in what a maudlin madhouse we live today. Call up the vision of this romantic vista of girls sitting in long rows and being taught by a financier to smile at him warmly and glowingly. Morally, it is disgusting enough, of course, but intellectually, a certain enjoyment of it is surely legitimate. There is always an interest in human variety, and therefore in human vulgarity. And vulgarity so rich and rank as this is a rare experience for the collector. But the only interest it has for me is that this is a sample of the sort of sentiment and romance with which businessmen are trying to humanize business. These are the stately manners of the new feudalism at the court of the Yankee King Arthur. These are the plumes and pennons of the new chivalry. Now I do not think we need fear it. End of section 37. Recording by Arden. Section 38 of G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922, by G. K. Chesterton. Section 38. On Household Gods and Goblins. Some time ago, I went with some children to see Maeterlinck's fine and delicate fairy play about the bluebird that brought everybody happiness. For some reason or other, it did not bring me happiness, and even the children were not quite happy. I will not go so far as to say that the bluebird was a blue devil, but it left in us something seriously like the blues. The children were partly dissatisfied with it, because it did not end with a day of judgment, because it was never revealed to the hero and heroine that the dog had been faithful and the cat faithless, for children are innocent and love justice, while most of us are wicked and naturally prefer mercy. But there was something wrong about the bluebird, even from my more mature and corrupt point of view. There were several incidental things I did not like. I did not like the sentimental passage about the love affair of two babes unborn. It seemed to me a piece of what may be called bad berry, and logically it spoilt the only meaning of the scene, which was that the babes were looking to all earthly experiences as things inconceivable. I was not convinced when the boy exclaimed, "'There are no dead!' for I am by no means sure that he, or the dramatist, knew what he meant by it. I heard a voice from heaven cry, Blessed are the dead. I do not know all that is meant in that, but I think the person who said it knew. But there was something more continuous and clinging in the whole business which left me vaguely restless. 
and I think the nearest to a definition was, that I felt as if the poet were condescending to everything. Condescending to pots and pans and birds and beasts and babies. The one part of the business which I really felt to be original and suggestive was the animation of all the materials of the households, as if with familiar spirits, the spirit of fire, the spirit of water, and the rest. And even here I felt a faint difference which moved me to an imaginary comparison. I wonder that none of our medievalists have made a morality or allegorical play founded on the canticle of St. Francia, which speaks somewhat similarly of Brother Fire and Sister Water. It would be a real exercise in Gothic craftsmanship and decoration to make these symbolic figures at once stiff and fantastic. If nobody else does this, I shall be driven to spoil the idea myself, as I have spoiled so many other rather good ideas in my time. But the point of the parallel at the moment is merely this, that the medieval poet does strike me as having felt about fire like a child, while the modern poet felt about it like a man talking to children. Few and simple as are the words of the older poem, it does somehow convey to me that when the poet spoke of fire as untamable and strong, he felt it as something that might conceivably be feared as well as loved. I do not think the modern poet feared the nursery fire as a child who loved it might fear it. And this elemental quality in the real primitives brought back to my mind something I have always felt about this conception, which is the really fine conception in the bluebird. I mean something like that which the heathens embodied in the images of the household gods. The household gods, I believe, were carved out of wood, which makes them even more like the chairs and tables. The nomad and the anarchist accuse the domestic ideal of being merely timid and prim. But this is not because they themselves are bolder or more vigorous, but simply because they do not know it well enough to know how bold and vigorous it is. The most nomadic life today is not the life of the desert, but of the industrial cities. It is by a very accurate accident that we talk about a street Arab, and the Semitic description applies to not a few gutter snipes whose gilded chariots have raised them above the gutter. They live in clubs and hotels and are often simply ignorant, I might almost say innocent, of the ancient life of the family, and certainly of the ancient life on the farm. When a townsman first sees these things directly and intimately, he does not despise them as dull, but rather dreads them as wild, as he sometimes takes a tame cow for a wild bull. The most obvious example is the hearth which is the heart of the home. A man living in the lukewarm air of centrally heated hotels may be said to have never seen fire. Compared to him, the housewife at the fireside is an Amazon wrestling with a flaming dragon, the same moral might be drawn from the fact that the watchdog fights while the wild dog often runs away. Of the husband, as of the house dog, it may often be said that he has been tamed into ferocity. This is especially true of the sort of house represented by the country cottage. It is only in theory that the things are petty and prosaic. A man realistically experiencing them will feel them to be things big and baffling, and involving a heavy battle with nature. When we read about cabbages or cauliflowers in the papers, and especially the comic papers, we learn to think of them as commonplace. But if a man of any imagination will merely consent to walk round the kitchen garden for himself, and really look at the cabbages and cauliflowers, he will feel at once that they are vast and elemental things, like the mountains in the clouds. He will feel something almost monstrous about the size and solidity of the things swelling out of that small and tidy patch of ground. There are moods in which that everyday English kitchen plot will affect him as men are affected by the reeking wealth and toppling rapidity of tropic vegetation, the green bubbles and crawling branches of a nightmare. But whatever his mood, he will see that things so large and work so laborious cannot possibly be merely trivial. His reason, no less than his imagination, will tell him that the fight here waged between the family and the field is of all things the most primitive and fundamental. If that is not poetical, nothing is poetical, and certainly not the dingy bohemianism of the artists in the towns. But the point for the moment 
is that even by the purely artistic test, the same truth is apparent. An artist looking at these things, with a free and a fresh vision, will at once appreciate what I mean by calling them wild rather than tame. It is true of fire, of water, of vegetation, of half a hundred other things. If a man reads about a pig, he will think of something comic and commonplace, chiefly because the word pig sounds comic and commonplace. If he looks at a real pig in a real pigsty, he will have the sense of something too large to be alive, like a hippopotamus at the zoo. This is not a coincidence or a sophistry. It rests on the real and living logic of things. The family is itself a wilder thing than the state. If we mean by wildness that it is born of will and choice as elemental and emancipated as the wind. It has its own laws, as the wind has, but properly understood, it is infinitely less subservient than things are under the elaborate and mechanical regulations of legalism. Its obligations are love and loyalty, but these are things quite capable of being in revolt against merely human laws. For merely human law has a great tendency to become merely inhuman law. It is concerned with events that are in the moral world what cyclones and earthquakes are in the material world. People are not born in an infant school any more than they die in an undertaker's shop. These prodigies are private things and take place in the tiny theater of the home. The public systems, the large organization, are a mere machinery for the transport and distribution of things. They do not touch the intrinsic nature of the things themselves. If a birthday present is sent from one family to another, all the legal system, and even all that we call the social system, is only concerned with the present so long as it is a parcel. Nearly all our modern sociology might be called the philosophy of parcels. For that matter, nearly all our modern descriptions of utopia, or the great state, might be called the paradise of postmen. It is in the inner chamber that the parcel becomes a present, that it explodes, so to speak, into its own radiance and real popularity. And it is equally true, so far as that argument is concerned, whether it is a bonbon or a bomb. The essential message is always a personal message. The important business is always private business. And this is, of course, especially with the first of all birthday presents which presents itself at birth, and it is no exaggeration to talk of a bomb as the symbol of a baby. Of course, the same is true of the tragic as of the beatific acts of the domestic drama, of the spade work of the struggle for life, or the Damoclean sword of death. The defense of domesticity is not that it is always happy, or even that it is always harmless. It is rather that it does involve, like all heroic things, the possibilities of calamity, and even of crime. Old Mother Hubbard may find that the cupboard is bare. She may even find a skeleton in the cupboard. All that is involved here is the insistence on the true case for this intimate type of association. That in itself it is certainly not commonplace, and most certainly is not conventional. The conventions belong rather to those wider worldly organizations which are now set up as rivals to it, to the club, to the school, and above all to the state. You cannot have a successful club without rules, but a family will really do without rules exactly in proportion as it is a successful family. What somebody said about the songs of a people could be said much more truly about the jokes of a household and a joke is in its nature a wild and spontaneous thing. Even the modern fanaticism for organization has never really attempted to organize laughter like a chorus. Therefore, we may truly say that these external emblems or examples of something grotesque and extravagant about our private possessions are not mere artistic exercises in the incongruous. They are not, as the phrase goes, mere paradoxes. They are really related to the aboriginal nature of the institution itself and the idea that is behind it. The family really is something as wild and elemental as a cabbage. End of section 38
The New Witness, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. G.K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922, by G.K. Chesterton. At the Sign of the World's End. Wanted, a Radical Party. Perhaps it would be an exaggeration, and one a little lacking in charity, to say that the Puritans now concentrate on prohibition because it is the only piece of morality they have left. But there would be a truth in the travesty, for it is very curious to watch how the nonconformist conscience has hardened on this one matter, while it has gone soft on so many other things. In the matter of sex, about which it was once a byword for severity, it has really begun to exhibit the strangest sort of laxity. Marriage may be almost indefinitely dissolved and dissipated, so long as the dissipation is called divorce. Ireland, to take an example, is at this moment threatened with massacre and misery because the Irish question was not settled, though very nearly settled thirty years ago. The Irish question was not settled thirty years ago because the whole nonconformist world rose in horror at the private conduct of Parnell, who married a divorced wife whom he had loved when she was practically a deserted wife. In other words, the deliverer of Ireland was enthroned and Ireland left undelivered, because he had done something which the whole modern divorce movement would permit him, and practically encouraged him to do. Take so typical a representative of popular Puritanism as the nonconformist novelist Mr. Silas Hawking. He is a man very representative, and I believe very sincere, and he has made himself a champion and chief controversialist on behalf of divorce. Indeed, his doctrine, whether he himself understands it or no, would involve almost infinite divorce. In criticizing a book of mine on the subject, he argued that a man might repudiate the marriage contract exactly as he would repudiate any business contract, like that between a publisher and an author. I pointed out to Mr. Hawking that I was not in the habit of making to my publisher a solemn vow in a sacred building. I never worshipped my publisher with my body, or promised to keep myself to him till death did us part. But Mr. Hawking distinctively said, whatever he may have met, that the question was whether the publisher or partner or other parties to the contract had not got out of it what he had a right to expect. That is, presumably, whether the husband or wife had found reasonable happiness in the marriage. After all, had poor Kitty O'Shea found reasonable happiness in her marriage? Was O'Shea any better than scores of husbands whose claims are now calmly dissolved? Was Parnell any worse than scores of co-respondents who are now reintroduced into respectable society? The truth is that the old institution of marriage, on behalf of which the Puritans made the great demonstration only thirty years ago, has already been abolished in England, and largely with the assistance of the Puritans. Much of the futility that has fallen on the nonconformist, considered as a nonconformist, has unfortunately fallen on the same type considered as a radical, and the political laxity is even more lamentable than the religious in the sense that it is less excusable. The Puritan has not really defended purity, but the liberal has not even defended liberty. He also has been false to his own chosen ideals, and the ideals he chose were not even so arduous and austere. The recent failure of radicalism has lain in not being efficiently radical. It is not going to the root of the matter, and not having the courage to uproot it. With one or two more honorable exceptions, my old friends the liberals had conspicuously failed to fight for liberty in the one way that really matters, that is, to fight for liberty against the really powerful enemies of liberty. They have preferred to fight against a rapidly weakening aristocracy rather than against a rapidly strengthening plutocracy. They have conducted a struggling sham fight against a few squires, while the whole world is full of the murmur of the millions against the millionaires. They have continued to tell old village tales about the tyranny of the parson when every village school and village almhouse is overshadowed with the tyranny of the professor. After the professors had made war on Europe with all the guns and gases of hell, they continued to hunt not the professors but the priests. 
they continued to talk about the priest in the school and the priest in the home they continued to look for a jesuit by way of a skeleton in the cupboard and looked under the bed for a bishop instead of a burglar they continued to repeat what they had heard from their great-grandmother's parrot that venerable victorian bird that clericalism was the enemy though they had not seen the enemy with their own eyes filling the skies with the engines of modern science and filling the libraries with the ethics of nietzsche and the prussian pupil of voltaire they helped patriotically to destroy prussia but they did not understand what they had destroyed or why they had destroyed it they were doing their duty as englishmen but they did not know as they should have known that they were doing their duty as radicals since the war they have become only too eagerly persuaded of the absurd contradiction that the duty of a radical is to be a pacifist as if a revolutionist uprooting things could ever be at peace this type of man though individually a very honest and healthy character in many ways has entirely lost his bearings at the present time he does not know where he is or what he ought to hold and least of all what he ought to attack i have taken the example of foreign policy and the great war but the case is if possible even stronger touching domestic policy and peace here again what is wrong with the radical is that he is in the very worst sense a conservative only instead of conserving a compromise is conserving a conflict and a conflict which is altogether out of date which carries the drums and banners of a battle as remote as the wars of the roses in domestic politics also the liberal will profess to be jealous of the encroachments of orthodox and organized religion but as a fast there is no organized religion to compare with the oppressive regimentation of organized irreligion there are no tests that impose orthodoxy to compare with the tests that impose heresy like the heresies of hygiene the old doctrines of theology are not forcibly imposed on anybody but the new theories of science are forcibly imposed upon everybody the priest cannot call in the policeman to help him impose a penance but the doctor can call in the policeman to help him impose an operation people are not driven into a church but they are driven out of a public house but all this vast and violent aggression on the part of the materialists seems to be quite invisible to the radical who is haunted with his ancient hatred of harmless mystics all this rigid and militant regimentation may have a morality of its own and it may be quite right that those who believe in it should support it but surely there ought to be somewhere a liberal morality to resist it and the party that was supposed to stand for liberty seems to have lost its chance in human history and failed to resist it at all on any calculation there must be something to be said for liberty and it is the liberal who refuses to say it it is all the more curious because i suspect that even in the vulgar electioneering sense it would be a popular thing to say i cannot understand why the liberal instead of talking rather more vaguely than the coalitionist about schemes of industrial welfare and social reform does not put himself at the head of the real discontent that is roused by all this dragooning and detection i suppose the fact is the final confession that every party now depends not on popularity but on plutocracy not even on vote-catching but merely on money-getting one would think that any man worth calling a radical would have no doubt about his sympathies in a contest between the crofters and a capitalist but capitalists can contribute to the party funds and crofters cannot the party funds have become more important than the party votes let alone the party principles yet even upon this calculation the coldness of liberals about freedom remains something of a mystery if they are practical politicians we do not of course expect them to do anything but surely it is strange that politicians should not even say anything why in the world have not these politicians had the sense to promise us emancipation one would think that it was a question of their being expected to keep their promises surely no such restraint as that need impair the eloquence and energy of our national leaders at the next general election surely they might make some new promises as freely as they made the old promises and keep them as carefully as they have kept the old promises they promised us a sort of utopia after the war 
surely they might find the courage to promise us the ordinary liberties of the subject which we possessed even before the war they promised us a country fit for heroes to live in surely they might promise us a country fit for grown men to live in they promised us a league of nations to protect us from foreign tyrants and imperialistic invaders over whom they had really no control surely they might promise to protect us from the bureaucratic tyrants and invading inspectors over whom they have complete control they talked as if they believed in the war that would end war surely they could at least talk as if the war had not ended citizenship they promised us so much and they have done so little surely they might promise a little more even if they do a little less as an old radical i suggest that there might be a new radicalism i cannot understand why nobody is preparing for the next general election with a real radical program as i have said it might well have a certain superficial success even if it were never anything more than a program why does not somebody refresh the stale dregs of a dead socialism with a new individualism why does not somebody try to repeat the triumph of joe chamberlain and his three acres and a cow why does not someone pit that sort of small property against the fabian vision of officials ploughing thousands of acres and officials driving herds of cattle we have reached the precise psychological moment when the repetition of it as a rumor has prepared the way for it as a novelty it is now just sufficiently familiar to appear to be entirely fresh ten years ago it may be nobody would have understood it ten years hence please god everybody will understand it but at this particular moment a politician bringing it forward would seem to be both original and democratic both individual and social it would be the most promising of all policies if like so many policies it were promising and nothing else End of section 39 Section 40 of G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922, by G. K. Chesterton. Master versus Makers I have just been looking at the new Labour paper, or to be precise at the new leader, with which is incorporated the Labour leader. I looked at it with interest because I certainly think that Labour wants a new leader, and we never from the first profess to offer anything but a new witness. That is to say, we are valid witnesses to the fact that proletarians, and especially manual laborers, have as a historical fact been cruelly crushed by capitalism. But we do not profess to be manual laborers ourselves. It would be misleading for middle-class sympathizers such as we are to call ourselves laborers in the common sense. But we are exceedingly glad that the real technical manual laborers, the bricklayers, and the joiners and the plasterers should have an organ of their own. Hence my interest in looking at it, and at the names displayed on its first page. The first name I see is that of Professor Einstein. It may be that the professor, while not perhaps in the technical trade union sense a bricklayer, is nevertheless a sort of patron saint of bricklayers. It may be that his great theory, that all straight lines are crooked, is invoked by bricklayers when piling a tower of brick. That his idea that a foot rule measures more one way than the other is a technical working principle of the trade union. That the bricklayers balanced on high ladders may be heard disputing about his higher mathematics. This is possible. It is perhaps a little more probable that the presence of Professor Einstein's article is due to the fact that it is an article that implies a plea for Prussia. But of one thing I am very certain, I am every bit as likely to hear two real bricklayers on top of a real ladder discussing relativity as I am to hear them uttering this sort of pacifism 
or this sort of apology for Parisianism. The next horny-handed proletarian I find, filling the central pages of the page, is Professor Arthur Thompson. I am not sure which trade union he belongs to, whether to the National Union of Astronomers and the Guild of Higher Mathematicians, like Professor Einstein, or to the Invisible Guild of Poets with that admirable poet, Mr. Walter de la Marais. For the rest, there are several able and honest people with whom I sympathize, possibly all the more because they happen to be all people of my own class and education. Such is my sublime class consciousness, the admiration of the world. Mr. G. D. H. Cole is my old schoolfellow at one of the old public schools. Mr. H. N. Brailsford is my old fellow journalist and radical colleague of the Daily News, every bit as bourgeois as I am. Mrs. Swanwick is the daughter of a Dante scholar whose name I shall always hold in love and veneration, but who was certainly more and not less academic than I am. Honestly, I cannot see why the word labor should be tacked on to these people on the new leader any more than ourselves in the new witness. I am inclined to think there are as many navies and dustmen in our list of contributors as in theirs, but I have left the greatest name in their list to the last, and it is with that I am really concerned. I see that Mr. H. G. Wells, in an eloquent and just tribute to the late Sanderson of Ondal, has referred to the distinction which I noted in the new witness many years ago, when it was advanced by Mr. Bartrand Russell. It is expressed in the statement, possessiveness has to give way to creativeness, and the idea of dominance to the idea of service. The later antithesis, I confess, has begun to bore me a good deal. I deny there is anything good about service in the abstract, without reference to what we serve. The sight of all the front bench politicians standing like a row of flunkies in the liveries of a new millionaire does not increase my enthusiasm for the term. A fine chain of meaning, something more than a misprint, may at any moment turn the word service into the word servile, nor do I think the hostile term in itself worthy of so much abstract hostility. I do not think there is anything wrong in a man being dominant when he is dominating devils, or anything good in a man serving when he is serving devils. Nor is it a matter of merely militant domination, as in the war against things that are evil, there is also a peaceful and human domination of things are good. A man need not be the conqueror, but he can be the king of his cat and dog, his chairs and tables, his house and field. And that brings us back to the first and far more valuable and interesting antithesis, and to the old problem of property. The important part of the sentence is the beginning of it. Possessiveness has to give way to creativeness. Now, the first thing that occurs to me to say about this is that if possessiveness does give way, the creativeness will always give way. Do not imagine for a moment that I am thinking of the mean and vulgar argument used by capitalist against socialist, that the artist will not work unless he has an incentive, that is, unless he has money enough to buy a peerage and purchase a castle as handsome as a pork butcher's. That I need hardly say is not the point at all. That was an argument invented by a pork butcher trying in vain to imagine why the devil the man became an artist. An artist can do perfectly well without incentives in that sense. He can often do without success or popularity. He can sometimes almost do without bread and cheese. But there are two things that the artist cannot possibly do without. He cannot do without possessiveness and he cannot do without domination. Even the artist may be glad to have the cheese as well as the bread. Even the artist need not be the absent-minded as not to know the difference between chalk and cheese. But the possessiveness involved here is not concerned with the cheese so much as the chalk. Suppose, for the sake of argument, that I have realized one of my secret dreams, and am engaged in drawing on a great white wall or ceiling with a piece of black or red chalk, as long as a pole. Drawing designs on a scale, if not exactly in the style of Michelangelo, the only two things I must have besides a chalk and a wall are possessiveness or a grip on the chalk, 
and domination or the power of deciding the design on the wall. Now, of course, it would be possible to make that Mr. Wells could call a larger, more social, more coordinated and cooperative use of the piece of chalk. You could have a whole crowd of comrades hanging onto a single stick of chalk, like a company carrying a battering ram. You could, by their combined or conflicting movements, make a series of marks on the white wall. And I can imagine Mr. H.G. Wells or Mr. Bertrand Russell or some other moralist describing that design in terms of ethical or aesthetic eulogy. I can imagine their explaining to us how those vast vague curves reveal the impersonal purpose which is the paradox of their religion, how those strange lines that seem at first sight to be wavering and wandering show the subconsciousness of society seeking the truth, how those rather erratic dots and jerks or warning signals that punctuate the impatience of the populace. Or I can imagine the alternative school of Mr. Sidney Webb proving to me that a machine could be made to hold the red chalk in one iron claw and make rhythmic and recurrent marks on the same wall day and night. I do not say that there could be no interest in these experiments. I only say they would be no use for my experiment. If I am to make my design according to my idea, I must be allowed to treat the chalk as my chalk and the wall as my wall. There are exceptions to the principle where higher laws come in, but the philosophy I am criticizing does not propose to allow for the exceptions, but to alter the rule. It does not say that possessiveness can sometimes be sacrificed, and the letter to be extended in the spirit, or that a man may sometimes possess spiritually and renounce materially, that the spirit of ownership sometimes extends to cover cases where men do not technically own. He simply sets possession in the flat opposition of creation, as if the two were not only totally distinct, but definitely incompatible. This seems to me to be in itself incompatible with the mere practical action and experience of holding a piece of chalk. Besides, our society is not possessive, not by a very long chalk indeed. I do not understand what Mr. Wells and Mr. Russell mean by talking about it as if it were possessed by possessiveness. In truth, ownership and originality do go together, and they are absent together as well as present together. And in this case, it would be about as true to say that all modern men are poets as that they are all possessors. Herded in huge labyrinthine cities, they have largely lost the memory of what is meant by owning a patch of earth. It would seem to many of them as strange as owning a paving stone. Flitting from lodging to lodging in vast migrations of employment and unemployment, they have largely forgotten the sensation of owning a house. It would seem to them as fantastic as the bird of passage owning the trees in the park. Sold up again and again by mean landlords and moneylenders, on their triumphant way to become peers and plutocrats, the poor have again and again seen their small possessions scattered to the pawn shops and the rubbish heaps, and they have all but lost their tenacious tenderness for old clocks and crockery. The truth is that it is precisely the paralyzing of the possessing instinct in the modern masses that has made them uncreative. The limitation of liberty lies in being only allowed the use of things, the impersonal and temporary use of them. The disadvantage of having the use of anything is that you cannot put it to any other uses. You can borrow a book from a circulating library if it is only for the comparatively dull and unimaginative purpose of reading it. But you cannot cut the pictures out of the book to paste them on the screen or set them up in a toy theater to amuse the children. In other words, you can only use the book in a receptive way. Exactly what you cannot do is to use it in a creative way. And you cannot create precisely because you do not possess. Possession loosens a sort of pivot of free will in the mind, which can turn the utility of the book in all possible directions, besides the one direction for which the circulating library has designed it. 
Until men own, we shall never know what they can make. The limitation of liberty lies in being only allowed the use of things, the impersonal and temporary use of them. The disadvantage of having the use of anything is that you cannot put it to any other use. You can borrow a book from a circulating library if it is only for the comparatively dull and unimaginative purpose of reading it. But you cannot cut pictures out of the book to paste them on a screen or set them up in a toy theater to amuse the children. In other words, you can only use the book in a receptive way. Exactly what you cannot do is to use it in a creative way. And you cannot create precisely because you do not possess. Possession loosens a sort of pivot of free will in the mind, which can turn the utility of the book in all possible directions besides the one direction for which the circulating library has designed it. Until men own, we shall never know what they can make. End of Master vs. Maker Section number 41 of G.K. Chesterton's newspaper columns, The New Witness, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stacy Dugan Wilcox. Section number 41 of G.K. Chesterton's newspaper columns, The New Witness, 1922. At the Sign of the World's End, The Apostle and the Wild Ducks, by G.K. Chesterton. Last week, I learned a historical lesson, in some sense, by going on a wild goose chase. Perhaps it might more correctly be described as a wild duck chase. Not that I had any intention of shooting wild ducks, though the country I visited was, I believe, specially suited to the sport, the country round about the fens of Lincoln and the broads of Norfolk. Those eastern flats generally are famous for such wild fowl, as also for the remains of the rich medieval civilization founded on the Flemish trade, and for expansive opportunities for the admiration of the sunset, or, for those of suitable habits, of the sunrise. Yet the wild duck I pursued was not entirely symbolical, though he was, among other things, a symbol. He was not at all like the wild duck of Ibsen, for example, for those East Anglian coasts had fortunately only suffered the influences of Scandinavian pirates, and not of Scandinavian poets and philosophers. What happened in my own case was merely this, that a friend of mine told me that far in the interior of the fens, in the heart of a labyrinth of lanes and dikes, there was a little church which contained some medieval paintings in remarkable preservation. These pictures were said to represent scenes of medieval sport, dealing especially with ducks. After wanderings which might have led to the other end of nowhere, only that the endless roads seemed to be perpetually turning inward instead of outward, we came at last to the place, in a wilderness of gusty grass and stunted and sprawling trees, with one of the great square towers of flat flints that mark the Norfolk churches alone filling the empty sky and dwarfing everything at its feet, and it was here that I found the feature that seemed to me a sort of symbol or summary for our understanding of the Middle Ages. Incidentally, of course, that great tower was something of a symbol itself. It was not only a beacon or a thing to be seen, it is a symbol of blindness as well as sight. Nothing is so strange in human history as the things men do not see. Over all those flat lands, the only mountains were made by men, and they were made by medieval men. For that matter, in a thousand little villages all over England, there has been for centuries only one tall, stately, ornate and orderly building. All the rest was obvious patchwork and poverty. Yet the Puritans could successfully teach five generations of English people, and especially of East Anglian people, that the men who built the big systematic building were living in savagery and superstition, while the men who still tolerated the little hovels had emerged into liberty and enlightenment. In this case, it is curiously true that faith can remove mountains. It can remove the mountain opposite a man's door, if his prejudice has taught him that a mountain is only a myth. But this is a parenthesis. 
for my purpose here is not concerned with the old English churches in general, but with something that is to be found in this old Norfolk church in particular. I say it is something that can be found, though at first it seemed rather like something that could not be found. In truth, in that remarkable little fane of the flats, we might be said to have found everything but what we were looking for. There were indeed medieval paintings, and very fine ones, by no means hidden, but splendidly displayed, Fronting us as we entered the church door, in a great row across the rude screen, stood the twelve apostles, six on each side, with their rich colors somewhat darkened, but their gold in full glow, and their emblems and tools of martyrdom unmistakable. Facing inwards, opposite each other, were two figures of St. Michael and St. George, treated somewhat in a heraldic manner. I mean the manner that looks arbitrary, until we realize that it is decorative. The armament of St. George seemed fantastic and top-heavy even for the tilting armor of the fourteenth century. The feathers of St. Michael seemed to be sprouting from strange parts of him as from the body of a monster. Only when we consider it as we do a coat of arms, as a pattern more than a picture, we suddenly realize that every line of it is in exactly the right place. High above all these there was a much more faded figure of St. Ethelreda, the great Christian foundress and patron of those parts, looking down perhaps the more impressively for seeming more like a ghost or a great shadow on the wall. This was, in the strict sense of the word, all very fine, but it was not what we had come to see. The attitude of the apostles, however darkly traced, could not be mistaken for the postures of gentlemen when duck-shooting. St. George was clearly occupied in killing a dragon, and not a duck. St. Michael's wings might seem to be sticking out of him in an arbitrary and ornamental fashion, but they did not recall the wings of a duck, or even what the psalmist coveted as the wings of a dove. Besides, St. Michael is more associated with a goose. Nobody would venture to call St. Ethelreda a duck. We concluded that the rumor about pictures of duck hunting in the fens must have been a rumor without foundation. In short, the duck was only a canard. Just as we were trailing out of the church in disappointment and even despair, so far as our duck hunting expedition was concerned, my friend gave a cry, and I turned in the very porch to look back at him. He was bending over the figure representing St. Paul, which wore a long inner garment elaborately embroidered with gold. We had both passed it over as a pattern merely adding richness to the general design, but on looking closer I found that the Apostle of the Gentiles was all over ducks. He was, so to speak, crawling with ducks, with ducks and dogs pursuing them in one pantomimic dance all over the gilded pattern. It was here that the artist had crowded all his comic sketches of the sports of his native fens. It was a very good pattern, but it was made of quite grotesque pictures. It might have been the design for the fancy waistcoat of a fat gentleman in one of the Dickens novels. The first of all the Dickens novels, by the way, was originally written to illustrate some grotesque sketches of sport. It is not too much to say that, in the original scheme of the publishers, Mr. Pickwick merely existed for the sake of Mr. Winkle. Mr. Winkle might very well have gone duck-shooting in the fens, as he went skating on the ice or riding on the famous horse that went sideways. The sporting artist employed on that occasion would doubtless have been ready to depict him surrounded by any number of ducks and dogs but he would have been mildly surprised if he had been asked to depict them as part of the decoration of the parish church, to say nothing of the vestments of the parson. But the older artist saw nothing incongruous in depicting them thus in mazy detail between the massive book and the mighty sword that stood for that terrible convert who was struck down upon the road to Damascus. Now that is the answer to the question I have already asked even in this article, and that is why this pointless anecdote— is also a parable. People were able to shut their eyes to the big church because it was only a church, however big, and they did not think of deducing anything from it about the number of houses or the nature of households. Because the framework of so much of medieval life was a religious framework, they never even looked at the picture in the frame. They passed it over exactly as anyone looking at the painted figures of the Twelve Apostles passed over all the lively little animals of which its ornament was made up. 
thus to take only one example popular history seldom takes account of the large numbers of medieval people more or less loosely attached to the church without being in the full sense either priests or monks students servants members of lay orders and men who were merely clerks in the sense of pleading benefit of clergy that is being under the milder law of the church rather than the harsher law of the state all this popular life i suspect moved normally within more or less clerical enclosures as the details of the decoration seemed to dance within the enclosure of the main lines of the design in the gradual revival of the study of such a period we have had to investigate the religious life in order to discover the secular life we have had to search the cathedrals to find the guilds as my friend had to scrutinize the saint in order to find the hounds and the birds there is no way to these things except through that gothic porch and this was realized even by the great men like morris and rossetti who might well have wished for some other reason to come in by some other way but none ever came in by any other way except the thieves and the robbers there are thousands of little things like that to be found in every corner of what is left of medieval craft and culture i have taken this small instance because it is small and because it is the last that has occurred to me the study of these old things has to be an intensive study just as the cultivation of them anew would have to be an intensive cultivation i have mentioned the accident by which the very approach to this secluded and almost secret place seemed in its nature centripetal it seemed like a sort of spiral labyrinth that almost made one dizzy by perpetually turning inward there is that centripetal or spiral pattern in the study of all these things progress during the last two or three centuries has been centrifugal and not centripetal that is the meaning of science of imperialism of international finance as things thrown on a revolving wheel fly outwards as far as possible so souls spinning round on the great iron wheel that is the model of all modern machinery tend to fly outwards to seek for alien countries or to speculate about remote stars but that wheel is running down and the missiles that once flew so fast are now falling even faster so far as any such iron imagery can follow the free curves of the flight of the soul the curve must soon not only return but reverse itself the progress of the future should move inwards to the discovery of what we have and the understanding of what we know it would seem a paradox to say that a man might start with studying one field and be promoted to study half of it and then progress to study a quarter and advance yet further by studying a tenth but any one who does not understand that paradox at the present moment does not understand how much real progress is now possible to mankind if we like to use a scientific metaphor we can say that we have turned our backs for a time on the eternity of the telescope and see before us like a vista the eternity of the microscope but the finest instances of this intensification will still be found in the work of men to whom the telescope and the microscope were alike unknown and the claim can be tested in any corner by copying their example and by using our eyes end of section 41 recording by stacy dugan wilcox section 42 of gk chesterton's newspaper columns the new witness 1922 this is the librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by arden gk chesterton's newspaper columns the new witness 1922 by gk chesterton section 42 frivolity versus freedom by gk chesterton in one of the newspapers in which the millionaires lay down the law for the millions, I noticed an article today which was all the more typical for being trivial. It seemed to sum up something rather curious, a kind of fanaticism of frivolity, which is being preached in such papers. Its ostensible object was a defense of bobbed hair, but its spirit was a curious flattery of fashion and innovation. Most of us understand the motives which make modern employers rather encourage this sort of modernity. Most of us know why the modern maiden, instead of saying, My mother bids me bind my hair, is expected to say, My master bids me 
bob my hair. But the argument offered in this case had particular points of interest. The writer indignantly denied that bobbed hair had gone out of fashion, and apparently that it would ever go out of fashion. She said that it would never be lost, any more than the automobile or any other new invention. She added, I need hardly say, a good deal more about things in general, always going forward and never going back. Well, it is interesting to know that the automobile can be compared with the notorious fixity of feminine fashions. It is something to know that a thing is as unchangeable as the hobble skirt, as immortal as the Medici collar, as fixed and final as the crinoline. The female costume must by this time be of a complex and overpowering character. If it has never abandoned anything that it once adopted, and if all its extravagant variations are now piled one on top of the other, but as it is a little difficult to believe that bustles and hobble skirts have proved everlasting achievements, it is still possible to suspect that bobbed hair need no more be permanent than powdered hair. The very fact that it was adopted as a new fashion will be enough to prove that it will soon be very old-fashioned. But the writer's argument, which has applications to more important things, also contains another test of truth in the matter. Whatever may be said by a somewhat deeper philosophy against automobiles and motor machinery as a whole, it certainly does possess the merit here claimed for it. The motor really is progressive, and not merely in the literal sense that it progresses along a road. It is also true that it did, in process of time, progress faster and faster along a road. Whether the road is the right road, in any sense, is of course quite a different question. The art of motoring did improve in that way. But how is it the art of bobbing hair to improve in that way? Is the hair to get shorter and shorter as the car goes swifter and swifter? Is the increasing excitement of the motorists to consist of an increasing incapacity to keep their hair on? The example is alone enough to upset the whole apple cart, or rather the whole automobile, of this particular theory of progress. If we are always advancing in one direction, the result in this case will be rather alarming. A girl will not be finally free till she has shaved her head. If being bobbed is progress, then being bald is perfection. It would appear, therefore, that the controversialist in question was speaking in parables, and must in some sense be answered in parables. She could not really have meant that the world improvement of the future would consist of shorter and shorter hair, even in the sense that it might conceivably consist of quicker and quicker travel. But she did mean that something, a certain spirit, which for her is symbolized by bobbed hair, could be trusted to go on improving the world. And anyone reading between the lines even of her article, and still more of numbers of other articles in the same journal, in the same type of journalism, knows what that spirit is. Of course, it exists in very different degrees in different people. It is stronger in some than in others. It is conscious in some and unconscious in others. But the short hair and the short motor journey certainly connote to these people a certain frivolous philosophy, difficult to define except in their own more frivolous diction. It might be expressed by saying that their notion of joy, if it is not in being merely bobbed, is in being pretty bobbish. It might also be expressed by saying that it is not only the automobile that is expected to be fast. Now, frivolity is as old as the world, because paganism is as old as the world. Nobody need be bothered, because every class contains a certain number of people for whom progress is a euphemism for going the pace. But there is something a little interesting, historically speaking, in the obvious effort of the monopolists to popularize paganism. Their anarchism is not merely an accident. It appears persistently in paper after paper, so as almost to constitute a campaign, that the journalistic campaigns during a war, with their artificial scares and scoops, it goes far beyond harmless trifles like that of this quite innocent lady who thinks that women will rise to higher things by having her hair cut. It waged a newspaper war in defense of divorce, which was almost avowedly one of assault upon marriage. It never loses an opportunity, however trivial, of being on the frivolous side in the most frivolous quarrel. But it is equally eager to be on what it vaguely imagines to be the unorthodox side in any quarrel with orthodoxy. And it is curious to contrast this policy of looseness in ethical problems of sex 
with the parallel policy of savage strictness about the economic problems of labor. Plutocracy has no objection to paganism, but it has a great objection to Bolshevism. The capitalist wishes his employees to be frivolous, for fear they should be serious. In other words, the explanation is really very simple. Frivolity is a substitute for freedom. A certain slackness and loss of sexual dignity is the very real bribe now offered to those who will lose their citizenship in the servile state. They are being offered a Saturnalia of sex as a substitute for Labor Day. It is perhaps the cleverest stroke in all the strategy of the slave raiders, and like most of their strategy, it is as old as the history of slavery. Free love is the freedom of the slave. Promiscuity was the one concession by which those who were not citizens could still be communists. This truth could be attested by 20 historical illustrations. For example, it is the truth attested by both sides in the American quarrel about Negro slavery. The conflicting parties confirming each other in the very act of contradicting each other. For the northern antagonists of Negro slavery, the right way of putting it, was that households were broken up and marriage brutally disregarded. For the southern apologists of Negro slavery, the answer was that the Negroes were largely promiscuous in any case, and probably preferred to be so. In other words, one disputant complained that slave families were disregarded, and the other disputant consoled him by saying that there were no slave families to disregard. Between these two arguments, it will not be difficult for a third party to infer at least that no very rigid code of fidelity in these matters was actually demanded of the black man by the white, nor will it be demanded of a white slave any more than of a black one. Indeed, in this sense, there is a great truth in the journalistic and rather sensational use of the phrase white slave. In one sense, the white slave may have a great deal of liberty. For those who interpret it merely as laxity, the white slaves of the old pagan world often attained all that a free lover would call freedom, and the master of the new servile state will say to the servile proletarian of the future exactly what the lord of the pagan slave state said to the pagan slave or the lord of the negro slave state to the negro slave. So far as sex is concerned, you can pretty well let yourself go. As often as you have the chance, you have no family heritage, you have no family name. You have no property, you have no reputation. It does not matter whether your children are legitimate or illegitimate, for there is nothing that they can legitimately inherit. It does not matter whether your family remains respectable, for nobody will be called upon to respect it. For me, you are simply something that is meant to work, and it does not matter to me how or when you manage to play. Lucky brute, run away and play, and thank your brute gods that you have no vows and that you have no honor, that you have no name. That was the pagan attitude, and that is the common human attitude towards slaves, and that is the attitude of the modern press to the modern proletariat, insofar as they are merely pagan. But there is this difference, that in countries where the Christian tradition has been, there is also something that is not pagan but rather Puritan. For Puritanism is a disease of Christianity, just as capitalism is a disease of property. Therefore, the modern world suffers more from the ancient world, from fads that have the intensity of fates. At least has so suffered ever since the Reformation, that is, ever since the sort of enthusiast who was once content to found a religious order felt it necessary to found a religion. The Puritan vinegar was the second fermentation of the Christian wine. Whenever this acid fermentation has taken place, there is another element complicating the natural connection between slavery and free love. The Puritan feels a responsibility for the slave without feeling a respect for the man. He cannot forget the morality of the thing even when he means to make it more immoral. And as the corruption of the best is the worst, the Puritan tyranny is worse than the pagan tyranny. It cannot rise to the carelessness of paganism. It is not content with making the labors of the servant useful to the master. They wish us to make the very pleasures of the servant also useful to the master. From this arises all the capitalist philanthropy, which enforces athletics or overseas amusements. It is stating a very grim and ironic truth. 
and saying that it encourages exercise. Pure all entertainment is exercise, and only exercise, for it is the preparation for something else. Play is only exercise for work, and work is not work for the profit of the worker, but of the owner. The worker enjoys even sport for the sake of something else, for the benefit of somebody else. From this also, of course, comes every kind of discipline regarding the diet of the slaves. Tatalism today, and possibly vegetarianism tomorrow. From this, finally, comes the insane insolence of eugenics. It seeks to use the pleasure of sex, just as it uses the pleasure of sport. If there lingers some shadowy difference in the party politics, even of this last and most ludicrous of political elections, perhaps this is the difference. If there really are two parties... Perhaps they are the two parties of the pagan slave owner and the Puritan slave owner. The former uses sexuality as bait for slavery. The latter is more scientific and would enslave even sex. Between these two types of slavery, it might be an interesting problem to choose. I do not know any constituency where a third candidate is standing for freedom. End of section 42. Recording by Arden. Section 43 of G.K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Fernandez. G.K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, the New Witness, 1922, by G. K. Chesterton, Section 43. That master of paradox, the Dean of St. Paul's, has been at it again with his gay flippancies, and in a recent issue of the Evening Standard, gave an excellent example of the sides of the paradox as a way of being wrong on both sides at once. It may be an exaggeration to compare the dean to a fairy, but he certainly has the faculty of the Shakespearean fairies of following darkness like a dream, that is, of moving from point to point so carefully as always to remain in the dark. He is the citizen of an empire on which the sun never rises. How it is possible to box the compass without taking the sun is best illustrated in his own words. Some systems of education aim deliberately at making the pupil suggestible for life in certain directions. He is wrongly discouraged from challenging authority. We find exactly the same methods in Roman Catholic schools and in socialist schools. A violent twist is given to the children's minds, which it is hoped they will never be able to rectify. The system usually succeeds only too well. The victim of such training remains for life, incapable of thinking impartially for himself. Even when, as sometimes happens, there is a rigorous reaction against the mental servitude imposed upon him, he becomes not a reasonable citizen, but a rebel, again the government, no matter what the merits of the case may be. If our rulers had known a little more psychology, they could have seen that the one hope for Ireland depended on taking primary education out of the hands of the priests. Since the dean is interested in psychology, he will be glad to know that his own psychological process when writing this paragraph, is very transparent and very entertaining. It is to the scientific eye like watching performing insects in a glass case. First of all, he started out with the idea that it might be possible to have a dig at Catholicism under cover of talking about education, and he selected the old conventional and commonplace fiction that Catholicism crushes the mind with a meekness that is mere servile submission. He throws in the socialists simply because they happen to be another sort of people he dislikes. 
Then he suddenly remembers that the Irish are Catholics, and that the Irish, though despicable and detestable in the last degree, are not exactly despised for their meekness or detested for their submissiveness. He remembers abruptly that the Irish are hardly notable for their servile obedience and passive non-resistance. Even the socialists do not quite seem to fit in somehow. He has to reconstruct his great psychological and educational theory in a great hurry. The great psychological word reaction comes to his rescue. The Irish and the socialists experience a reaction by which their depressing education unduly exhilarates them and they are systematically silenced by being made too noisy. Everyone knows that Dean Ng is the great admirer of Chinese labor in this country, and I think he would be a little surprised if I denounced China as the nation of ancestor worshippers who had naturally become a nation of parasites. I think he might sometimes be tempted to sympathize with Islam against Christendom, and I think he would consider it odd if I said that the Muslims were such strict iconoclasts that they had all without exception become idolaters. He would not be immediately convinced if I proved that the passive character of the Hindu religion was the explanation of the feverish and ferocious activity of Hindus. It would seem a little too suggestive of that familiar criticism about paradoxes. The truth of the matter, of course, is perfectly simple. It is that the dean is entirely wrong about the first facts with which his argument begins. The Hindu religion may in a sense be passive, and Hindus may be in the same sense passive. But the Catholic religion is not in any sense servile, and anyhow, he himself is witness to the fact that the Catholics are not servile. The creed does not crush a man's critical power in any sense whatever. It does not try to do it. But anyhow, he himself admits that it does not do it. He himself admits that it does the exact opposite. He actually sets out to sneer at us for a subservience and has to end the sentence by snarling at our liberty. And now let me apply to the passage the simple test of an elementary knowledge of history. What has been the actual working in practice of this paradox about obedience and rebellion? Unquestionably, the dean is quite right in his formal statements. Catholics, including Irish Catholics, are taught that certain things are true by authority, and Catholics, especially Irish Catholics, do find themselves in conflict with government. Let us consider the concrete facts of what these contradictions have actually been. Irish Catholics, for instance, are taught by the authority of their priests a mystical theory of the value of something called purity. For example, that a woman's possession of herself and freedom from lawless touch is a part of her dignity. We need not here argue about this arbitrary notion. It certainly is affirmed with an authority which claims to be absolute and supernatural. Very well, the people thus instructed did find themselves under a government like that of Pitt in 1798, and this government found it convenient to restore order to the country by a military campaign which very largely consisted of outrages on women. This produced on the drugged intellects of the Catholic a curious corresponding impression. Obsessed with this doctrine of theirs, they did undoubtedly conclude that a rule by rape was in some way wrong. They found themselves against, or as the dean would prefer to say, again, the government. 
people of the sort oppose such government whatever it does whether it tried rape or arson or massacres or the most varied forms of torture they remained nevertheless dissatisfied and aloof the irreconcilable catholics remained rebels and their rebellion did as the dean says depend on their arbitrary doctrine it is quite true that if education had been taken out of the hands of the priests and the people had been taught that purity was worthless they would not have had that reason for rebellious feelings or again it is true that the smallest catholic children are taught that the oppression of the poor is a sin crying to heaven for vengeance and the dogma thus imposed upon them doubtless remained in their minds when thousands of them were evicted merely for voting for their own freedom and deliberately driven to starvation or exile the dean would never have been puzzled so much by their spirit of opposition to government if their minds had not been artificially affected by the dogma about the moral peril of misgovernment the same principle might be extended to any number of small examples castlereagh might have more chance of being remembered as a martyred saint if catholics had not been taught that bribery is wrong bigot might be a more popular figure if they had not been taught that forgery is wrong clan record might be an object of affection if their minds had not been drilled in the doctrine that avarice is one of the seven deadly sins in other words the dean is quite right in supposing that there is a connection between the authority in religion and the resistance in politics but he is wrong in supposing that the connection is merely a reaction the connection is merely a logical connection between the irish having been dogmatically taught that certain things are wicked and the english having incessantly done them but it is perfectly true that it is the morality taught by priests which injects into the popular mind the notion that a black and tan was not perfectly moral in that sense the dean is quite right indeed he is more right than he knows the irish were again that sort of government because they had been educated to think that sort of government was again god almighty but in the face of these plain facts which no historian has ever dared to deny which range over the whole of recent history from the terror of 98 a hundred years ago to the terror of the black and tans 2 years ago i would respectfully suggest that the dean of st paul's is making a fool of himself in regarding irish rebellion as a curious problem of psychology there are many curious problems of psychology in the modern world not excluding that of an educated and sane man who conceives it possible to take away popular education from the popular priesthood i do not know what teachers he would substitute but unless he substitutes those who will teach people that robbery is right that cruelty is admirable that any wrong can be done to the women and the weak of a conquered country and that any lies can be told to whitewash those who have done it he will be nearer to teaching anything that will justify the english record in ireland the morality substituted for the catholic will have to be conceived on bold and novel lines and i should like to see this distinguished christian cleric develop it in his own entertaining fashion end of section 43 Recording by Michelle Fernandez Section 44 of G.K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. G.K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922, by G.K. Chesterton, Section 44. Whenever a travelling fair with swings and roundabouts comes down to Beaconsfield, I always go to see it and generally ride on one of the revolving wooden horses or throw sticks at the Aunt Sally. The latest circus of the sort provides a variation on these sports by inviting us all into booths not to throw sticks at a doll, but to make crosses on a piece of paper, possibly analogous to the game of noughts and crosses, Players are divided according to their preference for blue or red, but there are various additional flourishes about progress and public welfare. I wish I could think that the progress and public welfare would really follow. I also wish that the wooden horses would break loose from the roundabout and gallop gloriously across green fields as a cavalry charge of the revolt. I think one is about as likely as the other, especially in the circumstances of this particular district, and I should like to note them as a curiosity, in case I am never allowed to write about them in any other paper. Some years ago, by an arbitrary alteration of boundaries, all the population passed automatically out of the constituency of the man they had elected into the constituency of a man they had not elected. These free and independent voters were simply handed over to him like a conquered population, or like serfs tied to the land, he was the Conservative member for an adjoining area because all these agricultural areas are regarded as Tory in tradition and loyal to the old English squires. And, therefore, by way of a final joke, his name appears again in this feudal position, and his name is Lionel de Rothschild. This, then, will be the highly pantomimic position on polling day in the little town where I live. All my Tory friends and neighbours, all the honest people who read the Morning Post, the most honest of the Tory journals, all the people who have learned to lament the surrender to the Jews in Palestine, to denounce the cosmopolitan treachery of Jewish finance, to curse the name of Isaac and Samuel for being Jewish and not English, will all march merrily off with ribbons and banners to vote for a Rothschild. Over against them there will be a number of my radical friends and neighbours, equally honest and perhaps rather more earnest, who consider themselves too large-minded, liberal and enlightened to persecute a poor, helpless, oppressed and impoverished Rothschild. They will vote against Rothschild. They will defend the Jew and try to turn him out, as the others will detest the Jew and try to bring him in. But they will not try to turn him out on any of the grounds that one would naturally imagine as likely to set a radical against a Rothschild. They will not oppose him because he is a plutocrat, or a millionaire, or a mere cadet of a great capitalist house, or a man raised by random wealth above his fellows. Hardly any of these things will even be mentioned as the main matter of opposition. They oppose him on the ground that he has not regularly attended the House of Commons, which is perhaps the only point on which he has my hearty sympathy. They also say that a sacred thing called free trade must be protected against a terrible thing called tariff reform, which, by the way, Rothschild's leader has solemnly promised not to introduce at all. The others will support Rothschild because he is a unionist. That he is a believer in the union with Ireland that has already been abolished, and which Rothschild's leader has also solemnly promised not to attempt to restore. In short, whether they vote for Rothschild or against Rothschild, they will all vote against themselves. They will elect a man solely to support things which he is admittedly not going to support, or even to have the chance to support. Such genuine political opinions as these people ever do express in private, they are going to do their best to frustrate in public. Some of their opinions agree with mine, and some do not agree with mine, but none of their opinions will agree with their votes. With a small working model like that immediately under my nose, I am not likely to repent my refusal to take the general election seriously, nor indeed are most of my neighbours, whether Tory or Radical, taking it very seriously. It has very largely ceased even to be taken frivolously. It has ceased to be a sport 
and become a routine. The only argument against this is that routine means Rothschild. The people will, so to speak, elect him in their sleep, but if I were to attempt to wake them up by going out into the street and telling them any of the real reasons for rejecting a Rothschild, it is certain that every political organisation would reject me. If I were asked why all these men making chairs or cutting down trees in the woods of Buckingham should be represented by a Jewish banker with a German name, I do not know which of the two parties would be more annoyed. The Conservatives would be shocked at my disrespect to a banker, the Progressives at my disrespect to a Jew, or possibly to a German. I might try to make the Tories ashamed of themselves by asking what they would say if a Liberal or a Labour family were posted like the Rothschild family in every foreign capital. Suppose there were actually a Signor Lansbury at Rome and a Herr Landsberg at Berlin, brothers or cousins of our own George. Should we ever hear the last of the international treason of socialism? A man like Lansbury is accused of having friends in every country but his own. But at least he has not got relations in every country but his own, or as well as his own. That is only permitted to patriotic conservatives like the Rothschilds. Before I conclude this article, and possibly this series of articles, it is not irrelevant in this connection to answer a question which recently appeared in our columns of correspondence. A gentleman speaking for the Jews asked, in a very courteous and reasonable tone, whether our criticism was not inconsistent, since we sometimes blame the Jews for capitalism and sometimes for socialism. There is no matter I would more willingly make clear in a final summary of my whole position. It is the whole point of this paper to maintain that there is no contradiction here, but absolute consistency. Capitalism and collectivism are not contrary things. It is clearer every day that they are two forms of the same thing. Nobody will get near it by using old terms like socialist and individualist, which have become as rigidly unreal as terms like liberal and conservative. We shall get near it only by forgetting names and realising things. There is a certain mentality to which it comes natural that numbers of men should be dependent on great centralised systems, doling out to them their food and work, if the food be ample and the work tolerable. The direction always remains at the centre. Whether those directors are called owners of the capital or rulers of the community is a question which has, in practice, become something like a fine shade. The Bolshevist commissar has the handling of great wealth, doubtless in an official and impersonal way, but so does the capitalist handle even his own wealth in a very official and impersonal way. It is too big to handle in a personal way. The capitalist doubtless applies part of it to himself in the sense of living more luxuriously than his staff of subordinates, but so does the communist official live more luxuriously than his subordinates. Perhaps he is practically obliged to do so anyhow he does. Put yourself in the position of an employee paid fairly reasonably for routine work in one of the enormous anonymous modern departments of big business, and consider how very little difference it would make to hear that the remote, invisible directing power of the whole thing had been nationalised. I once heard a man defend modern monopolies of this kind against the charge of destroying competition by saying that there was still plenty of competition inside the big shop for particular posts and powers. In principle, this can only be a competition in courting and flattering a master, and is therefore morally akin to a mere mob of oriental slaves, seeing who can bow lowest or run quickest. It is not competition as it can be between two farmers or two fishermen, which is the competition of fighters and free men. But there is another point about that apology, which the apologist certainly failed to notice. In order to answer this criticism from the distributive school, he had really surrendered his whole case against the socialist school. For if this competition for posts among the employees of one business is all we require, there is no reason why a state department should not give us what we require. There is no reason why 
we should not all be content to compete inside one business, and that business the state. Even under state socialism, there would have to be different posts and probably different salaries, certainly different scales of expenses. In short, big business and Bolshevism are only rivals in the sense of making rival efforts to do the same thing, and they are more and more even doing it in the same way. I am not surprised that the cleverest men doing it, in both cases, are Jews. And this is not in the least because I dislike Jews, for everybody who knows me knows that I do not. It is because I know the Jews to be, unfortunately, cut off from one particular ideal, which is the only possible alternative ideal to their collectivist capitalism and their capitalist collectivism. The Jew may be a philanthropist or a usurer, he may be a social reformer or a sweater, but nobody in his senses will say that he is primarily a peasant. Nobody in his senses will pretend that the Jew has particular sympathy with the pride and point of honour of the peasant. Now our alternative policy is an appeal, not indeed merely to a peasantry, but to those ideals they are the strength of a peasantry. Those ideals of independence are native to all Western soils. They still hang about, like thunder in the mountains, in the echoes of a hundred songs about freedom. They still linger in all the legends about local patriots and the heroes of small nations. They have but one burden, that no man must accept luxury instead of liberty, and that poverty and thrift look down as from a throne on all that multitudinous humanity that bears the badge of the slave. I look out again on the beech woods of this countryside, and I know that the yeoman spirit was as native to my country as to others, and that Robin Hood could bend a bow as well as William Tell. But I know that to adopt this alternative ideal in England is truly to be a revolutionist, in a real sense in which no man is a revolutionist when he is merely a Bolshevist. That sort of Robin Hood will indeed be an outlaw and will be charged only with drawing the long bow. He is doing the one thing that is really thought eccentric. He is aiming at the centre, at the shining centre of the target. End of section 44 Recording by Christopher Gilson Section 45 of G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lisa Borden. G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922. By G. K. Chesterton. Section 46. At the Sign of the World's End. Are the Journalists Joking? By G. K. Chesterton. There was published, just before the election, in one of the illustrated daily papers, a very remarkable leading article. A considerable part of it was printed in capital letters. And well it might be. It was a convenience to have the statements set out plainly, in very large type, partly to satisfy the eyes, which, by studying picture papers, are rapidly sinking back into a savage taste for picture writing, but partly also because otherwise any reader more or less sane might really have some difficulty in believing his eyes. The big type and bold spacing were equivalent to a special and solemn assurance that some human being had really and truly conceived these thoughts and had desired to write them down. The article was all about the value and responsibility of the vote. In this, it did not differ from many others. Indeed, I imagine that some moral sentiments of the sort are kept in a solid block in most newspaper printing offices. But of the sentences that specially interested me, one described what were or should be the sensations of the ordinary poor clerk or workman when going to the polling station, and it was printed like this. There is no man in the country who has more power than I have. 
This, it will be agreed, is a proposition that deserves to be printed in very large letters indeed. As a description of the most ideal democracy that ever visited the dreams of men, the remark would have something rather arresting and even challenging about it. As a description of real democracy, as it can sometimes exist in peasant villages and other simple communities, it would be, to say the least of it, rather too good to be true. As a description of modern plutocracy, it is... What is it? What word in the mouth of mortal man is capable of saying what it is? Then, the little clerk or navvy, as he goes forth confronted with the knowledge that Beaverbrook, or Leverhume, can do nothing which he himself cannot do quite as easily, proceeds to the consideration of what his overwhelming omnipotence shall decide upon doing. In this matter, he is assisted by another sentence, which runs, There has never been a general election so serious as this one. In the past, perhaps, people may have fought and killed each other for political issues on which elections turned. Sometimes they have turned on issues for which men consented to be burned alive. But there is nothing in all this to compare with the deadly dilemma of those who have to choose between Mr. Law, who is for peace and cautious reform, and Mr. George, who is for cautious reform and peace, and Mr. Asquith, who is for peace, caution, and reform, and Mr. Kleins, who, on the other hand, is for reform and peace with the addition of caution. Now, when it comes to this sort of thing, a question arises in most of our minds, and it concerns the sense of humor among journalists. Every journalist knows that numbers of journalists have to write what they do not believe, but at least we commonly assume that they write what they want their readers to believe. But suppose, after all, that they actually wrote with the opposite object. Suppose they deliberately wrote what their readers could not believe, because it was too absurd. To believe. In other words, suppose they actually tried to provoke a reaction against themselves. Suppose they worked for an insurrection by irony instead of by direct incitement. The stages of such a progress of satire would certainly be entertaining to watch, for it would be part of the art of this delicate propaganda that it proceeded by degrees. The writers would begin, let us say, by saying dull and ordinary and obvious things, as that Mr. George is a wizard, that he has magnets for eyes, and that this personal fascination accounts for his colossal popularity with the English trade unions and the English gentry. Then they would go a little beyond the ordinary and say that Mr. George is a man of such immense learning that he talks Greek, Sanskrit, and Coptic by preference at breakfast and lunch and cares so little for publicity that he invariably answers letters in Egyptian hieroglyphics. Then they would pass boldly beyond such disputable domestic details and simply assert that Mr. George is seven feet high, with a head like a Greek god, and three times the strength of Sandow. This would prepare the way for the final assertion that he really is a god, that he is a hundred feet high and wears the noonday sun for a crown. None of these statements are in the old-fashioned sense true, but all are in a descending series of truth, and it would be interesting to see at what stage, if any, of the series, the public began to doubt their truth. I remember trying this trick in the days of my youth, when a friend of mine and I were wedged in a jingo mob during the Boer War. We called for cheers for one South African imperialist after another, selecting more and more Semitic individuals with more and more Teutonic names till the irony of our intention was perceived. We began our list of empire builders with Rhodes and went on to Rutherford Harris and to Bate. But by the time we had secured hearty British cheers for Eckstein and Albu, the crowd discovered that it had been lured into a logical trap and a free fight ensued. But that is the method that might very well be adopted by the movement I have in mind. The fun would consist in seeing how soon the fun was discovered that is, how soon the most credulous found out that it was they who were being made fun of. And as I have already said, one is sometimes tempted to believe that the fun has already started. I have said that it must in its nature go further and further by degrees, but again, 
one is tempted sometimes to say that it could hardly go further than it has. After all, could one say anything much more extraordinary than that nobody in the modern world has more power than a dustman with a vote? Could anyone say anything wilder than that the differences between the election of addresses at the last election were the most deadly divisions in all English history? I have suggested that this game should begin, but it may be that the game has been going on for a long time and is even ending because it can go no further. We have sometimes ventured to laugh at our more conventional contemporaries, but suppose that in this sense they have been laughing at us. I trust we should have sufficient magnanimity to rejoice in the discovery of this more subtle and even secret revolution. The leader writer in the time seems to be solemn. Perhaps he is really roaring with laughter all the time he writes. The editor of the Daily Telegraph is supposed to be serious, but can anybody be so serious as he is supposed to be? Perhaps he is also dancing wildly about the office, delighted with the thought of what everybody thinks about the paper. Perhaps all these educated and often excellently informed gentlemen are really only drawing elaborate caricatures of themselves. Perhaps the man writing on the Manchester Guardian is only giving his admirable imitation of a man writing on the Manchester Guardian. Possibly the spectator is only a parody of the spectator. It would explain so much that is otherwise inexplicable. And after all, what cleverer parody could there possibly be? There was a time in the great coalitionist epoch when so able a paper as the Observer practically treated the Premier as if he were the Pope. But was it only kissing his toe in order to pull his leg? The thought of which pleases me very much. There would be something national about such a note of boisterous bathos, the thought of which pleases me very much, and restores my confidence in my fellow countrymen. When they butter up a politician, perhaps they were only making a butter slide. Perhaps the triumphal arch was something of a booby trap. In short, is it possible that journalists, who are intelligent enough as individuals, can take the illegible word system, and the politicians and parliament and the general election, and all the rest of it, with such gravity as anyone would suppose from reading their remarks? Are all the men of the world quite so ignorant of the world as they make out? I should like to study once more the inscrutable faces of those sphinxes, the editors of the Times and the Spectator. I have sometimes dared to guess that even, illegible word, is not so solemn as it seems. I like to indulge the fancy that by this curved or crooked English road might come at least that shy thing, the English Revolution. Irish rebels fight with pistols, and Italian rebels with guns, and Russian rebels with bombs. It would be beautifully fitting if English rebels fought with booby traps and butter slides. In the first act of the farce, there might be rather too much butter, but it is reassuring to remember that there are quite enough boobies. If the game is to make fools of our more pompous publicists, there are many who will lend themselves to the manufacture, and some for whom the manufacture is hardly needed. All the factories of a manufacturing age may be regarded collectively as a factory of fools. For we are all prone to make fools of ourselves when we are subject to flattery and safe from free criticism, and the millionaires who rule the modern state are more fatuously flattered and less seriously criticized than any of the more responsible rulers of human history. Perhaps after all the flattery will become so florid and extravagant as to cure itself, as did many of the flatteries of princes and nobles in the past. In some of the cases, such as these which I have quoted, the joke has not only become too funny to be mistaken, but almost too obvious to be funny. But to have kept up the joke, if it is a joke, so long and so successfully is really the achievement of an artist, and I offer my very hearty admiration to any such journalist. I apologize to him if I have slandered him in thinking him sincere. End of section 45section 46 of g k chesterton's newspaper columns the new witness 
1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns. The New Witness. 1922. By G. K. Chesterton. Section 46. Shakespeare and the Legal Lady. By G. K. Chesterton. There was one phrase perpetually repeated and now practically stereotyped, which to my mind concentrates and sums up all the very worst qualities and the very worst journalism, all its paralysis of thought, all its monotony of chatter, all its sham culture and shoddy picturesqueness, all its perpetual readiness to cover any vulgarity of the present with any sentimentalism about the past. There is one phrase that does measure to how low an ebb the mind of my unfortunate profession has sunk. It is the habit of perpetually calling any of the new lady barristers Portia. First of all, of course, it is quite clear that the journalist does not know who Portia was. If he has ever heard of the story of the Merchant of Venice, he has managed to miss the only point of the story. Suppose a man had been so instructed in the story of As You Like It, that he remained under the impression that Rosalind really was a boy, and was the brother of Celia. We should say that the plot of the comedy had reached his mind in a rather confused form. Suppose a man had seen a whole performance of the play of Twelfth Night, without discovering the fact that the page called Cesario was really a girl called Viola. We should say that he had succeeded in seeing the play without exactly seeing the point. But there is exactly the same blind stupidity in calling a barrister Portia, or even in calling Portia a barrister. It misses, in exactly the same sense, the whole meaning of the scene. Portia is no more a barrister than Rosalind is a boy. The whole point of her position is she is no more the learned jurist whom Shylock congratulates than Viola is the adventurous page whom Olivia loves. The whole point of her position is that she is a heroic and magnanimous fraud. She has not taken up the legal profession, or any profession, she has not sought that public duty, or any public duty. Her action, from first to last, is wholly and entirely private. Her motives are not professional, but private. Her ideal is not public, but private. She acts as much on personal grounds in the trial science as she does in the casket scene. She acts in order to save a friend, and especially a friend of the husband whom she loves. Anything less like the attitude of an advocate for good or evil, could not be conceived. She seeks individually to save an individual, and in order to do so, is ready to break all of the existing laws of the profession, and the public tribunal, to assume lawlessly powers she has not got, to intrude where she would never be legally admitted, to pretend to be somebody else, to dress up as a man, to do what is actually a crime against the law. This is not what is now called the attitude of a public woman. It is certainly not the attitude of a lady lawyer, any more than of any other kind of lawyer. But it is emphatically the attitude of a private woman, that much more ancient and much more powerful thing. Suppose that Portia had really become an advocate, merely by advocating the cause of Antonio against Shylock. The first thing that follows is that, as like as not, she would be briefed, in the next case to advocate the cause of Shylock against Antonio, she would, in the ordinary way of business, have to help Shylock to punish with ruin the private extravagances of Graciano. She would, in the ordinary way of business, have to help Shylock to punish with ruin the private extravagances of Graciano. She would have to assist Shylock to distrain on poor Lancelot Gobo and sell up all his miserable sticks she might well be employed by him to ruin the happiness of lorenzo and jessica by urging some obsolete parental power or some technical flaw in the marriage service shylock evidently had a great admiration for her forensic talents and indeed that sort of lucid and detached admission of the talents of a successful opponent is a very jewish characteristic there seems no reason 
why he should not have employed her regularly whenever he wanted someone to recover ruthless interest to ruin needy households to drive towards theft or suicide the souls of desperate men there seems every reason to doubt whether the portia whom shakespeare describes for us is likely to have taken on the job anyhow that is the job and i am not here arguing that it is not a necessary job or that it is always an indefensible job many honourable men have made an arguable case for the advocate who has to support shylock and and much worse than shylock but that is the job and to cover up its ugly realities with a loose literary quotation that really refers to the exact opposite is one of those crawling and cowardly evasions and verbal fictions which make all this sort of servile journalism so useless for every worthy or working purpose if we wish to consider whether a lady should be a barrister we should consider sanely and clearly what a barrister is and what a lady is and then come to our own conclusion according to what we considered worthy or worthless in the traditions of the two things but the spirit of advertisement which tries to associate soap with sunlight or grape nuts with grapes calls to its rescue an old romance of venice and tries to cover up a practical problem in the robes of a romantic heroine of the stage there is a sort of confusion that really leads to corruption in one sense it would matter very little that the legal profession was formally open to women for it is only a very exceptional sort of woman who would see herself as a vision of beauty and the character of mr sergeant buzzfuzz and most girls are more likely to be stage-struck and want to be the real portia on the stage rather than law-struck and want to be the very reverse of portia in a law court for that matter it would make relatively little difference if formal permission were given to a woman to be a hangman or a torturer very few women would have a taste for it and very few men would have a taste for the women who had a taste for it but advertisement by its use of the vulgar picturesque can hide the realities of this professional problem as it can hide the realities of tinned meat and patent medicines it can conceal the fact that the hangman exists to hang and the torturer exists to torture similarly it can conceal the fact that the buzzfuzz barrister exists to bully it can hide from the innocent female aspirants outside even the perils and potential abuses that would be admitted by the honest male advocate inside and that is part of a very much larger problem which extends beyond this particular profession to a great many other professions and not least to the lowest and most lucrative of all modern professions that of professional politics i wonder how many people are still duped by the story of the extension of the franchise i wonder how many radicals have been a little mystified in remarking how many tories and reactionaries have helped in the extension of the franchise the truth is that calling in crowds of new voters will very often be to the interest not only of tories but of really tyrannical tories it will often be in the interest of the guilty to appeal to the innocent if they are innocent in the matter of other people's conduct as well as of their own the tyrant calls in those he has not wronged to defend him against those he has wronged he is not afraid of the new and ignorant masses who know too little he is afraid of the older and nearer nucleus of those who know too much and there is nothing that would please the professional politician more than to flood the constituencies with innocent negroes or remote chinamen who might possibly admire him more because they knew him less i should not wonder if the party system had been saved three or four times at the point of extinction by the introduction of new voters who had never had time to discover why it deserved to be extinguished the last of these rescues by an inrush of dupes was the enfranchisement of women what is true of the political is equally true of the professional ambition much of the mere imitation of masculine tricks and trades is indeed trivial enough it is a mere masquerade the greatest of roman satirists noted that in his day the more fast of the fashionable ladies liked to fight as gladiators in the amphitheatre in that one statement he pinned and killed like moths on a cork a host of the women prophets and women pioneers and large-minded liberators of their sex in modern england and america but besides these more showy she gladiators there are also multitudes of worthy and sincere women who take the new or rather old professions seriously 
the only disadvantage is that in many of those professions they can only continue to be serious by ceasing to be sincere but the simplicity with which they first set out is an enormous support to old and complex and corrupt institutions no modest person setting out to learn an elaborate science can be expected to start with the assumption that it is not worth learning the young lady will naturally begin to learn law as gravely as she begins to learn greek it is not in that mood that she will conceive independent doubts about the ultimate relations of law and justice just as the suffragettes are already complaining that the realism of industrial revolution interferes with their new hobby of voting so the lady lawyers are quite likely to complain that the realism of legal reformers interferes with their new hobby of legalism we are suffering in every department from the same cross purposes that can be seen in the case of any vulgar patent medicine in law and medicine we have the thing advertised in the public press instead of analyzed by the public authority what we want is not the journalistic portia but the theatrical portia who is always the real portia we do not want the woman who will enter the law court with the solemn sense of the lasting vocation we want a portia a woman who will enter it as lightly and leave it as gladly as she did end of section forty six recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida section forty seven of g k chesterton's newspaper columns the new witness nineteen twenty two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by greg giordano g k chesterton's newspaper columns the new witness nineteen twenty two by g k chesterton section forty seven bethlehem and the great cities by g k chesterton the burden upon us is that we are not ruled by men of ordinary ignorance but of extraordinary ignorance of many of the millionaires who so rule us we may even say that they have grown rich by their extraordinary ignorance in the sense of their extraordinary indifference to anything except growing rich a man who devoted his whole life to collecting stamps would have a rather narrow outlook on history and humanity if only because it would be limited by the institution of the postage his album could not very well contain a yellow stamp of the time of confucius or a green stamp with the dragon of king arthur but the mind of a man collecting stamps will be much broader than that of a man merely collecting coins in the sense of money that sort of numismatist is narrower than the philatelist because of the nature because by the nature of the case he collects no coin except current coin the numismatics of one age and country the stamp collector with extended view can at least survey the world from china to peru if not from confucius to montezuma the philatelist's eye in a fine frenzy rolling can glance if not from earth to heaven at least from australasia to alaska and a man interested in money is interested in the money of the moment and of the market nearest to him hence the very rich will generally be found to be very uneducated not only in the sense of not having been educated but in the sense of not having educated themselves such a man often boasts of being self-educated but it would be truer to say that he is self-restricted or even self-benighted and as it is with the plutocrats so it is naturally enough with their servants in plutocratic politics their ignorance is not normal ignorance the ignorance of things known to macaulay's schoolboy macaulay for instance describes with derision the excitement of the old duke of newcastle when being told by somebody that cape breton was an island i doubt whether many people knew anything about cape breton or whether it is an island but as in the case of corruption the awful examples of the eighteenth century are mild compared to the mildest gossip of the twentieth 
and a man told me the other day that two politicians recently got an atlas to look for the dardanelles and proceeded to look for it in the western end of the mediterranean that is not being ignorant of geography i am grossly ignorant of geography myself that is being ignorant of daily life of common human speech of proverbial expressions popular quotations and music hall songs it is like not having been taught to talk though indeed we may say that politicians have only been taught to talk and not to listen but i heard the other day an even more extraordinary example of nescience than not knowing that the dardanelles are in the neighborhood of turkey i was told that a politician when informed that the vatican was making some inquiries about zionism and the palestinian problem said with complete innocence oh what has the pope to do with palestine i do not know what answer was given i do not know whether any one explained how the pope came to concern himself with certain curious and remote incidents that are sometimes alleged to have occurred there those are only two examples out of many and i could at random give a third not unconnected with the second i was once at the same dinner-table with a newspaper proprietor who regarded himself and was regarded as the dictator of europe and who really was to far too great an extent the dictator of england he also shared the morbid and unnatural curiosity of his holiness at the vatican he also was interested in palestine and in the course of conversation i learned that he had never even heard of the latin kingdom of jerusalem i suppose he had seen crusaders in pictures or fancy dress balls but he had no notion of what they did and certainly no notion that what they did was to conquer and make palestine a part of europe for a hundred years filling it with abbeys like those of glastonbury or st andrews and castles like those of conway and carnarvon now that is a point that interests me a great deal because the traces of it are very obvious to any traveller who happens to have been there the first fact that strikes him about jerusalem is that it is a medieval town long before it strikes him especially as an oriental town it has that curious combination of coziness and defiance that belongs to the walled cities and painted pales and fences of the life of the middle ages the latest walls were built by the successors of the saracens but they are not in our sense saracenic most of the windows and gates are in their whole spirit gothic the franciscan going by with his beard and brown habit under those grey gothic walls seems to be entirely in the picture and even in the conventional picture it is rather the arab coming in with his coloured turban or bernius who seems for the moment if only by a sort of optical illusion to be a stranger in one string from a far-off eastern land i had a rather parallel experience when i first saw rome in the case of rome as in the case of jerusalem people seem to have lost their own impressions in the disproportionate emphasis of detail among guides and guide-books the general impression of rome is not the forum or even the Colosseum. we might almost say that they are curiosities in the neighbourhood we might almost say that they are to st peter's what stonehenge is to salisbury cathedral the overwhelming impression is not that of pagan but of papal rome but especially rome of the renaissance popes i say it is the overwhelming impression it would not be to everybody a pleasing impression it might annoy a man and only if he were too narrowly puritan but also if he were too narrowly medieval it did annoy ruskin and might well have annoyed william morris nor is their criticism a thing merely to be criticised there is in that classical exuberance much that is really florid and false but that is the impression and it is quite certainly the stamp and imprint of the great popes of the renaissance renaissance rome is not merely heathen any more than jerusalem is merely jewish or merely muslim and those huge fountains where the tritons look like titans in the twilight they have none the less been really baptized by those waters 
the cross on the top of the primeval obelisks is not a contradiction but a culmination the culmination culminates on that high column where our lady stands at once vanquishing and exalting the symbol of diana with her foot upon the horns of the moon i have mentioned these two cases for the sake of a truth which any real traveller will have found out for himself our recent and rather provincial tradition greatly exaggerated the proportion of such places that is pagan or barbaric or even merely primeval it was much more than we were taught to suppose of the traces of civilization and even of our own civilization but as my memory returns to palestine by this rambling path i remember what may really be called in a deeper and more subtle sense an exception palestine itself was filled so to speak with norman castles and catholic shrines and in so far as jerusalem does often suggest the moslem it is chiefly because the moslem does suggest the crusades but there was one experience in palestinian travel that really is something more than merely historical something that is too human to be historical it is certainly not pagan but it is in a sense primeval it is the one thing that really does seem to be connected with christianity and not with christendom i have called it primeval because there is in this greatest of all origins an atmosphere truly to be called original this one vision really does primarily suggest pilgrimages and shrines and medieval spires or medieval spears it does rather suggest ancestral dawns and mystical abysses in the end of chaos and the creation of light i mean the experience of bethlehem the heart of bethlehem is a cavern the sunken cave which is the traditional scene of the nativity nine times out of ten these traditions are true this is wholly rarely the truth about the countryside for it is into the subterranean stables that the people have driven themselves and they are by far the likeliest places of refuge for a homeless group it is curious to consider what number and varied versions of the bethlehem story have been turned into pictures no man who understands christianity can complain that they are all different from each other and different from the truth or rather the fact it is the point of the story that it happened in one particular time and place that might have been any particular human place in sunnyside colonnade in italy or a snow-laden cottage in spain it is yet more curious that some modern artists have put themselves on merely topographical truth and yet have made much of this truth about the dark and sacred underground it seems strange that they have emphasized the one case in which realism really trumps realism seems strange that they have emphasized the one case in which realism really trumps reality there is something beyond expression moving the imagination and the idea of the holy fugitives being lower than the very land as if the earth had swallowed up the glory of god like gold buried in the ground perhaps the image is too deep for art even in the sense of dealing in another dimension for it might be difficult for any artist to convey simultaneously the divine secret of the cavern and cavalcade of the mysterious kings trampling the rocky and shaking the cavern roof yet the medieval painting would often represent parallel scenes on the same canvas the medieval popular theatre which the guildsmen working about the streets was sometimes a structure of three feet with one scene above another something of the sort reminds our childish dreams in peter pan and the comparison is more profane than it might be for there is a christian version of peter pan that is more real than the real one a version of peter pan in which there is less of pan and more of peter a more serious parallel having something of the indescribable image can be found in those tremendous works of francis thompson east ah east of himalay dwell the nations underground hiding from the shock of day from the sun's uprising sound but no poetry even of the greatest poets will ever express all that is hidden in that image of the light of the world born in that subterranean sun only these prosaic notes remain to suggest what one individual felt about bethlehem 
and I give them to the Christmas number of this paper. End of section 47. Recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section 48 of G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922, by G. K. Chesterton. At the Sign of the World's End On Professors and Professors Professor Fillmore filled the central page of this paper with a review of my very small collection of verses, and I hope that the display of it will be taken as a tribute to his prose and not to my poetry. He is the spirit of criticism I do not feel competent to criticize except for excess of generosity but in the course of it he expressed his confidence that his straws would not return in the shape of brickbats from the sign of the world's end. Alas, I know well that the his straws would be weightier than my brickbats, but though I am not likely to fulfill the apologue, I hope he will not mind if in some sense I reverse it, for even as I read it, I reflected that my work is indeed like straws and his in comparison like bricks. I believe that some of my straws show how the great wind is blowing, though others might compare them to the straws that certain psychological types are said to stick in their hair. Among the Babylonians, I believe, an essay could be not only metaphorically a brickbat, but literally a brick. Mr. J. C. Squire has inspired an architecture club with the object of uniting architects and critics, clearly that they should be united in the Babylonian manner. Mr. Squire might publish a wall and one or two turrets on the subject, and the volume of the Mercury might be a temple of Hermes. But the only sort of work that really would be Babylonian, in its massiveness and endurance, having even in paper some of the dignity of stone, is critical work like that of Professor Fillmore's Introduction to Philostratus. Professor Fillmore is far too learned a man to despise my ignorance. Still more emphatically, is he far too learned to despise my levity? The worst is the corruption of the best. I beg to announce that I know just enough Latin to put this in the original if I choose, and is dead learning, like that of the Prussian professor, is of all things the most despicable. So I do seriously think that living learning, like that of Professor Fillmore, learning that is full of humor and of decision, is of all human things the most glorious. I know it will only amuse him if I confess to feeling somewhat dazed by the detailed metrical schemes of classical antiquity, in which I appear to move with unconscious and almost unearthly dexterity, as in some forgotten but elaborate dance performed by a somnambulist. When I learn from him how I have written poetry, I feel a little like Monsieur Jourdain when he discovered that he had always talked prose. In the coarse sense of the conscious mind and of common cerebration, I confess that I do not know what a galliambic of the catalyst is, but evidently, whatever it is, I can do it all right. I did once know what elegiacs are, at least I thought I did, but the news that I can write them rather shakes my credulity on the point. I am haunted by profane memories of a comic song of my youth, which described in a torrent of polysyllables the sensations of a gentleman suffering from a number of internal maladies, of the names and localities of which he was only confusedly aware. It is still further confused in my own memory, especially in the matter of the spelling, but I think two of the lines ran, I got the oam persuadic, and I don't know where I am. I've got the oam perosotic in my parallelogram, and there was obviously no inconsistency between this diagnosis and the further confession that I've got the oam perosotic and I don't know where it is. Now any discussion about psychoanalysis can bring tears to my eyes by recalling that lost lyric of my boyhood. But I had supposed my own lyrics to be simpler in form, 
as they are simple enough in sentiment and it is almost with a kind of awe that i realize their subconscious complexity i've got the gall iambics and i find it rather odd i've got the gall iambics in my anapestopod it's worse than the pianic which is going pretty far i've got the gal iambics and i don't know what they are only there is one rather important difference between the gal iambic of professor fillmore and the amperozoic of professor freud the latter i think wants to call the amperozoic the oedipus complex or some terrible substitute of the sort but that is not the difference i have in mind the difference is that i really do know that the gal iambic exists because professor fillmore says so whereas i do not in the least know or even think that the oedipus oomperzoatic exists because professor freud says so and that difference involves the whole meaning of that profound and much misunderstood thing which is called authority to begin with there is a difference in the nature of the studies for one is a knowledge of things which do at any rate exist to be known and the other is a conjecture about things that may not exist at all i may not know what the gall iambics of catalyst were but i know who catalyst was and i know that professor fillmore knows more about him than i do but i do not know that professor freud knows the secret part of my own mind better than i do i know that there is a pre-christian civilization in a very different sense from that in which i know even that there is a subconscious mind i certainly do not believe there is an oedipus complex as i believe there was an oedipus trilogy one reason is that the latter sort of fact has stood so long in the world that thousands of other things have indirectly confirmed it and been found consistent with it hundreds of fillmores have been at work on it hundreds of men who were both scholarly and sincere have found it to be a fact or they would certainly have denounced it as a fraud but i know that psychoanalysis owes even the appearance of truth not to being old but to being new it is run after because it is young enough to be a fashion like any young fashionable lady that is because it is not old enough to be either a fact or a fraud i may see any number of fashionable young ladies running after the fashion and the same much older knowledge tells me that both will grow old but professor fillmore deals with old things that have refused to grow old perhaps it would be truer to say that they have already in a definite and double sense grown old for good in a sense far less silly than the scientific one he does really deal with the survival of the fittest all that the scientists do is to prophesy at random that the o amperzoatic will certainly survive anyhow we shall not survive to see whether the holy o amperzoatic really survives or not now anybody who knows anything of the real history of these theories knows that all history is a rubbish heap of such theories abandoned the instances on which popular science and popular history insist are not really examples but exceptions for an example that is an exception is not an example at all cases like the circulation of the blood and the revolution of the earth are things that themselves circulate and revolve in the controversy like a stage army they cannot be selected as proofs of the success and survival of hypotheses they are selected as the only hypotheses that have succeeded and survived just as galileo is mentioned with monotonous regularity because he is really the only example of the church having persecuted an astronomer so his theory is always mentioned because it is almost the only theory that has been universally accepted as a fixed and final part of astronomy and even now we do not know what the successors of einstein will do with the dogmas of galileo of the greater number of scientific theories and even the most plausible we have seen the instability even in our own time darwin's survival of the fittest will not survive the conservation of energy has not been conserved some hold that the electron has electrocuted the atom and as for the vast mass of minor speculations about physiology and psychology there must be a wilderness of waste paper for anyone who is acquainted with the controversies of the past for anyone so instructed therefore 
it will appear impossible for any professor to spring up suddenly as an authority on the prospects of such things it means being an authority on the day after tomorrow and a professor of the middle of next week the disciples who disputed about who should sit on thrones in heaven really had a great deal more to go on than the academic person claiming to occupy that aerial chair yet the modern world practically only uses the word authority in connection with the author of a new hypothesis the author is an authority on his own hypothesis on what his own hypothesis is but there his authority really ceases it is far less than the authority of one who studies not a new thing in the light of hypothesis but an old thing in the light of history and if this be true of any science it is especially true of psychology for the very meaning of the word confesses that it is searching an unfathomable thing superficially there may be a similarity between professor fillmore when he tells me i write galliambic without knowing it and professor freud when he tells me that i have a complex without knowing it but though the former is something that i do not know it is something that i could know the latter is really something that nobody could possibly know i could find out for certain what a gall iambic is and count my own metrical scansion by this test i do not know how my own words run in a way in which i can never know where my own thoughts come from in other words the old learning is at least potentially popular while the new is in its nature narrowed by an oligarchy of mystagogues. End of section 48。section 49 of G. K. Chesterton's newspaper columns。The New Witness, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joseph Grimer. G. K. Chesterton's newspaper columns, The New Witness, 1922, by G. K. Chesterton, Poland and the Pedants. A little while ago, I happened to read, in a recognised and reasonably reliable English encyclopaedia, an article on Poland. I only happened to read it, for I was playing the parlour game of encyclopaedias, which is both varied and adventurous. The information I had derived had been diversified in character, and connected by a somewhat arbitrary common factor. Any one conversing with me about the revival of learning will find my information about Politian rather out of proportion to my rather rudimentary knowledge of other Renaissance scholars. It will be observed that I frequently turn the conversation to the subject of Cardinal Pole, that interesting figure, to the neglect of similarly interesting figures. On polygamy and polar expeditions, those kindred topics, I am almost in the defiant mood of a specialist. On the habits of the polecat, I challenge all comers on the habits of the politician, a creature of somewhat similar name and habits. I can find no notes made by any naturalist reported in this work of reference. And perhaps that is because no encyclopedia can be literally up to date, and the ways of various kinds of vermin have been more specially and consciously studied since the issue of work. Anyhow, this sort of accidental antiquity is the only explanation of the article on Poland. If we wish to understand how big a blunder England made in its industrial and capitalist phase, the way to discover it is not to read the popular press, but the popular works of reference. The daily papers are accustomed to daily somersaults and daily surrenders. They are always ready to turn Poincare from a sage into a swashbuckler, or Collins from a murderer into a martyr. And it is in part of their conception of progress that with every new folly they forget the last folly, not only contradict it, but deny that they ever had it. Nobody could guess from an article on Tim Healy in today's paper what the articles on Tim Healy in the same paper used always to be like. Harmsworth could use the Kitchener he reviled to hide the Kitchener he had idolatrized, and the Daily Mail that ran George down accepted no responsibility for the Daily Mail that cried him up. But an encyclopedia does, in a dreadful sense, fix folly as it flies, and immortalize the imbecility of an instant like those pitiless snapshots in the picture papers which show a politician screwing up one eye or standing on one leg. The average encyclopedia is about ten years old. Much of it, of course, is very much older. But if the average reader will read the average encyclopedia, he will come on the reading revelation of all the tosh that he himself was talking ten years ago. If he has any conscience at all, he will read it shuddering, as it were a dreadful diary. The pitiless past will return. His sin will find him out. 
He will remember that he also believed in Carlyle and the superiority of simple, pious, God-fearing Prussia over popish and immoral France. He also boasted that Americans were Anglo-Saxons and that Anglo-Saxons were Germans. Is it possible that he himself once said, Germany is the mother root of nations? Alas, alas, he did. The secret has long been buried, and no blackmailer has dug it up from its dark grave. But there is the record or remainder of it staring in an old encyclopedia. We did say and hear, we did write and read, things as uncouth and unearthly. We did hear people saying that the Irish had no grievance, since they had all the benefits of the British Constitution. We did hear that Benjamin, the son of Isaac, the son of Israel, was a sturdy English patriot, with a passion for the English primrose. We did hear these things, uttering not a single scream, and we did hear things such as are written in this article about Poland. Needless to say, it is merely the Prussian view of Poland. It might have been translated direct from a Prussian pamphlet, and in a large degree it probably was, but like most other Prussian things, it is very amusing in an unconscious manner. The very arrangement of the paragraphs is funny. It winds up one paragraph by reciting in a dull and mechanical manner exactly what the worst of the Prussian kings, in conjunction with two other despots did to Poland, that he made a triple partition of that national territory, or, in other words, hacked its live body into three pieces with a sabre. Then it begins a new paragraph with the freshness of the morning skylark. The main causes of the fall of Poland appear to have been, one, the want of patriotism and the cohesion among the nobles, each pursuing his own interests, and the country just being divided among a number of petty tyrants. Two, the want of a national middle class, the trade of the country being almost entirely in the hands of Jews and Germans. 3. The intolerance of the Jesuits, who persecuted on the one hand the dissidents, which caused them to sympathise with Prussia, and on the other persecuted also the orthodox inhabitants of the eastern provinces, and the Cossacks, who thus looked to Russia. 4. In a less degree than the first three causes, the weakness of character of the kings, etc., etc., etc. This is all very interesting, and it is very much as if somebody were to write in a daily paper today a report of the recent and rather celebrated inquest. The main causes of the death of Mr. Percy Thompson appear to have been 1. A slight debility of constitution which rendered him sensitive to any slight shock to which accident might subject him to 2. The want of something bracing in the climate of Ilford, which may have had an enerviating effect on all inhabitants 3. The intolerance of the vicar or curates who continue to marry people right and left without reference to these climatic conditions. 4. In a less degree than the first three causes, the weakness of the character of Mr. Thompson, who, etc., etc., etc. Now, I'm not at all out of sympathy with those who feel a compassion even for the convicted murderers in such a case. I'm not sure that I would hang any murderer. I'm sure I would not hang every murderer. But if a man were to explain the causes of Mr. Thompson's death, in a philosophical fashion employed above, I should be moved to say, not without heat, that the causes of Mr. Thompson's death were nothing of the kind. I should be driven to the extremity of declaring, not without impatience, that the causes of Mr. Thompson's death were Mrs. Thompson and a young man named Bywaters. If it be necessary to add a third, to make a triad like those causes that destroyed Poland, I would cheerfully add the devil who lures men and women to destroy to their own destruction. The cause of the fall of Poland does not appear to have been but was the definite sort of cause which we call a crime. It was the crime of three tyrants, and especially of one tyrant, who defied God and man by deliberately doing to it what was not done to any other nation of Christendom. It was not the archaic ambition of nobles, for England has again and again suffered from that, and indeed, after the aristocratic triumph of 1688, may be said to suffer from its ill. But that did not lead to England being torn in three, America taking Wales and the West Country, Germany, East Anglia and the North Country, and France taking Kent, London and the Midlands. It was not the want of a middle class, for whole peasant nations, though whole historic periods have been prosperous and united and free from such outrage without any middle class at all. The writer thought the Poles must want a middle class, just as he thought in his heart that the Poles must want eggs and bacon for breakfast, because the English are used to it. It was not the Jesuit intolerance, for it was a time when everybody was in that sense intolerant, with the possible exception of a few of the Jesuits. The nearest to the modern notion of the undenominational state can be found in the few who speculated with Suarez or experimented with James II. Every European nation retained a religious test in civic matters, 
Why was not every European nation cut to pieces? Obviously, it was not the weakness of the character of certain individual kings. There is not a historical chronicle in Christendom that is not crowded with individual kings who had weak characters. Yet nobody ever thought of remedying the psychological deficiencies of Edward II or Louis XV by extinguishing the very existence of England and France. The whole of this trick of explaining the fall of Poland is a piece of stale Prussian propaganda and has that unmistakable mark of everything that ever came out of Prussia, the lack of humour and of common sense. I am very far from suggesting that there are not real and subtle divisions of spirit and atmosphere between England and Poland, which may need not only sympathy but imagination to bridge. The Poles have their faults like other people, just as the English have their faults like other people. Only one of the faults of the English is a faculty of only seeing. We are not very likely to see the assassination of a premier in England, exactly on the lines of a disastrous assassination of the president in Poland. In England, it is generally the life of the premier and not his death that is the disaster. It is something much more than a flippancy to say that, while we are all horrified at the number of men killed in Ireland, we are even more mystified by the number of men who were not killed in England. As the perilous problem of modern industrial England unfolds itself, it will be more and more manifest that we have not escaped disaster merely by escaping disasters. Our history has really been remarkably free from a certain kind of incidental shocks, which, when they happen to other nations, we find exceedingly shocking. But it is becoming more and more apparent to the most frivolous that it is possible to experience a ruin that is not a shock, a ruin that is really too ruinous to be a shock. It has been our national joke to represent other nations, like the Poles, the French, the Irish and the Italians, as lunatics given to screaming when there is nothing to scream about. God send they may not live to see us, in a more hideous fashion, as idiots still smiling when there is nothing to smile about. Something like that will certainly happen if we go on pitying peasantries for being peasantries, and refusing to face the mounting peril incurred by industrial societies merely by being industrial. The anarchy of industrial millionaires, thieving and thimble-rigging on too large a scale to be jailed as they deserve, is a great deal more anarchical than any anarchy of the Polish nobles. The disappearance of the middle class, of small fee farmers and shopkeepers is a great deal more dangerous than any absence of a mercantile middle class in the old policy of Poland. The intolerance of the plutocratic press refusing to print a word of truth about its master is a great deal more intolerant than any theological intolerance of any Jesuit that ever lived. And if our nation falls by the deeper forces that are dividing and dissolving us, the weakness of character will not have been in the princes, but in the people. End of section 49. Poland and the Pedants. Section 50 of G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joseph Grimer. G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922, by G. K. Chesterton. On being called Teutonic. A very cordial critic on the New Statesman recently did me the honour to call me Teutonic, which I acknowledge, if not with grace, at least with gratitude, not unmixed with self-control, for it was really intended as a compliment. Unfortunately, the compliment was to my erudition about things of which I happen to be hugely ignorant. He begins more cheerfully by saying, Of course, Mr. Chesterton must have read all the old ballads written in the English tongue. Mr. Chesterton wishes to God he had but it is quite true that he has read a good many of them, and is always glad to read more. His position, however, becomes less secure, and he may perhaps have read all the few existing epics and fragmentary poems of the Saxon Scops. Here, alas, I must begin to wave away the tribute. No Saxon Scop, no Scop of any kind, has overshadowed my private life. Anglo-Saxon alliteration frowned not upon my humble birth, and only rhyme, if it be nursery rhyme, marked me for its own. I will admit any amount of indebtedness to English ballad mongers, but not to the Saxon Scops. In the words of one of the finest old ballads written in the English tongue, to which I am so much devoted. No, Douglas, said Earl Percy then, thy proffer I do scorn. I will not yield to any Scop that ever yet was born. A prize of one halfpenny will be offered for the most plausible scholarly emendation of the above text. But anyhow, my researches in the Saxon culture have not yet gone so far as to know exactly what a scop is. But indeed, my knowledge seems to soar far beyond any smattering about such trifles as scops, whatever they are. 
The following is a summary of my scope, not scope, of learning and sources of information and influence. Add to that, if you like, everything else Teutonic, be it Danish, Icelandic or German, though one cannot tell which particular poems. A reviewer who turns over the pages of, say, three representative German anthologies containing selections from medieval to recent times, one of them to a student's drinking song book, will certainly find a great deal that is remindful of Mr. Chesterton, both in this and in his other verse books, particularly noticeable in their intensely racial outlook and something straightforwardly musical, resonant and rhetorical in the language, to say nothing of their wine and beer imbibing enthusiasm. It is evident from this that I know a great deal without knowing it. I am the devil of a fellow at the study of all sorts of things, as long as they are only Teutonic. To know anything Icelandic is rather beyond my own modest claims. To know everything Icelandic would seem a considerable claim for anybody. But though the critic notes the normally and generally Icelandic quality in my personality and poetry, he admits that he cannot at the moment put his finger on the particular Icelandic saga that has had the most influence on my life. I fear I cannot help him. As a matter of fact, I don't know a word of German. I do not know a word of any other Teutonic language except English. If English really is a Teutonic language. Unfortunately, it's really quite as much of a Latin and French language. Indeed, my ignorance of German is so complete that I am more accustomed to being charged with incompetence to judge the German traditions than with any inclination to follow them. When I was engaged in controversies with Germans and pro-Germans during the war, it was frequently objected that I could not judge German action without understanding German speech, to which I was content to answer that there are some actions that speak much plainer than any speech. If a Zulu burns down my house, including my library, I shall not primarily lament the loss of my pocket Zulu English dictionary, which might have enabled me to discover whether he came as a friend or foe. Yet it was quite as wantonly that the Teutonic barbarians burned down the great library of Louvain, including doubtless the dictionaries of the very Teutonic tongues which I speak like a native. If a gigantic Patagonian comes to my front door and calmly cuts the throat of the maidservant for saying, Not at home, I shall not be satisfied with sending for the Patagonian interpreter who lives round the corner to explain whether the visitor's intentions are honourable. And when the Teutonic tyrants executed a poor English sea captain for no crime whatever except doing his ordinary duty and trying to save his ship, they did exactly the same thing, and I have as quite as little need for an international interpreter. Crime is a very cosmopolitan form of Esperanto, and death and hell talk a very universal language. I have no need to call on my vast linguistic resources in the matter. If I talked with the tongues of men and the tongues of angels, let alone Danes and Icelanders, I should not need them to judge of the barbarians when he crosses the borders, whether he vaunts himself and is puffed up, whether he behaves himself unseemly, whether he thinks evil, whether he rejoices in iniquity, or whether he hates the truth. But though of some Teutonic things I may know nothing, I know something of the sort of people who know nothing else, and from other things that I do know I can judge of something unbalanced in their culture, even at its best. I have every reason to speak kindly of the particular critic, I quoted, who spoke so kindly of me. All joking apart, I thank him most heartily for a highly interesting and only too indulgent criticism. But I do not think it is an unfriendly return for it if I say that his theory of my concentration on Teutonism is primarily a proof of his own concentration on it. I am sure that he has read all the few existing epics and fragmentary poems of the Saxon Scops. I am sure that he really does wallow in everything else Teutonic, be it Danish, Icelandic or German. I congratulate him quite seriously upon his scholarship, especially in a branch of study I have myself neglected. But I think that even in his own statement there is internal evidence that he has neglected other things. He follows the tradition of the Victorian critics, and always looking amid the northern nations for things which are, were at least as common in the south as the north, and in most cases that had actually been borrowed by the north from the south. Indeed, the point might be sufficiently proved by a mere list of the words which he himself uses in tracing all my favourite traditions to the Teutonic root. He says the quality he describes is rhetorical. Where does he suppose the word rhetoric comes from? He says it expresses a wine-imbibing enthusiasm. Where does he suppose the word wine comes from? Properly understood, the case would be the same with the word music, and even with the unfortunate word paradox. Does he suppose the savage Frisians of the primeval fens chatted every day about rhetoric and paradox? At any rate, does he think they did it more than the Latins and the Greeks? But the truth is just as true about the other and less obvious cases. 
there are drinking songs in Germany, especially in the old southernized and afterwards submerged Germany. But to hear many people talk, one would think that there had never been any drinking songs except in Germany. This simply means that so long as people had a contempt for the old Latin civilization, they also had a complete ignorance of it. There are songs about wine all over the world, at least wherever the divine gift of wine has gone, it has awakened songs. It awakened songs in Germany because it went to Germany. But where did it come from? It came from where rhetoric and paradox came from, from where nearly everything else comes from. I admit I am in no position to dogmatise about where scops come from. I am equally ill-informed about where they went to. For the rest, I should be much misunderstood if anyone were to take too literally the critic's phrase about my public and political attitude which he contrasts from his own standpoint with my unconscious and instinctive attitude. He says I pretend to fearfully hate all Germans. I applaud his splendid defiance of the pedants who split hairs about split infinitives, but I cannot admit that I pretend this, or that my real pretension is only a pretense. I do not fearfully hate all Germans. I do not hate the people who gave us Grimm's fairy tales, or the people who act in the Oberammergau passion play. I do not hate Albert Dürer or a man I'd once drank beer with in Cologne, who thought it only correct and constitutional to supplement the toast of the Kaiser with the toast to each of the separate princes and rulers of Germany, giving them a mug each. What I hate is not a number of people, north or east of a particular line, but a mental and moral habit of looking for the light of progress northward instead of southward, that is, in barbarism rather than in civilization. We may call that heresy Teutonic, as it is perpetually called itself Teutonic, it is truer to call it Prussian, because the whole spell of it was the success of Prussia. It was not a nation, but a notion. It was not even a human tribe, but a very inhuman heresy which hardened and heathenized a large number of tribes. A simple test will be sufficient to show that this fact is not affected by any of the arguments about any of the Teutonic languages and traditions, with which I am supposed to be so familiar. My genial critic credits me with knowing the Icelandic language, and the Danish language, and the German language but even his generosity will not say that I know the Prussian language. There is no Prussian language, properly understood. There is no Prussian literature. There was a Prussian system, which began with a man whose fortunate language was that of Voltaire, and ended with a man whose favourite literature was that of Kipling. It was an international heresy, and because I call it a heresy, I call what conquered it a crusade. End of section 50 Recorded by Joseph Grimer. End of G. K. Chesterton's newspaper columns. The New Witness, 1922, by G. K. Chesterton.